on the fly looking specifically for fMRI so we overlooked understand yeah no problem <laughs> Page 26. Okay, now we're on and page 49. This is where it gets a little bit tricky uh, for us, Your Honor, because there are some parts that, you know, it, it does say focus on particular regions, uh, which I think does uh, probably run afoul of, of discussion of the fMRI, but specifically with this, it, it may be referencing fMRI, but it doesn't say specifically fMRI, so I don't know that there's a huge issue of confusing the jury, but... We will we'll defer to the court on that with what they want to do. It just will be a little bit choppy. This this one might be uh, be hard to turn the volume down. I mean, uh, again, I think technically it does violate the order, but it may be insignificant enough and um, unclear enough that the jury won't understand what's, what's being said. Because when she says imaging, it also includes MRIs and and so right, uh, but the before and after imaging uh, was fMRI. So I, that I know was that. Why. So that's right. why it's not necessarily just clearly about the fMRI. Um, so I'm the court. I mean, we can strike uh, on page forty nine, line seven, beginning with the word very targeted and focused to those particular regions and ending with the word regions, that's stricken. Uh, and the rest of it I'm fine with. I, I don't think that the court's order didn't say that uh, functional MRI could not be referenced by Dr. Fong. There was just a certain application of that fMRI that was uh, ruled was excluded. Okay. Well, in that case, Your Honor, let's just have, if, if I may suggest, we could just have the whole thing, because the regions, it won't be clear, and I think it will be just too hard to turn down the volume just for part of a sentence. Okay. Then also I'll say on 50. So the whole thing can come in now. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then on page 50, I, I mentioned that the, there's some documents that are shown that reference fMRI, it's very, it's while she's scrolling, so it's not easy to see. I'm, we don't have to worry about that. Okay. Um, That's okay. Yeah. So that'll come in. And then what's the next page? I don't see a page on it. 51. Sorry, it was cut off on my picture. Yeah. This, the objection here was that Dr. Fong spoke with Mr. Sanderson prior to the, this deposition, this trial deposition, but um, we had not and then, known about that and hadn't been able to learn the facts of her discussion. What's the, what's the plaintiff's position on that, on the, on the uh, after post-deposition information? You know, she's a, she's a treating provider, Your Honor, and so we, we recognize the court's previous rulings in this, but we don't think that it, uh, it necessarily is objectionable for her to talk generally. I mean, she... She does say in the beginning that she did see him, but I think this is still consistent with her prior testimony in this case and, and her feelings generally about the treatment that she's provided, which is not stricken. And does, um, does the defendant's cross-examination address post-deposition post treatment? Yeah. Does your cross-examination address post? No. In other words, does, did the, defend, does the defendant open yeah. the door later in the deposition? I, I don't know, Your Honor, but if you look towards the bottom of that, of page 53, um, at, at line 14, it says, uh, well, Mr. Bueller asks if, if any of that recent visit has changed her, her position, and she her answer is, I don't think they've changed at all. If anything, I fear that his issues, even this far out, may be even more permanent than I would like. <clears throat> So I, I, she does indicate that it didn't change her position, even though she may have referenced that she saw him recently.
And how does she tie these conclusions she's making to any treatment? How, how is uh, Dr. Fong tying these conclusions she's making on page 52, for example, to treatment as opposed to, I guess, supplementing an expert, re expert opinion? I think she ties it back to her earlier opinion that that is based on the treatment. That she is concluding those things. Okay. And Your Honor, if I may, just just to be clear, we're, we don't have an objection to discussion of continued treatment after depositions that we had records of, um, and we've provided provided our own experts with treatment that occurred after various depositions that plaintiffs have provided to us. But in this case, uh, we didn't get any records of this conversation, and it, as you, it seems like you're pointing out, and I, as I pointed out into my objection during the deposition itself, it didn't seem like it was related to treatment. It was just kind of a conversation with him. Those were new facts that we didn't know about until this uh, deposition, and so um, that, that was the basis of the objection. Anything else, Mr. Sorensen? Well, uh, we, we did disclose to the other side uh, treatment dates, current, uh, continuing treatment dates, and so uh, we believe that that was disclosed. To our knowledge, there are no additional records because I think this was just a phone conversation that she spoke with him over, and so she didn't produce any additional records. Okay. And where she indicates in her own deposition that it didn't change her opinion and didn't amend it at all, I, I think that it's still proper under the court's ruling. And are those subsequent treatment dates coming in? I, they're not an issue, Your Honor. I think. I mean, are they coming into evidence? Um, we don't have an exhibit specifically prepared. Okay. Are you talking about tra treatment dates with Dr. Fong? Yeah. Uh, I, those t I'm not remembering those. You may have provided yeah, those. But. I, I think we did just provide you know a list of additional dates. There was no content to it because it was I think a phone conversation. There were no records for them. There were no records. So. Okay. So. I'm ready to rule. So on page 51, line 22, I'm going to sustain the objection for the rest of that page, all of 52, and then 53 down to line 10. We're on, we're on 51, are you starting, Judge? Uh, 22. 22. 22. Okay. And then uh, down to, and then beginning and on. all of 52. And right? all of 52, 53 down through line 10. <clears throat> and then beginning on line 11, I'll permit the question, and then I'll permit the answer that's on lines 14 and 15, but then strike it after it says, I fear that is issues. So starting on line 15, where it says, I fear that is issues, even this far out, maybe yeah. more permanent than I would like. Uh, so f that part of 15 and then 16 is stricken. Think you can work the volume magic on that? We'll, we'll do our best. Okay. <laughs> and I apologize in advance to the court if we are a little slow or something comes out, but we'll do our best. Then line 59, or page 59? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was taken out. It doesn't reference fMRI, and there were criticisms. Does the plaintiff have an issue with that coming in? We do, Your Honor. The whole context of this is discussion about the fMRI, and it's, it carries over, and it's the same argument essentially yeah. for 88 as well. I agree. I mean, the whole thing is fMRI, so how can you bring in questions and not you know, have answers? If I, I may, Your Honor, when I asked this question, I was referring to just, I was starting into a discussion generally of criticisms, which included criticisms that didn't involve the fMRI, for example, that Dr. Fong's treatment worked very quickly in a way that's, uh, um, that uh, Dr. Gibby in particular was skeptical of. Um, and uh, I didn't well, mention we'll take that. Take a look at it. I mean, they've they've excised out all of, or the rest of fifty nine, all of sixty and sixty one, most of sixty one. So you're saying that there's additional testimony following page sixty one that 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 question and answer relates to. Uh, so uh, there is questioning later about the 
about her treatment and whether it was effective. And I don't think that I specifically asked about that criticism that plaintiffs had, uh, that plaintiffs experts had. Uh, I think it was just Dr. Gibby on this point. Um, but uh, again, I, when I asked this question, I had that in mind. And um, uh, I think it's relevant that the jury know that, that there were criticisms of her um, that did not relate to the fMRI. And where in here later is there, are you, are you discussing criticism, criticisms of her specifically? Uh, yeah, like I, like I said, Your Honor, I don't think I actually referenced Dr. Gibby's criticism in particular, though there is questioning about whether her treatment was effective, which was his criticism. All the criticism is fMRI criticism. I'm going to overrule the objection. Um, I think it relates to the fMRI, unless you can tie it to some other later questioning relating specifically to criticism. I'm going to overrule it. <laughs> then page 88. And 88 is the same issue for us, Your Honor. I think it's just in the middle of all of the fMRI discussion, and, and that's the relevant context that this question is being raised. The problem I see, Your Honor, is that, that first of all, I, I don't think this is just related to fMRI, and um, secondly, the the way they've spliced it, it goes straight into an answer without a question being asked. So there's this necessary context that's not there. And again, the, the question is about treatment issues um, or effectiveness of treatment issues. So the um, the problem is not just one relating to fMRI. It's it's whether the treatment, even if she hadn't done fMRI, um, might be treating something other than a post-concussive syndrome or you know persistent symptoms of concussion. Um, no reference to fMRI there, uh, and I think that's necessary context for the answer that they then include. And you're seeking page 88, line 2 through 14, and line 22 through 25? Uh, 22 through 25 is already there, okay. Yeah, right. So they, had, seeking... they had had that. that. That's the part of the answer that they include that doesn't really have that necessary context in the question that I'd like to add. So you're seeking 2 through 14? Yes, okay. correct. Mr. Sorensen? Well, I think if you go back to the full transcript, Your Honor, and look on page 87, at line, starting at line 20, it says, the question is whether the methods that you use are reliable, which is specifically the um, fMRI that we're talking about. And so that's the thing I'm trying to get to in this. There, there is significant skepticism among other experts in this case about use of fMRI to say this person has post-concussive symptoms rather than other things that were going on treating him <coughs> for that. So the whole context of that, and, and he says himself, the, the questions that he's asking, the basic crux of them are the fMRI. So questions and answers there about that and criticisms about that are specifically tied to the fMRI. And, and then how about the, the complaint that the, uh, the answer <laughs> beginning on line 22 is just hanging out there with no question? Are you still objecting, going to, yeah, you sorry, objecting I'm, I'm, to that hanging out there? I mean, I'm going to overrule the objection on 2 through Fourteen, I think it is just a continuation of the fMRI questioning. Uh, but are you going to? Are you still objecting to it starting on line twenty-two? Yeah. If you're, if we can't have that question, and I think we should just start at the next question. Mr. Sorensen, are you okay with that? Yeah, I, I, I think it could tie back to the question that she was asked. Uh, back on eighty-two, but we're, we're okay to strike that in the middle. Okay. If the court wants to do that. So. Well, I, it's not that I want to. I'm just wondering what the parties are agreeing to. Okay. Uh, I mean. Well, you know, Judge, this is going to be an um, hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half. Okay. I don't think that will make any difference to the jury. There, I mean, there's nothing wrong with what's here. It's not objecting to the content of it. Uh, it's just a lot of effort to try to go back and find this. And so I would say just leave it in. You know? I mean, I it, he had plenty of chance to cross-examine and... I mean, if I may... It doesn't do any harm to leave it in either way. 
if I may, Your Honor, I mean, I, I understand your ruling that it's tied to fMRI questioning. It's true, but there was a lot of things that were tied that um, can be separated, and it can be separated that I was asking her, how do you know your treatment works? Uh, uh, not relating even in to fMRI, right? How do, how do you know that what you're doing, the therapy, all the stuff, the boot camp she describes, how do you know that that's not treating some other issue? And then she gives this answer, and, and um, I, I think I think that should, should come in. If it can't come in, it, it doesn't make sense to me that we just leave it hanging out there and not provide the jury the benefit of what I'm trying to get at with my question. Well, Mr. Sorensen, I think that the last part of that that you're, that you're seeking to have included um, is also part of the same, uh, I guess, string of questions on fMRI. And so if you, want, if you want to insist on including that, then I think it makes sense for the defendants 2 through 14 to also come in. Okay. Then we're fine letting it be stricken then. Okay. So we'll strike, uh, to, um, we'll deny 2 through 13 on page 88 or 14. And then we'll strike uh, 22 through page 89, line 4. Anything else? Uh, Dr. Fong, no, from us. I think no, that's. So, so we're striking line uh, 88, line 22 through 89, what line? Line 4. Line 4? Correct. No, thank you. And is, let's see, where's the bailiff? Oh, is the jury here and ready to go? Why don't you have them start getting ready? I mean, is, are there any other issues we need to address this morning? So we're doing, yeah, you're doing, you're so uh, I was just going to tell me one thing, if I might. Mr. Owens, how was the transition at the end of court yesterday, at Much the end of the better. day? In fact, I wanted to, any irritation I've expressed, none of that's been directed to your honor or your staff or the court media representative. It's been uh, it's not, it's not interpreted that way, counsel. Great. Um, I did want to know if a new AP still camera has been installed. Where? I just want, I'm asking. Oh, no. Because I heard there was going to be a new AP still camera installed directly over the lectern. They withdrew that request. OK, thank you. Um, uh, apparently, I want to do this transparently. Um, uh, this, uh, this private security for my client wanted to uh, bring in treats for the bailiffs for how helpful they've been. So I wanted to do that transparently and see if there are any objections. We object. We object. Okay. There's an objection. Okay. So, so I will let them know. Let them know thank you, but no, but no thank you. Thank you. Actually, the, both ways, not just one way. Well, you could bring in treats. Well, okay. okay. If the parties decide to do that later, that's fine, too. Okay. I mean, you should have asked us first, frankly. It yeah. hasn't been done. I know. You should have asked us first. We could talk about it, but you just sprung it on us now. So we What did you find out about the jury? Ready to go? Okay. Um, is everyone ready to begin? Or five minutes, maybe? Three minutes? Okay. And Your Honor, one thing that we didn't address that I think we should in terms of showing this video is, I, and maybe I'm, maybe nothing that I asked to go in is in. I'm trying to recall here now. There was uh, one section, I think. That so I think that will need to be read because it's not on the video. So, um, yeah, if we get to I, that, you can just I'm stop. happy to just re read it if that's the best way to go forward. I think that is the best way to go forward. We thought we could put Mr. Norman on the stand after I read the question, have her read the answer. Sure, and that's on page 49. That, that that's fine. And if, if you get into a situation, Mr. Sorensen, where you can't, you know, mute it and bring it back, you can read those portions as well. Okay. All right. say page 49 because our understanding was the objection was that we everything was remaining in and they wanted it out on page 49 
Mm -hmm. Is that what we're talking about? I thought I had agreed that we could just have that in. And I, I don't think it's not out right now, is it? I think I thought it was in. Yeah, that's what I mean. But we'd have to read it in. Yeah. I think it's in. Oh, sorry. I have in and out written here. I'm confused. <laughs> it's okay. I think and I we'll was just tell one <laughs> looking at this. I, I think it's in. It's, it's in. I'm we'll sorry. just wander it out. And <laughs> say, we'll play the video. We're good. We're good. We're good. So 53. And, 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 50. and Judge, just so you know, this is uh, uh, about a minute and an hour and 19 seconds. Thank you. Now, if we need to take a break in between, that's fine. I think it's not a bad idea. So you just tell us when to take a short break if we need to, as you know. All right. The, the lawyers are getting ready to show you a videotaped piece of testimony, and they're just finishing their preparations for that, so we're just going to sit and wait for just a minute. That looks much better. Thank 
Griffin, I'm the videographer. The court reporter is Ross Ann Morgan. We represent Depomax Merritt, located in Salt Lake City, Utah. Sounds good. The time and date the How's the jury? Any trouble hearing? Okay. Does anyone need a hearing assist device? We've got those. In Mountain Time, March 14th, 2023. This is the case of Terry Sanderson. Versus Gwyneth Paltrow, case number 19050004. May I ask where the sound is actually coming from? One nine fifteen court reporter. Hey, okay, we're on record. My name is Lance Harrison. I'm the videographer. The court reporter is Ross Ann Morgan. Okay. We represent Depomax Merritt, located in Salt Lake City, Utah. The time of day indicated on the Zoom feed is 1.15 p.m. Mountain Time, March 14th, 2023. This is the case of Terry Sanderson. No, no, there seems to be an echo or something. It's, it's Versus Gwyneth Paltrow, case number 19050048 in the 3rd Judicial District Court of Summit County, State of Utah. Counsel will now introduce themselves, and the court reporter will swear in the witness. Lawrence Bueller for Plaintiff Terry Sanderson. James Egan for Defendant Gwyneth Paltrow. Very good. Um, let's begin. Just one second. Uh, Bob Sykes, and I think Peter Sorensen will be here also for the plaintiff, Terry Sanderson. And I have in the room uh, my paralegal, Eric Jurgensen. Okay, doctor, can you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Thank you. Go ahead, counsel. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Fong. Could you state your name and spell it for the record, please? Sure. My name is Alina. Oh, I don't know if I should give you my full name. Kapahu Pinea Kalekoa Fong. And I will spell that for you. That's A L I N A, Alina. K A P A H U P I N E. A K A L E I K O A Fong F O N G. Okay. And uh, where were you born? Uh, I was born. Actually, I was born in Sacramento, California, um, uh, but moved to Hawaii uh, when I was about one month old. Okay. So, uh, where did you grow up? In Honolulu, Hawaii. Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask you uh, education before I get into training, but uh, before we start, uh, what is the topic of your testimony today, just in general terms, so uh, we have an introduction for the jury? Uh, well, from what I understand, um, I'm talking about a patient of mine named Terry, uh, who was uh, who sustained a concussion and and subsequent post-concussion symptoms after uh, an injury in February, I believe, of 2016. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, please describe your uh, education, starting with high school. Well, I graduated from Kamehameha High School. That's K-E-M-E-H-A-M-E-H-A. -E -E um, 
I graduated in uh, in 95, which dates me. Uh, I went straight to BYU where I did my undergraduate work. Uh, I also did a master's and a PhD uh, here at, at BYU. Um, and then I went on to um, my uh, internship residency at the VA hospital in Salt Lake City. Okay, and uh, at uh, BYU, uh, what was your uh, graduate degrees in? So I had, I obtained a PhD in clinical psychology uh, with an emphasis in neuropsychology and my field of study was uh, EEG and fMRI. Okay, now I'd like to get into your training. Can you describe your training in uh, psychology? Sure. Um, and how many years? And how many years? Uh, I'll let you go ahead. Uh, so uh, I had an undergraduate degree, which was four years. I then uh, entered a master's program, which was three years, and then matriculated into a, a PhD program, which was five years. Um, I had the opportunity to be the only neuropsych uh, emphasis student. Um, so I got to train with uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Aaron Bigler, one-on-one um, -on -one for much of my training. Uh, also uh, other uh, uh, professors in neuroscience. Um, so it was a really wonderful program that allowed me a, a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with, uh, with these great mentors of mine. Um, I graduated, uh, well, I finished my dissertation and then went off to internship. And I did my internship, like I mentioned, at the Veterans Hospital here in Salt Lake City, right in 2007 and 2008 which you may recall was right during the Iraq and Afghanistan war, so OIF and OEF. And uh, that's where I gleaned uh, a lot more of my concussion um, training. Okay, and... Uh... Your Honor, would you explain what we're doing here? Sure, there's portions of the transcript that, that don't need to be read in court openly, so they'll be skipping over some of that. Other hospital or clinical work uh, that you haven't already mentioned? Can you tell? In that edition. Okay. And uh, uh, any other hospital or clinical work uh, that you haven't already mentioned? Can you tell the jury? Sure. Yes. So um, this is my 18th year working for Intermountain Healthcare as a neuropsychologist. Um, I started there in neurotrauma rehab which really was focusing uh, more on inpatient, severe and moderate traumatic brain injury patients. Um, and we had a wonderful multidisciplinary team there, but I did uh, neuropsychological assessments uh, on patients in the hospital and also in the outpatient uh, realm. Um, and I'm still working for IHC. I've been able to help open two concussion clinics for IHC, one at Utah Valley Regional and one at American Fork, where I'm still working part-time there. Um, I also work for, uh, I have a clinic here called Cognitive Effects, which is a clinic where we treat, we cater to, uh, and we specialize in chronic persistent post-concussion symptom patients. And then I also have a clinic called Neural Effects, which is located in Provo as well, and we uh, cater more towards the acute, um, newly injured patients. Uh, can you explain to the jury uh, the types of TBI victims that uh, you've treated and uh, dealt with in your career? Sure. Um, earlier on in my career, I really focused on 
moderate and severe traumatic brain injury. So these are patients that you know, either needed neurosurgery or um, they had a skull fracture or some type of bleeding in the brain and they were typically in a coma uh, for, for part of it, whether it was medically induced or part of the traumatic brain injury. Uh, I then also moved on to seeing more of the mild realm. So I've actually seen the whole spectrum of traumatic brain injury, but I have stayed in this mild traumatic brain injury realm, which is synonymous with concussion. What does mild mean in mild traumatic brain injury? So uh, by mild, uh, we don't necessarily mean the symptoms are mild. What that means is that it's not life or death, okay? So we're not dealing with someone that uh, needs, you know, a shunt placement. We're not dealing with swelling and that we need to remove part of the skull. When, when the term mild was, uh, was given, um, it really just meant that this is a patient with a closed head injury, right? Um, but did not need surgical intervention of that type. So that's where the term mild comes from, um, but the symptoms can be very, very serious for a patient with concussion. Hey, you mentioned Aaron Bigler. Uh, can you describe uh, for the jury who he is and uh, what you did studying under him? Sure. Uh, Aaron Bigler has been the president of uh, both of the neuropsychological associations. Uh, he is probably the most renowned neuropsychologist uh, because he pioneered uh, this marriage between neuropsychologists and advanced neuroimaging. Um, he has been instrumental in uh, creating uh, and helping mentor other neuropsychologists that have also gone into other types of advanced neuroimaging fields. Um, he's just, I think one of the, probably the most prominent, if not one of the most prominent neuropsychologists to date internationally. Okay, let's talk about the clinic. Um, let's see, uh, and your professional specialties and interests. There's, uh, you know, uh, children, adults in general, and concussion victims. If you could uh, describe that. Sure, um, I specialize in the entire age range of concussions. Um, here at Cognitive Effects, for example, you know, we, we treat people really between the ages of 8 and 99. Um, at Neural Effects, we see people of all ages, even babies and toddlers. And at American Fork uh, Concussion Clinic, we also see people of all ages. Okay, and then about your clinic or at work, uh, uh, what is it and how long has it been around? Okay, so again, I have two clinics, um, but I think the one in question would be cognitive effects since that's where I treated Terry. Uh, we've been around for here in Utah for about eight years. Prior to that, our first opening was actually in Boston. It wasn't here. Uh, we were getting this one off the ground, but the first clinic we opened was in Boston in partnership with Tom Brady, who was, uh, he played for the Patriots at the time. But uh, he, uh, he and uh, one of his trainers opened up uh, TB12, which stood for uh, Tom Brady and his number 12, but it was TB12 Sports Therapy and Concussion Clinic. And we were the concussion arm of that, of that clinic there. And so that's where it all started. Uh, and then two years later, we opened here uh, in Provo. Okay. How many employees are at your clinic? We have about 70 to 75 right now, employees. Okay, and what types of employees? Uh, let's say starting with the uh, MDs and PhDs, the, the doctors. So um, we have a variety of MDs. We have neuro, a neurosurgeon, who's one of my partners, Dr. Lynn Gaffain. We have Dr. Bruce McKiff, who is our in-house neuroradiologist. Uh, we have a uh, doctor of nurse practitioner. Uh, we have a PhD, we have PhD neuropsychology. We have several PhD clinical psychologists. Um, we have physical therapists, occupational therapists, neuromuscular therapists, um, cognitive therapists, speech language pathologists, vision uh, specialists, vestibular specialists, neurosensory integration specialists, um, sensory motor specialists, and so on and so on. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some, but we uh, have all of these therapists that are licensed all in-house. Uh, and we are able to do a very intense, multimodal, multi uh, 
factored um, boot camp program here, uh, which caters to these much more chronic, difficult cases. Uh, like Dr. Sanderson's, Terry Sanderson's? Yes, yes correct. Okay. Before I get to that, uh, Terry Sanderson, the plaintiff, uh, what about the equipment at your facility or your clinic? Uh, are you referring to the MRI machine that we have? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, we have a 1.5 Tesla MRI machine in-house, uh, which makes it really convenient to be able to scan these patients before and after treatment, sometimes in between treatment weeks as well to track uh, recovery, to track severity. Um, when you say recovery, do people recover uh, completely in a, uh, in a clinical setting such as yours? You know, we definitely have some people that recover completely. They will report they, they recover completely. I'd say that comprises of about maybe 15% of our patients. About 85% will say that they have significant improvement, but it is a brain injury, and sometimes these effects can be lifelong. Okay. Uh, let's... Oh, we lost you, Lawrence. You're... Oh, I you. Okay, you. Can you Lawrence. hear us? Lawrence, can you hear me? Okay, yes. I can hear you. I, I can, you guys are all fine. I, I don't know what's going oh, on. Oh, yeah, we, can you we lost now? you for a, a long time there. So you'll okay. have to start that question over. Okay. Um, uh, where do your patients come from? Uh, they come from all over the world, actually. I'd say maybe about... 25% of our patients are from Utah, but 75% come from all over the United States. And, um, well, no, I'd say about 65% come from the rest of the US and another 10% come from all over the world. Um, we typically have on average about four of our 20 patients here, four of our 18 to 20 patients coming from Europe or you know, we have some from Israel, from Asia, from Canada. So it's a really kind of a, a United Nations here um, during during our treatment weeks. Doctor, can I interrupt one second? You, the camera is cutting off the top of your head sometimes. There you go, that's better. Okay. Thanks, okay. Okay. Um, now, uh, at uh, Cognitive, at your clinic, uh, so you earlier described that you cover all sorts of patients. Um, can you explain what a closed head brain injury is? Uh, sure. Um, a, a closed head brain injury typically means it, it's, it's a non-penetrating injury. So it's an injury that um, where there's no skull fracture, um, but there's like a you know, a jolting or kind of a rapid kind of force movement that has the brain, you know, here shaking inside of a skull. But a closed head injury means that there was no penetration of the skull into the brain um, and no, uh, no skull fracture. Okay. And uh, uh, what is an MTBI? An MTBI is considered a mild traumatic brain injury. And, I, and as I mentioned before, mild doesn't mean the symptoms are mild. Mild is just in reference to um, being juxtaposed to moderate and severe, which m mean more of a bleeding in the brain or more kind of organic neurologic findings. So MTBI is synonymous with concussion because a concussion actually as part of the diagnostic criteria has no findings on structural imaging and that means CT and MR and MRI. And what is PCS or post concussion symptoms? So PCS is a uh, is the name of the complex process that occurs when a patient has been struggling with concussion sequela um, over a long period of time. In fact, there are different kind of categories of post-concussion symptoms. Um, 
you, if you have symptoms for more than three to six months, for more than that, you can be categorized as persistent post-concussion symptoms or pers persistent post-concussive symptoms. So what this is, is just a patient that has concussion symptoms past um, a certain amount of time, you know, and in Terry's case, you know, by the time I saw him, he was struggling with these concussion symptoms for almost a year and a half. Okay. And uh, um, so are uh, these names, closed head injury, MTBI, post-concussion syndrome, um, these are the symptoms that uh, Terry has? So, yeah, these are different, I guess, names of different diagnoses that he could have. You know, he had he had an MTBI, which is a concussion, but then you can also have PCS because that com comes like in a timeline after someone gets an MTBI. But yes, he was diagnosed with a concussion and MTBI, and then also with the sequela, which is PCS or persistent post-concussive symptoms. Okay. What are the risk factors for harmful consequences from a uh, concussion? Risk factors. Okay, so I think I think what you're asking me are are, are there certain are there certain things that a person can go through or have that could increase their chances of having more issues with concussions? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, there are definitely risk factors. There, there is a, a study that was done by um, uh, one of my colleagues, Michael McRae. Uh, it was one of these seminal studies that, that actually pointed out that there are several, what we call risk factors that can lead to a more complicated recovery and a more complicated presentation of symptoms. Um, in Terry's case specifically, he met several of them um, one was he actually had a prior diagnosis of anxiety and depression. Um, and so having a, a prior mental health history is one of the big risk factors uh, for PCS and persistent post-concussion symptoms. Um, another one was um, uh, migraine history. So if someone has a history of headaches or migraines prior, um, that is also a risk factor. And another one uh, was um, some of the um, uh, structural brain findings uh, that he had as well. Um, I think it was called norm normal pressure hydrocephaly. Uh, those are also some risk factors for post-concussion symptoms. In Terry's case, what do risk factors mean? Um, well, in Terry's case uh, and, and in other patients' cases, it means that that puts them at a much higher likelihood to have these, this complicated presentation and this complicated recovery. You know, it's just harder for them to recover and their symptoms can last longer and feel quite debilitating. So uh, in your opinion, Terry has uh, persistent post-concussion syndrome or symptoms. Uh, uh, and uh, in your opinion, has he, uh, recovered or will he ever recover? Um, Terry came to my clinic, uh, well, about six, 2017, so a little, a little under six years ago. Um, and he worked so hard, he really, you know, gave his best effort and he did notice and we noticed some definite improvements. But talking to him now, knowing where he is now, it is still showing clearly that he's still struggling. And so, I mean, I'm if, if I have a fault, it's that I am an eternal optimist and I always, you know, want to keep treating and, and keep working because I know neuroplasticity is real. Um, but, you know, I think we're getting to the point where he's 76 and I do worry that some of these uh, issues may be longstanding, but I still have some hope. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about your uh, process at your clinic. Uh um, uh, you, know, you do a clinical interview. Can you explain why and what that means? Sure. So um, before, uh, 
one of the very first times that I that I met with Terry, um, I sat down with him and we went over um, what we call a clinical interview. And that is information gathering. I'm trying to assess what happened to him. I want to know what his symptoms were like. I wanted to hear about the injury that occurred. Um, and so it's a really good way to gather information and to get a really good history of the patient. You know, I'll ask about psychiatric history. I'll ask about um, some prior medical history. I'll ask about some prior concussions as well. Um, and so it allows me to assess what's going on and to then have uh, a clinical diagnosis based on that clinical interview. Okay. When uh, you first met with Terry, I, I think it was August of 2017. Is, does that uh, sound correct? That sounds correct, yes. So that was about a year and a half after the uh, ski crash that, that is the subject of this case. And uh, what was his diagnosis at the time when he came to your clinic? Well, he already came with a concussion diagnosis, right? Um, and it was my job at that point to to confirm that. I felt that he did meet that criteria, but I also was able to list out a year and a half later, 15 months later, um, what symptoms he was still struggling with. And for me, uh, what's most important is if those symptoms were things that I thought that I could treat or that I could help him with. Um, is uh, self-reporting and clinical questionnaire like in Terry's case, uh, um, how normal is that in assessing uh, uh, neuropsychological issues in the, in the medical community or the psychological community? So um, very common. In fact, most of the time, by the time a patient gets to me, um, they've already had diagnoses from several other clinicians, right? I mean, usually a neuropsychologist is not their, kind of their, their first person they go to, okay? Um, but, you know, really, as, as a clinician, the best way to ascertain if someone has a concussion is to ask them questions, you know? Um, we have some different types of tests that we can do as well, like balance tests and vision tests um, that we can do with them, which are very, easy to do um, and can be done, you know, very quickly in a clinical setting. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's talking to them, talking about what symptoms they have, when these symptoms started, and uh, really identifying kind of an, an inciting event or a cause for what happened and when these symptoms started to come about. Um, what uh, sense do you have or any evidence do you have that Terry might have been malingering, exaggerating, or faking his symptoms? None whatsoever. Um, Terry showed up to every appointment on time. He gave his best effort. Um, the treatment that we do uh, is very, very intensive. So it, re it required Terry to show up every morning on time to give his best effort in every single therapy appointment. And we're looking at, you know, in a given week that he was with us, 32 hours of therapy, all right? Um, he was an ideal patient. I got to see him every day while he was here in treatment and got to follow up with him and, and, and connect with him. And there was no issue with any of our therapists that he was in any way malingering or faking this. Uh, in fact, it was almost the opposite, you know? Um, Terry is, you know, a very, very, um, intelligent man, and he didn't want to be injured. I mean, I think that was really clear. It was, uh, he's someone that doesn't want to be sick and was, was willing to do everything he possibly could to improve where he was, where he was at. Thank you. Uh, yeah, what is your understanding about uh, his concussion and this ski crash of February 26, 2016? Um... I mean, um, was it was the ski crash uh, a cause or the cause of his uh, concussion? Objection leading. Okay, um, rephrase, I'll rephrase. Uh, you're familiar with the uh, ski crash of 2016 he was in in February, right? Correct. Uh, what are, um, I, I'm getting at your preliminary opinions at this point. Uh, uh, what uh, significant uh, problems 
was Terry suffering from, in your opinion, from this ski crash of 2016? Uh, well, he was reporting a myriad of symptoms, um, uh, including cognitive issues. So, you know, he wasn't, you know, he was fatigued. He wasn't thinking um, as clearly as, as he was before. Um, he reported uh, some issues with mood, personality changes, um, pain as well, headaches, uh, and so on. And uh, how significant were these problems, in your opinion? Well, I mean, according to uh, Terry's report, you know, these were quite significantly affecting his life. I mean, it was affecting his uh, his personal life, his family relationships, his friendships, um, his ability to, you know, have self-confidence. Uh, he was further isolating. You know, he just kind of, it affected him on so many levels, um, especially for someone that was used to um, loving life and enjoying life and, and traveling and, and all that. By the time he came to me, that was pretty much gone. Okay. Oh, I think I was mistaken. Maybe you saw Terry first in May of 2017. Um, can I, uh, how much, uh, how significant it, or, uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is um, how can a person with high average or superior core, uh, scores on testing still be impaired by a traumatic brain injury and suffer persistent concussive symptoms? Can you explain that, please? Sure. Um, I think what you're referring to is I know that he completed a neuropsychological evaluation. Um, I believe maybe at the VA hospital. Does that sound right? I don't want to misspeak. Yes, maybe that's it. I yeah, and in fact, I, I know who, I, I, Dr. Madsen, I believe, and she was there when I was doing my, my residency at the VA, um, she's, and she's a wonderful neuropsychologist. Um, what, what we have, uh, when we deal with concussion patients, okay, um, we have seen that, especially if they are intelligent or if they ha are at a higher level of functioning, which, you know, I, I would assume he would be considering his, his education level, him being an optometric physician, um, you would assume that he's functioning rather well. So with these patients, um, often the neuropsychological, like paper or pencil tests that they can do uh, are not sensitive enough to pick up some of the challenges that he's having. You know, in one sense, maybe he, his functioning was up here prior to the accident, and then now he's down here, but if everyone else is down here, you know, he'll be kind of in the average, maybe high average range, but, you know, we could assume maybe he was in the superior range prior to that. And so we often see cases where neuropsych testing or neurocognitive testing can be totally normal, but the patient can still have a concussion. And in fact, one of the best The blank out is intentional. concussion and brain injury, where to get help. And uh, it says about concussion, it's entitled uh, head, <coughs> excuse me.
Um, we'll be sending this to you right now in the next minute or two, uh, Jane. Apologize for the difficulty and interruptions. In the old days, we used to just read this to you, so this is much preferable. I guess the old days wasn't that long ago, was it? Just keep going. How are we doing right now? We can keep going right now? Okay, we'll keep, keep going. going. Right now? Um, uh, I'd like to talk about, in particular, uh, Terry Sanderson's case. Uh, the, um, it's my understanding you recommended that he travel. Uh, what did, why did you recommend that he travel? Oh, um, so when we were, so when he completed uh, the, uh, the boot camp with us, part of what he said that he missed and part of what gave him so much joy was traveling. You know, and as someone like, like Terry, who I actually really love to travel, right? In fact, I'm, as you know, I'm heading uh, to, uh, to Europe for work to present at some conferences internationally. Um, I encouraged him to try to get back to doing things that he loved. I did caution him that he should not travel alone because of his memory issues and, and, and other uh, problem-solving issues. But I did strongly recommend that he try to get back to doing things that he enjoys. Um, and that, in, that included travel. So uh, can you... Ex uh how would you describe the treatment then that he's received at uh, your clinic? So the treatment was very intensive, very um, targeted and focused to those particular regions, right, that we saw. Um, and it is a boot camp. I mean, he was here with us for a full week. He uh, participated in no less than 32 hours of therapy. And then the rest of those hours were filled with before and after imaging, right? Um, and uh, yeah, he he was very compliant, um, but every day he had at least one hour of, of cognitive therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, neuromuscular therapy, vision, vestibular, and even psychotherapy, right? I mean, you cannot extricate some of the, you know, um, the depression and, and anxiety aspects because he suffered from that beforehand. So we made sure he got some of that here in treatment as well. Lawrence, if I may, I'm just noting that if she has to leave at 3.30, there's only an hour left, and I have an outline of, like, 10 pages. So um, it's going to be tough for me to get through uh, without much, uh, without uh, the rest of the time here. Okay. Uh, we'll try to go quickly. Uh, uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, just uh, uh, what are some of the recommendations? Uh, that you've made uh, after this treatment for Terry in, in, in terms of his uh, regular life or outside of the clinic? Uh, I believe I listed my recommendations uh, on a report um, that was on actually Exhibit 33, if you want to share that one. Um, I have some recommendations on there. I don't have it right in front of me, um, but, you know. Okay, I'll share it real quickly. Okay. It's not in color. Uh, That's okay. Uh, Just go all the way up to the top. Keep going. 
going. Okay, so right here, actually, um, if you go down, so um, these are some recommendations. Um, I recommended some massage therapy. Um, I know that he was seeing a, 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 um, a therapist as well, and I, I recommended that he continue to do that. Um, if you uh, scroll up again, keep going up. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, go, go, go down right here. So post epic treatment report. Anderson had a concussion uh, uh, on or about February 26, 2016? Uh, yes, it is. And that resulted in a TBI? It resulted in what we consider an MTBI, yes, a traumatic brain injury. Judge, just one second. We're going to try to find out if we skipped ahead too far. Page 51, line 12. She just read 11. No, um, psychotherapy, I recommended. Sorry, sorry, go, go, go down right here. So post-epic treatment reports recommendations. You know, he's still sure. reporting balance issues, dizziness, mental fog, feeling slowed down, difficulty remembering, um, irritability. Uh, and so I recommended, you know, um, psychotherapy. I recommended some additional cognitive and occupational therapy as well as neuromuscular therapy. Okay, and these are pages six and seven of the 87 pages of Exhibit 33. Okay. Um, so is it, um, is it your opinion that Dr. Sanderson had a concussion uh, uh, on or about February 26, 2016? Uh, yes, it is. And that resulted in a TBI? It resulted in what we consider an MTBI, yes, a traumatic brain injury. Um, and the cause, he self-reported that his injuries were caused by a ski collision on February So he reported that he was functioning fine.
I didn't want to make an objection in the middle of all that, but I just want. How are your opinions uh, changed since um, your deposition? Have they? Um, how, how have any of your opinions changed about Terry since his deposition? Uh, I don't think they've changed at all. If anything, I, I fear that's that that's the part right there that you should pause it. And you can pop ahead to line seventeen. including uh, two neuropsychologists, Dr. Eastfold and Dr. Austin. You, uh, you've reviewed the defense's uh, hand-picked experts, including uh, two neuropsychologists, Dr. Eastfold and Dr. Askenazi. Um, uh, what are your responses to their opinions, or at least in their reports? Well, I mean, they have a lot of opinions in their reports. Um, but again, I want to just emphasize that there's a really big difference between going over someone's chart in another state across the world and actually having that patient in front of me, you know, dejected, crying, <laughs> helping them. Um, you know, I think it's really easy to criticize someone um, from that far away, and it's a totally different beast when you're in the trenches with that patient trying to get them out. Um, they have, yeah, they have a lot of opinions that I think um, show that they are not concussion experts, uh, that they are not traumatic brain injury specific persistent post-concussion experts. And I think um, uh, if I'm being totally honest, some of their, a lot of their opinions uh, are easily refutable, if not most of their opinions are easy, easily refuta refutable by just going online and looking at you know the CDC recommendations for clinicians and how to treat concussions. Okay. Uh, With all due respect, but you know, I mean, they, they, uh, they do not. I just do, do not think that they're seeing him as a, as an individual and as someone that is really suffering and has suffered and has done everything in their power to try to get better. Okay. Uh, do you have or what examples do you have that? Uh, of their opinions that uh, you disagree with, if, if you can recall right now. Yeah, well, one of the big ones is that they don't think that he has post-concussion symptoms. Um, I don't know if they just don't believe it exists or, or whatnot, but, um, you know, I mean, it's interesting because I believe all the experts agree, defense and plaintiffs, that he had a concussion. What Where we're dividing is whether or not that turned into post-concussion symptoms. Um, and again, it's just, uh, they may not be aware of, you know, the litany of, of research that confirms that post-concussion symptoms are real and persistent post-concussion symptoms are real um, despite normal findings on neuropsychological assessment. Um, a, lot of their, a lot of their attacks seem to want to place a lot of the blame and the burden on prior diagnoses, like his prior anxiety or his prior depression or, or his prior headaches or, or his um, prior uh, findings. But the important thing to note is that this is a man who at that age of his late 60s was very, very active, was very high functioning, you know, um, was someone that was volunteering out in the community all the time. He organized social gatherings for people. I mean, this is someone that was engaged to be married, you know, and now has lost even that prospect. I mean, this has completely changed his life physically, emotionally, bi biologically, psychologically, and socially. We call it a biopsychosocial model, right? And he has been affected in all those domains. Um, and like I said, a litany of literature will back this up um, that, you know, he's not one of the miserable minority. And in fact, um, so much research will bear out that 
um, actually now a majority of patients are still reporting symptoms past the three to six to five year month mark or five year mark. Okay. You know? uh Lawrence, are you you're almost done? Because you, yes, you've I'm, I'm, the la I'm on the last page. Um, uh, the defense has mentioned repeatedly uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus or NPH. Uh, how does that factor into uh, Terry Sanderson's condition from this uh, post concussive syndrome? Um, well, you know, so normal pressure hydrocephaly is just kind of this. It's an abnormal buildup or an increase in cerebral spinal fluid in the brain's ventricles, right? And so um, it was noted, I, I know in 2009, um, the interesting thing to note was that he was asymptomatic with this, right? So people can have this and not even know that they have it um, until you, know, you get a brain scan or something. So I think he was, he was identified as having that, but I believe that uh, the doctor who, or the radiologist or the doctor who, uh, ordered that noted that he was not symptomatic at the time. But one of the things that, that, that uh, I want to point out is that that was one of the risk factors for him having post-concussion symptoms. That was one of the risk factors for him having a complicated recovery or, you know, a kind of a, uh, a more complex uh, pathophysiological process here that I, don't, that I don't think is being appreciated by the defense's experts. You know, it, it kind of almost made him more fragile and more susceptible to these issues. You know, I just want to point out, they're not mutually exclusive. He, he can't, it's not that, oh, he, he has NPH and that's all he has. If you have NPH, imagine, and then you have a significant hit to the head when you're flopped onto your face, you know, broken ribs and everything, that amount of force is going to cause trauma to any brain, let alone a brain that already has NPH as a diagnosis. So they're not mutually exclusive. If anything, they compound each other. Um, uh, what are the American Psychological Association Code of Ethics uh, directives uh, on doing exams, according to your understanding, that, that are involved with these defense experts? Um, can you clarify your question? I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, uh, the, uh, is, uh, are you familiar with the Code of Ethics? Um, yes, of course. The yeah, American Psychological Association Code of Ethics, of course, yes. Uh, what do they say about doing exams? Um, you mean like neuro... Yeah, I'm... Can you... Okay. Um, are they supposed to do them, uh, psychologists, when they're doing exams, such as for Dr. Terry Sanderson? Um, you mean... Oh, well, let's skip that. Uh, we're running short on time. Uh, do you... Are there any other, or what other criticisms do you have of the uh, neuropsychological experts um, for the defense? Any other before we leave? Um, I'm sure I do have some, but I'm sure that, that uh, James will bring them up. <laughs> okay. Um, that's all I have for right now. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Okay, great. Let's get right to it. Dr. Fong, I'm going to be kind of quick and curt, but it's not because I want to be a jerk. It's just because I have a job to do. and. Uh, want to help us make sure uh, we're getting to the, the truth here, the best that this process can can do. Sure. So if you wouldn't mind just making sure you, you really listen to my questions, answer them, especially if it's just a yes or no, it'll help if you just give me that and then I'll, you know, you'll have um, a chance to, to explain yourself um, with some of the other questions as well. So, and so I haven't heard you explain why you, you can say that Terry's findings are clearly connected to a, a post-concussive syndrome, as as against uh, you know, all, developing Alzheimer's or uh, he, he has multiple things listed here. I could go through them, but but you get the point, I think. I do. And objection. Me, uh, uh, objection. Uh, misstates facts and evidence. I'm using my 18 years of expertise as a clinical neuropsychologist and my expertise treating concussions using self-report measures, clinical interviews, um, using, uh, you know, uh, different in-house uh, in assessments to determine that. The reason I said that I believe it came from that accident was because, again, I'm using his report that prior to that accident, he was functioning fine. 
after this accident and the trauma and you know all the other physical trauma that happened to him, now he's having these issues. So I just want to clarify. Okay. Well, uh, one of my questions, though, is that you didn't do anything to assess whether there might be past medical history that could explain his findings during your evaluation, aside from received self-report from him. Is that right? Um, yes, correct. Um, but so, it, okay. So that's again. I'm sorry. I not, don't mean to be curt. I'm just trying to to, to be quick here. Letter so, from you, counsel. No, Lawrence, you gave me no time, so I'm trying to be be quick here, okay? And she'll be able to explain herself. So, uh, Dr. Fong, just to be clear, you did not ask for prior medical records and go through those uh, to, to see what there might might be in Mr. Sanderson's past, correct? That is not correct. How is that not correct? At your deposition, you made it really clear that you did not look at prior medical records. Well. But I did not go off nothing for that. I asked him about his I didn't, medical history. Dr. Fong, I did not say that you went off nothing. I, I very specifically asked whether you, you went through medical records to, to look for prior history that might have some influence on Mr. Sanderson's findings in your clinic. And the answer is that you did not do that, correct? I did not do that for Terry, but I do, don't do that for most patients that come to me. And so I need to just further correct you that um, most times when you go to the doctor, you know, you don't come with a whole stack of medical records. You come to the doctor saying, hey, these are my symptoms. This is what's going on. This is what happened. Can you treat me? And so sure. I'm not, I just want to be very clear. I am not a forensic. I don't do this forensically. A lot of the defense experts, that's when they'll need all these medical records to make all these opinions. I'm a treating doctor. I come with the patient as they are. I'm provided medical records sometimes. Right, but you, you did know when you, when you treated Mr. Sanderson that he was in active litigation about exactly the sorts of things you were evaluating him for and that your testimony, your opinions would be used in this case, did you not? No, I did not because there are some pe people that come in um, with attorneys that never, ever, ever ask me for an opinion at all. We have some people that come in without an attorney that through the course of, of the, the time get one, and then I have to testify. But I think um, yeah. un, uh, unlike some of your defense experts, I'm a treating physician 95% of the time. I, I, I only do this when I have to in these cases. Right, but I, I, I think you're misunderstanding what I'm getting at. I'm not saying you always testify. I'm saying you knew that your records would be and your conclusions that you put in your records would be part of, uh, likely be part of litigation, correct? See, yes, and that, that word was likely. I don't know, though, right? I mean, sure. I treated him like I treat everybody of else. Because just because someone has an attorney doesn't mean that it's going to go to litigation. And I've been in this game long enough to know that. No, of course. I, I, I know that as well. but. But because you knew that it was likely to go to litigation, because it was inactive litigation, why is it that you didn't uh, uh, ask for records so that you could be uh, as, as precise as you can be, right? I mean, that you should be able to, to uh, do some in interrogation of the facts that you're, uh, um, that you're gathering from him so that you can feel confident about the results that you offer, correct? Uh, no, and see, this is this is where I think you're trying to miscategorize me, James. Um, I didn't treat Terry any differently than I treat any other patient that comes to my clinic, whether they're in litigation or not. All all my job is is to testify as to what I did with him, the treatment that I had with him, and I did just as well with Terry's information that I do with the 18 patients that I have in, outside my door right now. So um, in the cases where there are medical records to be seen, I will see them, but I don't think you fully appreciate how busy um, my clinical practice is. I don't think you fully appreciate how many patients there are with post-concussion symptoms. You know, I mean, of all the traumatic brain injuries that occur, 90% of them are, are MTBIs or concussions. So I am very, very busy. I do not have time to pour over every single medical record. I take the patient as they come. If they provide me with some, that's fantastic. But my job is to get to work, get this patient better, um, and to move forward from that point. 
Right, but would, wouldn't you agree, as I think you did multiple times in your deposition, that you, at the time of your evaluation of Mr. Sanderson, had not reviewed or, or were not aware of multiple aspects of his prior history that could be relevant to your findings? Um, no, I, I believe the only thing I didn't know about at the time was the NPH diagnosis. I already knew about the migraine history in the depot. I already knew about the past anxiety and the past depression. Um, Doctor, we're going to have to go to your deposition, I guess, because um, I think there are multiple places where you acknowledge that you didn't know uh, some of these things. I don't know if you have the transcript available. I'm happy to go through these, but it, yeah. um, it's going to take a while, and I don't have time. So uh, I. Well, uh, yeah, then I, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to, I don't think you want to misspeak either, you know, um, there, no. I, 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 what I can say is that, you know, nothing's perfect. Maybe I missed one or two things here and there, but overall, you know, I assessed someone that was struggling, that listed his symptoms, um, and we went from there. Okay, so let's just go through a couple of these things. You, you were unaware at the time of your evaluation that he'd had two neuropsychological evaluations before your evaluation, right, in March 2016 and May 2017. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that, that is correct. And you also uh, were, you were unaware of the 2009 MRI that he had underwent prior to your evaluation. Yes, which I stated, yes. Right. And uh, you were unaware um, Let's see. Of his vision and hearing problems, are you saying? Are you saying now that you were aware? Uh, no. And in fact, no, I wasn't aware of his vision and hearing problems at the time. He did not report those to me. Um, right. He did, okay. he did That's report. all I need. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's all I need. Yeah. Were, were you aware that Mr. Sanderson reported to his primary care provider a few weeks before the collision that he felt like quote he was getting old all of a sudden? Um, maybe not in those specific words. Okay. I mean, you probably didn't know anything about that, right? Because you didn't look at records. No. Again, what I had was his self-report to me of what he was struggling with. And I just want to point out that the relevance of this um, uh, is to a treating doctor is not that relevant. I wanted to treat him who he was right here. The fact that he had two prior neuropsychological assessments how would that change my treatment of him, right? Because all, all I'm saying is he's coming to me with these symptoms. You know, I just want to treat from here on out. I think right. No, I get that. You've explained that multiple times. I get that. I'm saying it's relevant because there are experts on the plaintiff's side, not just the defense side, that say these prior issues are relevant because the r results might be influenced by those prior issues, and you didn't know about them. But I'm not saying that, that they're, let me, can I finish? Um, I'm not saying they're irrelevant. What I'm saying is, so I knew about the migraines, I knew about some of the psych issues, and what I'm assessing for, James, is these risk factors that set him up to be even more complicated, right? But that still doesn't change how I treated him. So what you are pointing out to me, though, are definitely things that um, make him more fragile that make him more susceptible to having more issues after this violent injury that he had, you know? So, um, sure, but on that point of violent injury, Dr. Fong, you didn't do anything but just receive his report about what the collision was, correct? Oh, yes, that is correct. I received and there are multiple, and are you aware that there are multiple uh, various fact witnesses that, that uh, um, contradict his account? Um, you know, that's not for me to determine. I'm not an attorney, but all I know is that, you know, um, this was a significant injury where he lost some consciousness and he had some several, he had several broken ribs as well. I mean, this wasn't just a light tap. Yeah, well, Dr. Fong, but that though some of those facts are in dispute, including whether he lost consciousness and you're not aware of that dispute, are you? Um, well, it, the dispute, honestly, James, again, if your experts 
could just look at the CDC it, map. It's world. not experts, <laughs> Dr. Fung. It's the fact witnesses, people that were there that say he did not lose okay. consciousness. Well, but so, what I want to point out, James, is that whether he did or did not lose consciousness is shouldn't be debated because actually 90 plus percent of, con of concussions don't lose consciousness at all. So I think that's kind of a red herring, honestly, you know. So if if you knew and if your defense experts and, and anyone else knew that, it's a red herring. You don't have to lose consciousness to have a concussion. 90% sure, of concussions do not have a loss of consciousness. So I, I, that's not why I'm bringing this up, Dr. Vaughn. I'm bringing it up to, to, to make, just make sure the jury knows the facts that you were not aware of any of the various claims about how this injury occurred at the time of your evaluation. Is that correct? Um, that may be, but now that I do know, it does not change my opinion, nor did it change how we treated him, nor does it change that he's still struggling with some of these issues and still needs help. A good way to get to this is to ask you whether there was anyone prior to your evaluation of Mr. Sanderson that diagnosed him with post-concussive symptoms or, or syndrome. Are you aware of anyone? Um, you know, I, I don't know that, but I, it just stands to reason that if he had a concussion and he was still struggling with those issues, that right there at that point, it becomes PCS or post-concussion symptoms. Right, but I don't, what I'm trying to get at is that it seems to me that you haven't done anything to, to scientifically rule out the possibility that prior uh, medical issues are are the are the cause of his abnormalities? I don't have to. As opposed to the concussion. But see, that that's what you're not understanding. I don't have to rule those things out. They can be part and parcel. You can have NPH. You can have a migraine. You can have anxiety and depression, and that makes you at much higher risk to have post-concussion symptoms. They're not uh, they're not extricable from each other. You know. Um, I think that, you know, I, in my last deposition, I quoted a study that, that had come out in that year, 2017, that actually showed that 72% of concussion patients five years later are still having symptoms. There's a study done by Dr. Bigler that same year that showed that only 27% of their cohort, of their patients, only 27% met full recovery. That's, you know, 78 uh, per, uh, 73% of patients that are not recovering. So again, the data is against uh, is against you really because these patients are not recovering like they think that we think they are and they're still needing help. And the problem is the longer this goes, the symptoms start to evolve. That's the whole purpose of the study is that at five year mark, and he's way past his five year mark now, these symptoms become psychological. They become inextricable from the actual uh, concussion itself. And that is where the research is leading. And if you were a concussion specialist, you would recognize that. PCS is what happens when you have a patient that has had a concussion and is still having those symptoms. And you're right, the anxiety, the depression, the NPH, the migraines, they all contribute, but they are not exclusive. They are all part of this problem. Right, but Dr. Fong, you even plaintiff's experts, including Dr. Baim, who I deposed yesterday, is a neurologist for the plaintiff. He says that most patients that have had a concussion, they they uh, do not go on to have post-concussive syndrome. In fact, he says it's it's five percent or less, I believe, is his his uh, number for what uh, of the percentage of patients that have a concussion that have persisting symptoms. So, do you disagree with that claim? I do, because, and I respect neurologists. I, I don't know who Dr. Bain is, but that was old data. That was data coming out of like 2003. If you look at data coming from 2017 forward, that number ranges from 27% to like 87% now that have these persistent issues. So I do respectfully disagree, but I do have to say that this is all I do all day every day is concussion and post-concussion. But that is where the data shows. That's what the data shows now. But nobody before you, nobody before you talked about post-concussive syndrome or PCS. Well, I mean, all I can tell you is that I'm a PCS expert, right? My clinic here is about PCS. I don't need another doctor to diagnose with PCS 
for me to be able to diagnose him with PCS. Does that make sense? But you just said that you didn't diagnose him with PCS. That, that's what I'm not getting, doctor. You're saying you don't no. diagnose him, but then you're saying that you did. And I, I can't understand where, what I'm missing. I don't understand what you're missing either. Terry had PCS. I have no problem saying that I would diagnose him with PCS just based on my interactions with him, the clinical interview, the self-report measures, the assessments. That is what I use. The reason why I would diagnose him with PCS, James, is because by the time he came to me, it had been almost a year and a half post his concussion. Per his report, prior to the concussion, he was asymptomatic. He was living his, his best life. He didn't have a lot of these symptoms. He did have, of course, the premorbid things that we talked about. But by the time he came to me, 18, 18 months later, I just want to make sure that this is clear. By the time he came to me 18 months later, with the constellation of symptoms that he reported, I diagnosed him with PCS. But I think, you know, your job, James, and I, you know, I think you're, you're doing it relatively, you're trying to do it relatively well, is trying to, you know, convoke. that it how do you know it's not just aging how do you know it's not just this how do you know it's not just this because you're ignoring the big event that catalyzed all this that started no all i'm not you, dr fong i'm not it's it i i have an understanding from other experts including experts on plaintiff side that the vast majority of concussions are treated in a short period of time it's totally possible is it not just i want a clear answer on this is it not possible that Mr. Sanderson had a concussion, the, the concussion symptoms resolve, and then he's continued to have other problems that that uh, you treated him for that were not concussion related? Is that not possible? I mean, anything's possible. It is not probable. It is not probable because I think you are completely ignoring the fact that he had these prior issues, which makes him more fragile and significantly more at risk for these issues. Yeah, but Dr. Fong, I mean, you haven't can even I reviewed. Can, sure. Okay, can I finish? Um, and they're not mutually exclusive. He can have these issues and have a concussion. And sure, I mean, at this point. I understand that, Dr. Fong. I understand that. I, you've made that clear. What I'm saying is you didn't do any work aside from getting a self-report report from Mr. Sanderson who you knew was litigating these claims, uh, you, you did not do anything to figure out what his history was from the time he had the concussion to the time that you treated him. That's correct. Other than self-report from him, you didn't do anything to assess what had happened to him, correct? That is what I do with all my patients, James. I know, but that doesn't matter if you've done it with all your patients. I'm just pointing out that you don't have a strong foundation in terms of the evidence to, to make a strong, confident claim that his concussion symptoms didn't resolve, and then he developed other symptoms or other prior symptoms persisted that were unrelated to the concussion. You didn't do anything aside from speaking to him to assess that. Is that correct? Um, all I can say to that is that I, I need a yes or I need a yes or no. On there that. is That's no a yes or no. Simple question. This, this is no. It's not a simple question. And here's how I'm going to answer it. I have more time with him. I have more evidence, I have more treating evidence with him, so I'm more apt and have more ability to answer this question than any of the other experts on either side because of the amount of time I spent with him. So if you're going to criticize um, the amount of time I spent with him and the information I gathered, um, remember that I'm the one who actually spent that week of treatment with him and have had more contact with him. So of sure, all but, the experts that, hold but, on, hold on please, of all the experts that are opining, I feel like I'm the best judge of what happened to him in that case. And so, again, you want to criticize me, we can flip that around and say, well, your expert spent no time with him. So, you know, again, sure. I mean, it, it's back and forth, but all I, all I can say, and I, I think you're going to keep beating this horse down, um, I gathered as much information from him as I did with all my other patients. I'm not going to treat him specially just because he has an attorney. He came to me with these problems, I treated him with these problems. Um, and he's, you know, he did get better in, in a lot of areas. He's still struggling. And that's what the focus needs to be, is he is still struggling. He's done everything he can to get help, 
but he needs more help. Sure, but Dr. Fong, while it's true that you have spent a lot of time with him, it, it's also true that his primary care providers, for example, spent more time with him than you did, right, over many years. Is that not true? I mean, if uh, someone treated yeah. him for decades, they have more experience with him than you do in the, in your boot camp, correct? Well, objection uh, assumes facts, not in evidence. Yeah. Please uh, just say, please no, just no, no. give me a, a yes uh, or no. That's a simple no. question. Objection, well, argument of. If someone, if you're going to someone as a general practitioner versus coming to me specifically, specifically for concussion, you're talking about apples versus oranges, James. Right, I've right, had but more I'm not experience with him with concussion. That's what this is about. It's about whether he has concussion symptoms, whether he's still injured. You know, I, I appreciate that his general practitioner is wonderful and will do all those things and will probably document that, yeah, you know, he, I'm not sure. I'm not going to assume what he documented, but I think that he spent more time with me as a treating doctor for concussions. Think about that 32 hours. I don't know if that would add up to, you know, the amount of time that would be spent with him in a general practitioner. I get what you're trying to say, but again, he's not coming to me for general medical problems. He's coming to me for his concussion. I see. So let me, I, I know I got to finish up here. Um, I have a lot more. James, let me quick object. Uh, uh, the uh, lawsuit started in January 2019. Her treatment was in 2017. Right, but you referred, uh, she knew he had attorneys, correct? I mean, uh, okay. uh, all she's, I she's, she's already answered that question. Okay, so. That's the problem with PCS, and, if, and you could do a lot of research on this. The reason why concussion is considered the most complex disease of the most complex organ is because the symptoms can be so broad and can be attributed to other issues, which is why you need a someone who has an expertise in this field to be able to to be able to diagnose that correctly or properly. So in your CV, you say that you're currently authoring a technical paper developing and outlining the standard of care for treatment of post concussive uh, concussion symptoms or mm -hmm. chronic concussion. So that implies to me that 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 standard of care is de being developed, that it hasn't actually been developed yet. Is that a fair interpretation? Um, it, it, persistent post-concussion symptom is a different animal from concussion. And so as far as setting, you know, there, there is no standard of care with these really complicated concussions. Um, all we're getting close to is that these cases are so difficult and so hard to manage that the decision of, of what imaging to use, what to do with these patients is done by clinician on a case-to-case -case basis. Um, it can, it, it's, it's a problem that people are recognizing and now we're adding that COVID long hauler is you know, another one of these issues. Um, I just, it just bears to the fact that you can have so many different experts saying so many different things um, that you know, it, it just it kind of leaves that part open. But for someone like me, who, like I said, I've treated 7,000 concussion patients, not much left is, uh, there's not much left to a ton of interpretation for me. I have probably seen more than, and again, I'm talking specifically about this persistent post-concussive class of people, right? Um, I've probably seen more than most other clinicians in the world. That's why I get referred to from physicians and clinicians all over the world. Okay, a couple real quick questions, and we'll be done. But as I understand from your deposition, you were not you're not board certified. Is that correct? Uh, it's not a requirement. Nope. Right, but just to answer the question. The, the answer I did, is no. I said no. I said no, but it's not. Oh, required. sorry. Okay, got it. I, sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear that. So, um, and you did not do a fellowship training. Is that right? Uh. No, that's absolutely not true. I did two years of fellowship um, in a postdoc uh, while I was here at the hospital. So I actually trained under Dr. Jim Snyder, who was a, a neuropsychologist. So I actually meet all the requirements uh, to do it, but I'm, I'm just old enough really where it hasn't affected my career or um, it, it's not something that uh, I need to do. Um, okay. New psychologists uh, do have to do that, but again, I, I meet all the requirements for that. I see. I, well, I apologize because I didn't see any fellowship 
listed on your CV. So that's why I, I thought um, you, you talked about an internship at the BA, but that's yes. separate that's from separate. your fellowship. Yep. So after that, um, in order to, to meet the requirements to be certified, you have to spend two years working under a neuropsychologist as well which uh, I did that right out of my, um, right after I left the VA hospital working with the veterans. Okay, I see. Um, and you actually have like a certificate, maybe it's on the wall behind you that says, <laughs> fellowship, I, I, res I completed a fellowship in neuropsychology or whatever. So um, I am kind of right in that um, mid phase where I kind of gra I'm grandfathered in under other, um, uh, under that fellowship requirement because Again, back when I was um, back when I graduated, it was kind of a newer thing, and not a lot of neuropsychologists needed to get it done. It, it's really more for this new generation coming out. Um, I haven't needed to do it; it hasn't affected my authority or my expertise in any way. Okay, but was it wasn't called a fellowship then, or was it called an internship? I'm just no, trying to get the term. No, no, it, I, it was just postdoctoral work. You know, postdoctoral um, okay. work. Yeah, full time right. under uh, a neuropsychologist. I see. So it wasn't called specifically like fellowship no, training. No, it right? wasn't. Okay. No. Got it. And I, I believe in your deposition, you reported that Mr. Sanderson told you, I think the day of your deposition, that he had fallen, hit his head, and had this 45 minutes of loss of consciousness. Do you recall that? I do recall that because I reread my deposition right before this. And. Uh, and I guess you haven't evaluated him since then, so you, it, it's hard for you to say whether he has symptoms relating to that. That's correct. And uh, do you know whether he saw any medical treatment for that? Not that I'm aware. I didn't ask. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Would you recommend treatment for after an experience like that? Um, an injury, I guess yeah. I should say. Yeah, of course I would. You know, um, I would. Okay. Um, so I, maybe you answered this when Mr. Bueller was asking you questions, but um, it seems like the treatment that you provided you saw as successful, but you have uh, since learned that Mr. Sanderson has gone downhill, was I think the term you used in your deposition. Um, why? Why did his the the treatment not stuck? Or I'm not sure, quite sure how to ask this question, but you get what I'm asking, right? That that uh, if he was treated for it and it went well, why does he still have these symptoms? And maybe they're even worse now. Yeah. So um, and you know when I say successful, I don't mean 100% full recovery, right? I mean, you know, he by successful I mean that there are definitely some areas that improved, and even he reported some improved, um, you know, uh, symptoms. Um, but, you know, yeah, the, I think one of the reasons is he wasn't done, right? I mean, we, we did a week with him. I still had some issues that I noted there. I recommended some further treatment for him. Um, but, you know, uh, it's a brain injury, you know? I mean, it's, uh, and I only get a week with them. Um, like I said, in some cases, you know, especially in younger patients, they can get better pretty quickly and we never hear from them again and they're off, but, you know, to be honest, Terry was already, I don't know, maybe he was in his 70s by the time he came to us. I don't, I'm not sure, maybe 70s, I don't know. But you know, um, older adults do tend to have a little bit of a harder time, you know. Um, there's not as much neuroplasticity. I mean, that there could be a lot of reasons. I think some of the reasons too could be the premorbid issues he had, you know, like the NPH and the prior migraines and other things that, you know, made his recovery harder and more complicated. I think I'm Okay. Yeah, I think I'm done. Let me just look at one more page, if, if I may. Is that okay? I'm sorry to, to take take your time well, uh, here. Doc, uh, why don't we uh, go on a break, then? Back on record, the time is 4.01. Thank you, Dr. Fong. That'll be it. That's it? Yeah. Th thanks, Dr. Fong. Again, I apologize for, uh, I, could, I could have treated you better, but I, I it was sort of felt time crunched. I had a lot to get to. I didn't mean to interrupt a bunch, but thanks for being patient with me. Thank you, James, and thanks for uh, for everyone to hear hearing me out here. Um, and yeah, appreciate appreciate it. Okay, that completes Dr. Fong's testimony, and we'll take our recess now.
who's next? Shay is the daughter. And then Polly. Polly. Thank you. I told you yesterday. I wrote it down.
Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Sykes, you may proceed. I'm going to call Polly Grasham. Thank you. Right. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give to the court is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Thank you. Have a seat. Good morning, Ms. Grasham. Would you start by stating your full name and spelling it? Sure. You might need to move that microphone a little bit to the center. There you go. Okay. My name is Polly Sanderson Grasham. Do you need spelling? Yeah, would you spell it? Okay. Polly is P O L L Y Sanderson, S A N D E R S O N. Gresham is spelled G-R-A-S-H-A-M. Tell the jury, uh, if you would, your age. Yeah, just turned 49. Okay. We all thought of 39, so <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about that. Now, tell them a little bit about your background in terms of where you grew up, your education, et cetera. Take us to university. Okay. Um, grew up in a small town in uh, southern Idaho, Soda Springs. Okay. Um, graduated from high school there in 1992. Okay. Um, went on to college at the University of Idaho in Moscow. Um, left there in about 98. Okay. Uh, moved to Missoula, Montana and finished my degree there in 2005 at the University of Montana. Okay. Where are you currently living? So I uh, reside in the northern region of Idaho, the Panhandle, kind of on the southern end of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Okay. Uh, are you married? I am. My husband and I have been married for almost 25 years. Okay. Uh, and how long have you lived in the Coeur d'Alene area? So um, we, again, we were up north going to college in Moscow, um, and then we had that five years in Missoula and then returned back in 2005 to, to North Idaho. Okay. Uh, what do you do there? What's your occupation? Yeah, so I work for the University Extension System. I um, teach. The, the University of Idaho? or University ISU? of Idaho, oh. yep. Uh, so some people are familiar with the 4-H program. I teach um, STEM education for youth ages 5 through 13. So bring science, technology, um, engineering, math to schools. And um, I'm also a master food safety advisor. So anyone in the community that wants to safely preserve their food, I teach pressure canning classes, things like that. Okay. And um, <clears throat> is that your only job up there? Uh, the, the extension service, or you have other jobs you do? That's my um, paid position, and then I volunteer with other things, too. Okay, and your husband, what does he do? Uh, he's employed uh, through the Forest Service, so he's been a wildland firefighter for 31 years. Okay. I hope he doesn't have much to do this summer, hopefully. We all hope yeah. that. All right. Um, now, you're Terry's daughter, is that correct? That's right. So, Terry has three daughters, and I'm the middle one. Okay, and who's the older one? So my older sister is Shay, and yep. she's about two and a half years older than I. And um, so she's fifty-two-ish. Yeah. Okay. And then Jenny. Yeah, Jenny is quite a bit younger. I think she is 40, 41. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to talk to you about Terry Sanderson before the ski accident of February 26, twenty sixteen. I'd like to ask you to tell the jury <coughs> generally about his activity level before that ski crash. Okay. Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> this is this the first time you've been on a, a witness? Yeah, I served on a jury. Um, so, yeah, there's that's a different perspective. Um, a great little civics lesson. Um, I'm going to give you a water. And feel thanks. Free to take your time. Don't be nervous. No, that's easy said than done. Uh, but I'd like you to tell the jury a little bit about your father's activity level 
Mm-hmm. But you know what, first, before you answer that question, um, a foundational question. You live in Idaho. I live there, I'm sorry, uh, in the Lane, Idaho area. And you've lived there since about 05, mm-hmm. roughly. Okay, you need to answer yes or no so they can tell yes. Okay. And um, so how often have you seen him uh, during these last uh, few years? Let's say uh, after 2010. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was a little harder when he um, moved to Salt Lake City. Sure. I think he, he loved all that Salt Lake City offered, concerts and skiing. But it was a further distance from... Uh, my sisters and I are relatively close, so, um, but we would make time to be together on the holidays, usually travel to see him in the summer. Um, I'd say um, two or three, three or four times a year. Okay. And for how long? I mean, would you be a few hours or a few days or a week or what? Yeah, typically a week. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's say uh, in, in the five or six years or so before this uh, February 26, 2016 uh, ski, ski crash. Describe for the jury his activity level and everything you can think of. Go ahead. Yeah, so I would describe my dad as a, a goer. Um, I think people would describe him as uh, fun-loving, very gregarious, definitely an extrovert. Um, so enjoyed people, dancing, um, outdoor activity, just engaged. Um, so if we went places, um, give ourselves plenty of time because he would need to visit and follow up with people, very social. Um, uh, a real positive influence, just really could shine people on. Would you have these, these connections in Coeur d'Alene area or in Salt Lake or both? Yeah, both. Mm-hmm. Uh, describe some of the events where he would visit with people. You just mentioned he would take extra time and visit with people. Describe some of those events, please. Well, yeah, even, you know, eating out at a restaurant or <laughs> in the high school gymnasium, you know, I think he really got to know people, loved people. Um, he would always remember my friends' names, so um, would follow up with, hey, how's your friend Sam doing, you know? Um, he knew what was going on in my life and, and engaged wherever he was. Uh, you, you mentioned volunteer, I think. Uh, do you know what he did in terms of volunteering? Yeah, yeah, I think that was something, when he retired, he really uh, stayed engaged but had more free time to do those kind of things. So um, he volunteered for things like the green team so he could go catch concerts and then they would kind of do the cleanup and the recycling afterwards. Um, I believe... So volunteer, retired uh, optometrist, yeah. to go clean up after a concert. Yeah, yeah. But he enjoyed the social aspects of it and um, getting to see music and, and yeah, he... Um, he volunteered for an organization, I think it was called People, People Helping People. And um, so any kind of person that wanted to advance their career or profession, he would uh, offer to review their um, resume, practice interview skills, things like that. Um, and he was very proud of you know, being able to help this person grow into their full capacity. What is the green team at Sundance? What is that exactly? I think it's just cleanup. I think in between showings or in between music venues, right, they go in and they clean up and they sort what can be recycled. And What, what type of activities in these four or five times a year that you saw him, what kind of activities did you do with him? Mm-hmm. Can you describe those? Just enjoyed our time together. So... Um, cooking dinner. Um, we spent a lot of time outdoors, so going for walks, uh, bicycle rides, hikes. Um, we hadn't gone skiing in the last couple of years. That was an activity that we did together. Um, we go boating, 
we would go to museums. A lot of times we'd take my daughters or uh, my nieces to museums. Um, yeah, just generally catch up. How many children do you have? I have two daughters. And how old are they? So uh, my oldest, Hope, is 25. Youngest, Anna, is 22. How did, how did Terry get along with him? Before the accident? Yes. Um, he was always just a big cheerleader, knew what was going on in their lives, uh, followed up with their classes, um, showed up for events, you know, would go to things like basketball games when he was in town. Um, was he able to, uh, you know, if you saw him in, let's say, December, uh, and you next saw him in March, did he keep in his mind prior to the ski crash uh, what they had been doing? Could he remember those things? Oh, yeah, yeah. And they're friends, too, right? Names of the friends. Names of the friends, yeah. Granted, it's a small town. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of the town, actually, is? So I live in between Harrison and St. Mary's. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's St. Mary's address. It does, closer to Harrison, but. Okay. Uh, did you ever do projects together of any kind? Yeah, because that's what dads do, right? <laughs> he would. <laughs> yeah, so um, a lot of, you know, repair projects I might have around the house. Um, he helped me uh, install the irrigation in my garden beds and um, I had a le leaky sink got anything that had working not working electrical that I was having issues with you know he knew where my husband's toolbox was and he was always willing to help me figure things out okay um, tell the jury if you would about your dad's personality his personality before the crash I think in my description of him, you know, I mentioned he's just really fun-loving. Um, gregarious, was really quick with a joke and a smile, um, and just real positive. Was he easy to be around? Oh, definitely, yeah, and just made everything kind of smooth. Did he have any negatives that repelled people that you can think of? Any what? Negatives that repelled people. Oh. You know, sometimes I think when you are kind of that energy, right, you have to be mindful of the fact that, um, of other people too. And I think he had the tendency to, uh, yeah, sometimes not always notice every, everyone in the room or, you know, he was, he was a little bit more self-aware, I'd say. All right. Um. What about his mental status? Uh, you've mentioned a few things that cross over into that area, but just kind of summarize for the jury uh, his, his mental status as you observed it prior to the ski crash. So my dad was smart. I used to describe him kind of as a mental mind, and sometimes I think that can almost get you in trouble. Um, but really, really smart, quick to figure things out. I. Um, have a memory one time when he'd come to visit and my dryer wasn't working at the time so I'd hung um, hung diapers out on the line and he would said why are you not using your dryer I said well it's taken apart James had to leave and uh, so there was all sorts of parts originally James thought it was the heating element it wasn't the heating element he yes he'd taken it entirely apart and uh, my dad was able to troubleshoot it and put it all back together again and he did that all the time. Like he just, I, you know, he could figure things out, troubleshoot things. Do you understand the, the term executive function? Somewhat. I, I think of it as the ability to get things done, yeah. multitask, run our lives. Multitask, good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can you describe your dad, to the jury, uh, describe your dad's executive function status before the, the ski crash? Yeah. Definitely just a, a manager and really a multitasker. Had a lot going on, um, far more than, than I would be willing to take on. Um, I think he liked that. Like I said, he was a mover, a goer. So um, 
that that was just how we operated. Now, uh, your dad got divorced from your mom. About what year was that? I was a senior in high school, so 1992. Okay. Um, a little less than two years before the uh, ski crash, he met someone named Carlene Davidson. Uh, uh, did you come to know her, and would you explain to the jury how you came to know her? Yeah, I did. Really liked Carlene, and uh, my sisters liked her too, her and her little dog. And um, yeah, they just seemed like a really a good pair. Um, Why do you say that? What did you observe about Carlene and Terry that made them a good pair? It, they were just loving towards one another. Um, it, you know, she had girls in St. George and parents, and I liked seeing that they, you know, like my dad helped her sell her parents' house um, and, you know, empty the furniture out and things like that. Um, I just saw them as being really supportive and loving to one another. I think they had fun together. They laughed a lot. Um, it was kind of, it gave me hope. I could see my my dad growing old with her for sure. And how often do you think you, you saw them together? Uh huh. Yeah. I remember one time coming through, we had an exchange student with us from Japan at the time, um, and we went to, was it Lagoon, the local amusement park here, um, and so rode all the rides with my dad and with Carlene. That and was that, okay. uh, 2015. Okay. Um, just had had a lot of fun. But yeah, she would come for the holidays. Um, she was there at my daughter's graduation party. So, so if your dad came, she came during that time? Correct. Okay. Either in Idaho or if you came down to Salt Lake? Yeah, she was here, yeah. Um, did you ever not notice your dad to be accident prone or clumsy or bump into things, anything like that? Prior to the accident? Yeah. No, he's got, he, he had really great balance and uh, activity level. Did he have any problem that you ever noticed? Now, when you came down here, did you ever fly or did you drive? Oh, both. We did both. Did you go on car trips with him or, or uh, you know, to the store or to the lagoon, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you ever notice him have any problems driving? Uh, prior to the accident, no. I, um, again, with his multitasking, he would tend to maybe take on more things that I would be comfortable, you know, I would say, here, I'll take that call for you, or, um, so and he that. Would, he would be driving and take a call? Yes, okay. which I, you know, at the time I had team drivers, so I kind of had these hard and fast rules that it's like, if you're going to be driving, you need to tuck your phone away, right? And so it felt a little bit hypocritical of, if dad was in the car to be like, you're not gonna answer your phone, right? Because these teens are watching you. And and um, so he might have been capable of that. I mean, he, he hadn't had accidents or anything, but that was probably a bone of contention. I think not just for myself, but my sisters too. Yeah. What, what about health problems? Did you ever notice any health problems with him in the several years prior to the ski crash? you were aware of? So that's one of our hobbies that we share because I'm pretty into wellness and okay. supplements too. Um, yeah, no, I think his health, I think he managed it. He did have issues. He um, had prostate cancer. He um, had some issues with his eye. I mean, I was aware and I'd come for some of those appointments. Um, I mean, I don't know all of it, and that became apparent in my deposition that, um, like, I, I haven't reviewed my dad's medical records or anything. It's only what I, what he's shared with me. Or, or what you observed. Right, yeah. right. So, uh, do you have any chronic conditions that you remember that were prominent and you observed them? Now, he um, had cancer, but he, that was cured, right? Yeah, yeah. Huh? I went through um, radiation and everything for that. Yep. Um, Anything come to mind? I think he'd had, um, wow. I think he, he had migraines and some headaches. How Not often? all the time, um, rarely, but I remember when they when they hit, it would be a hard, 
ago. Rarely, you said? Rarely, <laughs> but I think those existed. What about uh, sleep apnea? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I think he did have some trouble sleeping. Did he have a CPAP machine, or how did he, how did he treat it, if you know? That's a great question. Okay. Um, I don't know. You don't know? You don't know. <clears throat> what about depression? I, prior to the accident, I wasn't aware of any struggles with depression. Uh, I don't know that he would have been honest in sharing that okay. with me. <laughs> what about... Um, what about losing energy? Did you ever notice him to be losing energy before the, the ski crash? No, and usually it was me that if we were together, I'd be like, I need, I need to take a break. What, you know, what about alcohol? How, did you, when you were down here, uh, uh, did, did he drink alcohol? I've seen my dad drink before yeah. um, a beer or a glass of wine. I have never seen my dad um, intoxicated or anything that I felt like was too much. Okay. So I came in on Monday night um, and we had some tea together and then I think he has, he's had a, a beer since I've been here. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> did you ever notice that he had memory problems or forgetfulness prior to the ski crash? No. Okay. Uh, what about skiing? What, what was your conversation about skiing prior to the, the ski crash? So, uh, my history, too, I don't know if you want to know that. My, sure. my family started off cross-country skiing. I think I was probably about a kindergartner. Um, and this is in was, Soda, is it Soda Springs? Soda Springs, yeah. yeah. It was really yeah. great country, and it was, you know, something that we could do as a family. And so we'd pack a picnic, and, and we spent a lot of weekends like that. And then, I think probably about 1984... Um, we kind of picked up downhill skiing, and gosh, it was a lot less work getting up the hills. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. um, fun. And um, we had, you know, family cousins that uh, would come ski snowbirds, so we would come up and, and ski with them and practice. And um, and then... You would, you would come down from Soda Springs to ski snowbird? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And say, I think our cousins had a condominium at Snowbirds, and we would get to really? crash with them. And it was, you know, lots of kids, lots of cousins. And um, so then in 1986, um, one of my good friends, her dad was ski patrol at Targhee. And so we would go most weekends to Targhee and ski together. Um, what, what kind of skier was he? He, um, he, was, he was a better skier than I was. Okay. And uh, he liked to have fun, but I don't think he, he took a lot of risks, you know. He was kind of what you would think of as an old man skier, just out okay. to enjoy the day. So he would sometimes go fast, sometimes with the kids he wouldn't go so fast? Yeah, yeah. And he skied with my kids um, several times. And um, Would you rate him as a, uh, intermediate or advanced or expert? Um. I would say between advanced and expert at his best. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, did he love skiing? Was it something he loved? Yeah. I think it was a big reason for him when he retired to come down this direction. I think it was something he loved to do. I don't think, I don't know if I've asked you this, but did you ever notice a vision impairment in any way affecting his skiing? Are you aware of that in any way? You know, after he had that occlusion in his in his right eye, I think the um, the binocular vision it was harder to see see depth, so it was a little more flat for him. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like he was a little more cautious more as cautious. a skier, for sure. Uh, was he a, generally a healthy person prior to the ski accident? Yes. <clears throat> Any particular medical problems you're aware of that he had prior to the accident? Uh, you had mentioned the sleep apnea. We talked about prostate. Um, no. Anything come to mind? No. no. Okay. No. Sorry. Uh, now let me <coughs> talk about the ski accident. How did you learn about the ski accident? In my memory, at first I thought it was a phone call. Okay. I remember telling me that my dad, that he had... Can we just get a little foundation? Who's talking? 
who made the call? Do you mind, Your Honor? I, I think um, uh, if I the objection to... is relevance, I'm going to overrule it, and, and you can bring it out on cross. Then. Okay. Without Sustained. Knowing. Okay. Uh, tell us how you learned about the ski accident. I wasn't sure if it was my dad that called me or or my sister that called me. Okay. Um, could it have been Carlene, maybe, possibly? It could have been, for okay. sure. So you don't remember exactly who told you, but someone called you? Yeah. Okay. That there had been an accident <clears throat> on the hill that day. So this is your now hearsay. It is. I don't think she's attributing it to any any particular individual. Uh, if the question is, when did you... Why don't you ask when she became aware of it? When did you become aware of the ski accident of... I don't mean to lead you, but February 26, 2016. <laughs> it feels like that evening. You know, I think of it that day um, that he felt he had broken some ribs. That was painful. And I think the words were, you know, he got his bell rung. Bell rung. Yeah. Uh, did you ever find out at any time that Gwyneth Paltrow was involved? I, I don't believe that that night. Okay. It, it was after the initial accident. Tell us, <clears throat> tell the jury about the uh, details of your association with Terry, your father, after the crash. Mm -hmm. When did you come down and how often have you seen him in the past seven years. Right. Summarize that, would you? Right. So I don't think I saw my dad in person until Hope's graduation, which would have been the end of May of that year. Um, did, did you have telephone calls that you exchanged before that? Yeah, we did. How and long? text messages. You know, I, I thought my dad and I talked probably every couple of weeks. Um, the defense during my deposition had pulled phone records and it didn't look like it was this frequent before that. Um, so it could have been one of those spells. Um, my sister had had an injury, so I was kind of spending a lot of energy taking care of her as well and my, my niece is making sure she had some solid ground. Um, and so with my dad being here in holiday and Knowing he was with Carlene, I felt like things were being kind of taken care of. Um, so you felt comfort that Carlene was with him? Help. Yeah, yeah, because I wasn't. And um, I knew he was, you know, following up with medical care. My dad, being in that occupation, values that and makes sure that, you know, someone's looking at that, checking on that, making sure. Um, Damages aren't permanent, those kind of things. Um. Just so it's clear, um, <clears throat> I've been to Coeur d'Alene. Uh, is it about a 12-hour drive to get to Salt Lake from there? It sounds about right. Yeah. And if you fly, you have to drive to Spokane or Missoula? Is that it? Yeah, I flew out of Missoula, but you can fly, fly from Spokane as well. I think the other part of that is with the pandemic. You know, that was, that made a lot more travel restrictions in the last few years. I, I definitely have not got to spend as much time with him recently. <clears throat> Let's talk about your dad after the ski crash. Uh, describe, if you would, his ability to keep things in control and keep things organized after the crash. You know, directly after the crash, I would say a good year, year and a half, I felt like, I don't want to say stupid, that's not the word, but like his, his processing speeds, you know, like the effort that it took, um, definitely when we were in person for, for Hope's graduation, I felt like, wow, wow. There was a time when he's sitting in a chair by, the, by my window. In Idaho? In Idaho, and I, I almost expected drool to be coming out of his mouth because his whole, I, it was first of all he wasn't engaged with anybody. He had kind of taken himself to a remote corner, and I just felt that was my first 
real kind of slap in the face of like something's terribly wrong. How about his ability to uh, keep from getting frustrated and overwhelmed? Does that change at all? I think I think that's the the biggest change right now, right? Well, tell He's, the jury about it. Give. Yeah, I think. Um, I describe it. He's really, you know, the details and the minutia. Like he can't see the forest for the trees. It's very much gets stuck in really s- small, small things. And so, for me, it's always that pullback of like, well, let's look at the big picture. Um, I even just last night I was thinking about you know when you write an essay and you have a topic sentence and then you add supporting sentences with some details for that main sentence it's like the main sentence is gone and all we have are the little details and so then you're kind of going well then so how (laughs) how does this relate to that you know I think he's just I think it's part of the frustration is he gets really caught up in details and connections and the primary focus or purpose. We, lo- we lose that. And so then I have to come back around and I have to say, well, how does that connect with the kimchi we were talking about or um, the damage to your phone port? Like I have to kind of bring it full circle. And then, you know, I, I think he is, gets frustrated and, and ang- anger, angry. I have tried to, you know, remind him that, because before you could, he could have lots going on, and now it's very A to B. A to B, don't throw in a C or a D, right? Because then we're gone completely. So how do we simplify, you know, and just, just this task, just um, A to B. <laughs> and um, I had a conversation with my um, dad and my sister Jenny's boyfriend, Nathan, and I was trying to say, you know, maybe take it as kind of a, a gift to be in the present with what you're doing right now. You know, just let's just focus on this one step. And I think that's easy for me to, to try to say, how do we move forward? Because, but I understand that there's a lot of grief and loss for the way that his life functioned before, that it doesn't function now. He doesn't always appreciate my, <laughs> let's stay in the moment, or what are, what are the gifts, what we can learn from now. Um, he's, he's still kind of grieving and frustrated that his he doesn't think the way he thought before functioned the way he did. Any change in his ability to get things done? It's it's really messy right now. It's really hard. And I I say, Dad, <laughs> you can hire you can hire somebody to do that. You know, if your house is messy, let's get some help. Or um, somebody can help you with the blowing out the sprinkler system like those are things we can have other people help you do um but I think he has a hard time with the way they do the work and he he's kind of real negative and and it doesn't feel like that's been an answer for him and I tried to lead him in that direction so that he doesn't feel like there's just so much he and and he'll say that I'm just I'm so behind I'm I'm so behind I can't get things done um, even coming to his house this week, right? I know that this has been something he's um, put a lot of time and effort into, but I could, I could tell that it's just piles and piles of things. Lots of notes, you know, you can tell he's putting in all of the effort, and there's a lot of busyness, but it's not effective, right? How about any change in his ability to stay oriented or become disoriented? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, definitely disoriented. And I, my dad always had a good idea of kind of north-south. Um, but yeah, I have gotten, he'll say, oh, I can get you there. But I've come to rely on my 
navigation device when I come. Um, because he does get confused even just going down to the park. And, and have you gotten lo- has he gotten lost with you? Yes. Tell the jury about that. Well, we were we were headed down to Sugar House Park, you know, and he. Um, this is when I come down for the deposition, so twenty twenty June of twenty twenty. Yeah. He's like, oh, it's real simple, you know. We we'll just go here and there, and we got somewhere, and it was like, I don't, I don't think this is right, and then, you know, pull up my Google Maps on my phone and he's like, no, I can, I can find it, you know, and he's like, I just need a minute, you know, and so it got lost. yeah, I don't think that was, um, as bad of a situation, right? He's with me. He's not alone. I have Google Maps. Um, but yeah, I have a, I mean, besides just the, the directionality thing, we spent a summer day out on the lake and Um, kids we had attached an inner tube so that they could we could pull them behind on the boat and um, my my dad could not secure the boat or the inner tube to the boat and just like a simple hitch knot you know and and it came off once and he said oh you know he just kind of embarrassed my husband like showed him again you know the next time I think it was probably the third time (laughs) He just shook his head, you know, like he, he couldn't secure the knot he of the, yourself. yeah, yeah. Is that unusual for him? Or did that change? Yeah, definitely. Uh, did you have a chance in the six months after the uh, crash to observe uh, your dad and Carlene interacting? Mm-hmm. Tell us what you observed about Carlene helping him and what happened to that relationship. Yeah, I, I mentioned that that me seeing him in person was about three months after the accident. And I just really saw Carlene step up in a way, um, you know, of, oh, Terry, don't forget your jacket. We're getting ready to go. Repeating conversations that he had missed where he was, like, maybe out of the picture and she would fill him in of, you know, Anna's gonna go here, or um, yeah, she just was carrying and, and stepped up where he seemed a little slow. What happened to that relationship? I don't. Perspective? I don't really know. I I wish I'd had the opportunity to really uh, talk with her, and I, I didn't. Like I said, the last time I saw her was at that graduation, and so that was May of. Uh 2016 and I think because we had neighbors and friends and my mom and every everyone there I didn't get to have a private conversation really about how my dad was doing um, and or you know how their relationship was going and if she was doing okay at Hope's graduation your mom came yes Uh, the the one that he had divorced right that right and how do they get along? They they don't get along. They there's usually a lot of distance. I mean they they share family members, so I think they're respectful of that and come to the celebration, shared celebrations, but they don't they don't usually converse or connect. Was he respectful? Was my mom respectful? No, your your dad. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. That that go round. <laughs> that go round, okay. Uh, any change in his social life and friends that you observed? Mm-hmm. Tell us what it would be. You know, I'm not super close with his his friendships, but it does feel like um, they've kind of fallen away. Relationships, friendships has been really hard for him to navigate. You told me once that it was a lot harder for him. He had to work a lot harder to be a friend. Is that a fair yeah. statement? Explain yeah. that. Explain that. I, it feels like after the accident, he's a little more involved with his own his own world, and um, that's harder to sustain connections when it's kind of about me right now. Um, that's a change. I, I didn't, and that makes it really hard to just. Um, To genuinely care about people, that's part of our connection. Have you 
observe any personality changes, and if so, what have you observed? I think it's kind of connected to feeling overwhelmed. So uh, he's easily frustrated. He gets agitated, um, angry for the first time. Like I, I didn't have memories of him being an angry person, but he's got a pretty short fuse these days. Since the accident. Yes. Yeah. What about uh, any other personality changes come to mind? I, I think he's just a little more cautious, um, not as confident. Is he having fun? No. I think, I think he's in a really negative place, and that's hard for me as his daughter. Based on uh, <coughs> what you have seen since the crash, okay, uh, as a daughter who apparently loves him, it's evident, uh, would you recommend that he travel overseas by himself? <laughs> no. Why not? No. Uh, I think the disorientation, um, yeah, I think he needs help. I think. If he goes with someone, is that okay, do you think? If he has a friend that goes with him? I think it depends on the someone. All right. Yeah. Someone who's trustworthy. Yeah, he cares about him. Um, any observations about executive function changes since the uh, ski crash? Well, I mentioned just no ability to multitask, really. So um, lost that. Yeah. I, I think, um, again, not seeing the forest for the trees, really, really caught in minutia. And... Um, I don't see him like reading a book or you know those kind of things that um, would previously be enjoyable. I right, just a few more questions for you. Um, everybody has negative traits, right? Uh, or traits that aren't uh, refined to the extent that it would be helpful to be refined, right? Sure. Okay. And your dad probably has some of those. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like you to tell the jury if you saw any increase in intensity of negative traits after the ski crash? And if so, what did you see? Mm -hmm. I, have, <laughs> I have this example that had happened when we were, we were sitting on his back deck on a summer day, and I could kind of see into the neighbor's back patio, and it looked like she had done a lot of work. She had kind of some neat rugs and place to meditate and I was like wow that that's really that's a neat spot they created there and and my dad <laughs> you know started going on about where they had planted a tree and right in his view and I thought okay that's super small and petty you have a really beautiful view right here you know and then he said I'm pretty sure like she puts her garbage can right there she does that just 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 to make me mad and then he said, you wouldn't believe what she did. Uh, she, well, I, I did get a letter from her apologizing. She sent a card saying, I am so sorry, I shouldn't have done that. But when he wasn't home, she had gone and moved a pile that he had that was just outside of his gardening stuff and tools and kind of a messy pile. He had put it um, on the, his boundary. And so that was probably what she was seeing when she was gonna meditate or whatever. And so she had come over to move the pile so that it was out of sight. And so in this card, she had just said, I just wanted to apologize. That was so wrong. And he was so upset that she had done that. And I said, that's really huge of her to acknowledge. So he refused to acknowledge the apology? Yes. And the fact that she was human, had made a mistake, she had apologized. And I kept thinking, you know, those relationships with our neighbors, I love my neighbors. And my dad's always had good neighbors, right? So I thought, where, you know, we had gotten into kind of a disagreement that morning because I was like, those are really small things. How different is that from where he, how he was before the crash? I, I feel like, you know, even if he had a difference of opinion, we could always kind of reason through it, agree to disagree, um, get along, take care of one another. And so 
that was a hard thing for us to talk about is that that's that's small and you're bigger than that you know and it's kind of reversed because he was my dad that gave me those values and then it feels like they've kind of fallen away and he's stuck in that but I'm so mad and I'm so frustrated you know any any change in his cognitive functioning that you haven't already talked about kind of summarize that would you cognitive functioning yeah I again I think his operating system is not quite as slow as that initial year and a half where I was just well it's been some improvement some some improvement I think he's been really dedicated to sort of working hard work he is a I will work hard kind of guy um maybe to a fault but yeah what about the negatives any negatives in his cognitive functioning that remain that you've seen You've mentioned some already, but... And a lot of it goes with that inability to multitask. I think I see it in that... <laughs> if I could describe, like, when we're when we're conversing or whatever, I don't feel like he hears me. I don't feel like when he has a conversation with my kids that he actually hears them. I think he's, like, processing or thinking about what he's going to say next, but that is something that's really apparent to me that I just feel like, <laughs> where are you? What is, where is your head space right now? Cause you're not here with me or with my kid. You know, I can, I can witness that. I want to talk to you about changes in friendships. We already talked about Carlene Davidson. Right. Um, do you know someone named Robin Dale? I do. Was there a change in that friendship? If so, tell us what it was. Yeah. That turned out to be pretty bad um, to the point where, and, and they had traveled together. I think they went to Costa Rica, maybe. After the, after the crash, right? After the crash, they would have gone. They would have traveled. Um, what happened to uh, Robin Yeah, I... I was at the public library one day and I got a phone call from Robin and about what month of what year give or take gosh I wish I'd brought my phone or had it following court rules I think uh, 2017 if I had to guess um, she said I sustained well I'm not offered for the truth of what happened but just for the how the how this affected his, his friendship and just, just, I, don't know. I don't know how you can separate it. Um, <clears throat> you're offering up for what purpose? I, I want to show how the friendship changed. Okay, I'll, offer, I'll allow it for that limited purpose. Go ahead. So she called and she had said, I need you to reach out to your dad. Um, I... I, I'm not feeling safe right now, and I'm going to have her young son, you know, we're gonna move back into my place. And I said, what, what do you mean you don't feel safe, you know? And um, she had said, I, I've asked your dad several times not to attend my yoga class, and he has shown up. And I'm thinking, seriously? Like you asked him and he showed up again? Um, I, at some point I had texted her back and just said, I, I thank you for trusting me and I will reach up to my dad, I'll have my sisters and we'll offer some support. I, um, this is strange for me. I don't know my dad to be unsafe, right? But I also wanted to believe her because I think it's important that we try to believe people, but her experience said that you know he had changed that she didn't feel safe and i said get yourself to a safe place then and i'll follow with my dad i then did call my dad and said please don't do that he said i'm not gonna hurt her there's nothing you know i said she has asked you and you need to respect that boundary that's important that you if she doesn't feel good that you respect that um, that, ended the relationship, essentially. that was it, yes. Okay. What about, uh, so let me just 
I indicated at the beginning of the trial that if there was any evidence received for limited purpose that I would give an instruction to the sure. jury. Sure. So members of the jury, some evidence is received for a limited purpose only. When I instruct you that an item of evidence has been received for a limited purpose, you must consider it only for that limited purpose. In this case, this evidence was not offered as to the truth of what, is it Robin? Robin Dale. It, what, what Robin Dale said, said to the witness, but rather as to this witness's understanding of the relationship change. That's correct. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Uh, do you know Mark Harris? I do. So that would be my brother-in-law's brother. Your brother-in-law's brother. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, so your Shay is married to a Harris. Right? Correct. And that Harris has a brother named Mark. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did that relationship yes. change, if you know? I know they spent a lot of time before the accident together, and I don't believe they spend as much time. Do you know why it changed? I do not. Okay. What about someone named Sakia, S-A-K-I-E from Holland? Mm -hmm. Are you aware of that person? Yeah, again, uh, she had come over from the Netherlands, and um, that relationship didn't work out, um, and she left. You've mentioned a few things about this, but uh, other than what you've already said, I don't want you to repeat what you've already said, but what about anger and his ability to control anger? Did that change? Yeah, I, I think the frustration, the temper, um, yeah, very much so. I um, have a memory, my younger sister, Jenny, and I, uh, decided it was time to help clean out my grandparents' house. Um, they had both passed away, and, and when they had passed away, um, you know, I had a new baby, my sister had a new job. It just didn't feel like a great time to actually clean out and sell the house, and so I could tell that that was really weighing on my dad's mind. Like, I need to go take care of that house, and so my younger sister and I... If you go on, just give us an approximate year and month if you can yeah summer of 2019 okay thank you Continue. yeah so we were working hard they were depression era <laughs> parents so they didn't just have you know two pie plates they had 16 pie plates and we had a lot to clean out we were getting up early and going to bed late we had sold most of their furniture so we were on like camp pads and bedrooms we were kind of camping out as we were uh, painting and cleaning and, and getting ready to put, put my grandparents' house on the market. And so pretty late in the evening, I had gone uh, to, to meditate in one of the back, back bedrooms. And yeah, just take a, take a break. And I um, stepped into one of the back bedrooms. And I heard, uh, heard my dad's voice elevate. And it didn't sound good. And I thought, angry voice or yeah, angry? he was mad. And I thought, what's going on? I um, sat for a minute to see if anything changed. And I went into the kitchen. And my dad was in my younger sister's face. He was like two inches from her face. And he is so mad. He's so angry. Um, and I. I don't know what the conversation or the disagreement was about, but he was saying, fuck you. He just kept repeating that over and over again. And my younger sister... Any, anything like that in your life? No. Any relationship like that with your dad? No, I've never felt scared of my dad. I don't think I ever received um, a spanking from my dad. I have I mean, I think he's been upset, but I have never seen... I was terrified. And I just said, no, You're like this has, this has to stop, right? And it was just like, he was in shock of what he was doing too. And um, my sister didn't respond. Um, it, was, it was terrible, it was terrible. And we had been there working so hard and that was not anything that my sister deserved. What about uh, any changes in feeling overwhelmed and confused? That's that's a big part of where he's at right now, right? That's just, I, I, he is just 
befuddled and yeah. How about preoccupation with details? Mm -hmm. We talked about that a little bit. I think that's where he's stuck. He can't really see the big picture. So overwhelmed and confused you think is one of the big things that is plaguing him now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think I'm about done here. Let me just well, okay. Just in conclusion, uh, based on what you've seen since the ski crash, uh, what do you see on the horizon for him? Tell the truth. Yeah. I think, I hope that he moves on. I hope that we're able to put this very strange chapter behind us. I think um, we don't always choose the doors that we walk through, but we can choose like how, how we walk through them. And so I think we have a lot of healing to do and just that, that rehab so that he doesn't feel, that he feels empowered to live, to live a good life to the end. I have one moment, Judge. Council table, thanks. No further questions, Judge. Um, it's been one hour. Yeah. Uh, they can go to cross. Thank you. So, members of the jury, um, are, we, are we good to go 10 or 15 more minutes and then take our lunch break then? Okay, thank you. Let's do that. Mr. Owens. But there is a tissue box here. This is hard. This is a hard position you're in. Do you agree? This is not a happy thing that you're having to do. Correct. Uh, and let me just, uh, I think my nephew, who was once worked with me, took your deposition before. Do you recall that? Yeah, Wayne Owens. And we'll talk about that uh, after lunch. Um, the. He also took the depositions of your two sisters. Have you ever re reviewed their transcripts, like actually read them? No. How about summaries of them? Um, uh, more of an oral, like, you know, maybe my sister Shay would say, I did ask this. And then we've been, this is our third day. I'm just wondering, did, have you watched any of the proceedings the prior two days? No. One thing that uh, there was a fellow yesterday named, named Sam Goldstein, who's a neuropsychologist. Mm -hmm. he, he said your dad is obsessed. He's uh, sort of with this. Do you agree? Oh, yes. I think at some point I had sent my dad a message that said, you know, go for a walk. Um, please, please, don't, please don't let this consume you because I'm very aware that it has been consuming for him. And in some, in some sense, the resolution of this trial, whether it's for or against him, will be a good thing for him. Do you agree? Bring some closure for him? For everyone. And him. Hmm. Yes? Yes. Oh, sorry. There's an audio, and so we always have to get your, your uh, answer on the, on the record. Thank you. Uh, Jenny is your little sister, right? Correct. Is, is she the one that your dad said F you to? Correct. Let me back up one more second. The whole lawsuit stems uh, from, uh, you understand that my client says that your dad plowed into her back. Do you understand at least that allegation? 
I'm, I'm hearing that now. And uh, you, don't, you don't personally know whether your dad did that or not, correct? You weren't present? I was not skiing with him that day, no. And when your dad talked to you about bringing the lawsuit, you, you had no opinion on it? Like, I'm, it's, your, it's your thing. Is that fair? I wanted to honor his journey. I think that's a big part that we have autonomy. And so I would support my dad, yeah. whichever direction. Sure, but you didn't say, I think it's a good idea, dad, that you bring the lawsuit. Or I most definitely did not yeah. advise him one way or another. Yeah. I think in hindsight now, I would say it's Actually, hard. Actually, I have no pending. Oh, it's, it's hard. Okay. It will be hard, right? I knew dad. <clears throat> I want you to see if you kind of preface some of the things I'm going to ask you. So when I hear you say before, you know, he's generally a healthy guy, before very good personality, before very active, good mental health, do you understand that to compare uh, what the ski accident did versus old age versus chronic health conditions and everything, I need to know kind of how your dad was on health, personality, mental health, activity level, and those things just before the event. Mm -hmm. You with me? Sure. So a lot of, uh, when I say, for instance, he never saw how, he never seemed angry. He never got that angry with me. Didn't you say that? Like, for instance, his, his anger toward uh, That was a Jenny. new experience for yeah. me. But it wasn't for Jenny, was it? Je Jenny reported like 10 years of that kind of abuse uh, in the last 10 years of your parents' marriage. True? I can't speak to Jenny's experience. Did Jenny, do you know Did that? I witness that towards did, Jenny? I never witnessed that did, towards Jenny. Did Jenny ever tell you, like, your dad used to verbally abuse her and your mom for 10 years? Jenny and I have a very yes. close relationship. Just a yes or no, please. Your Honor, I, object, uh, I need a yes or no. I object, Your Honor. More of a question. There's no foundation. And it's also hearsay. Your Honor, I need to be able to ask these questions. Sustained. OK. As to hearsay. Do you agree that you paint quite a different picture of your dad before than Jenny does? So my sister Jenny yes or no, has please. mental yes, no, no, disability. I, I just have Objection. yes or no questions. Objection. There's no foundation for this. Okay, let me, let me just give you a little instruction about uh, that I've already said in open court so everybody else is going to hear this for the second time. But um, when you're being cross-examined, it's not like a normal conversation. So the lawyer is entitled to ask you questions that limit your answer to yes or no or I can't answer that yes or no. So those are basically your three choices. If he gives you that kind of a, sometimes he'll ask an open-ended question, but if he's asking the yes or no question, he's entitled to that answer. And then later, Mr. Sykes will be able to clarify if necessary. Okay. Sure. Maybe another way to phrase this right, too. I don't have a pending question. Well, you did. It, it's withdrawn. Go ahead and ask a question, Thanks. Mr. Owens. Yesterday, the jury heard uh, through uh, your dad's mental health providers uh, that uh, I'm going to try to read this so I'm not winging it your dad uh, was controlling highly controlling of her long before the ski accident have you ever heard that from Jenny? Your Honor, I, I object to the form of the question that restates the evidence. Overruled, the jury will remember what the evidence was. Yes or no? Can you repeat? Yes, has Jenny ever, are you close to your sister Jenny? Very. Right. You're close to your sister Shay? Yes. All right, and always have been? Yes. Okay. Jenny, didn't talk to your dad for 13 years after getting out of the house after high school. Is that true? I'm sure there's no foundation for that. No. She can, it's not true? No, 
13 years. Just a minute, there, there's an objection. Uh, what, will you approach the bench, please? So the objection is overruled. Overruled. Your Honor, may I have a, I have a continuing objection for the record on this line of question? You may. Thank you. I'm going to tell you things that Jenny has told us under oath, and I want you to comment on them, OK? Uh, is it true that Jenny moved out of her parents' household uh, after high school? Correct. All right. and. How much older are you than Jenny? I'm six years older. And how many years had you moved out of the house before uh, Jenny moved out of the house? So I moved out at 18, so she would have been 12. So she had six years at home without me. Okay, and you weren't, you, uh, and would you describe your parents' marriage as a good marriage when you left six years before their uh, they were in the middle of a divorce and not an amiable one. And uh, his, his second divorce wasn't amicable either, was it? Objection, no foundation. She, Overruled. She can always say, I don't know the answer. So when he says foundation, if you don't know the answer, rather than hear this objection all the time, you can just say, I don't know. I don't know. One judge in the courtroom, and it's not Judge Owens. So I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't try to explain to the witness what things mean. That's uh, I am not a judge. I think certain. I think each questioner can give some ground rules to the to the witness, and I think it was appropriate. So. Was the second mar marriage amicable? I don't know. Don't you really? You have no idea if your your dad's second marriage uh, parted peacefully or not peacefully. I don't know. Well, what's your impression? Like, what do you know? Like, it was a, the divorce went smoothly or it didn't go smoothly? Um, I know that they're friends today. Okay, so your answer? It seems like they've been able to um, continue a friendship anyway. The jury heard evidence yesterday by Mr. S uh, Goldstein, Dr. Goldstein, uh, that these um, words described your dad, uh, described your father before the ski accident, and I want you to tell me just if you observed this, he was controlling. No. He relentlessly tried to mold people. All people, specific people. Jenny. I would say, as a, yes, he did try to mold Jenny. In a negative way? I think he would say he was trying to be a positive influence. You, I asked for your impression. Did you believe it was, that's a positive thing? Uh, 
I have no opinion on that. Jenny has a pretty strong opinion on that, doesn't she? She does. That it was in an awful, unhealthy way. Is that her opinion? Are those words she used in her deposition? Just ask. Oh, go ahead. I, I'm not, I've been told not to read the deposition, so I'm just asking you to comment. Was it an, Jenny believes it was an awful, unhealthy way. Do you agree? No. You think uh, Jenny would say, by the way, let me ask about Jenny for a minute. Yeah. Uh, have you talked to Jenny about this trial? She knew I was coming. Mm -hmm. Jenny committed in writing to attend this trial, and then... I object, no, this is totally Let me finish my question, and then pulled out. That's irrelevant. Thank you. The jury should disregard the question. Do you know if Jenny's planning to attend this trial? To answer that. Oh, she is not planning on attending. Do you know that there was a point in time when she uh, committed Objection to attend this trial? Overruled. Are you I, I was not aware. Or that she was planning to attend the trial? Questions have been asked and answered, so there's not relevance to any more questions along this line. Did you or uh, anyone you know attempt to dissuade her from attending this trial? No, she felt like it would be a financial hardship. I said I would be happy to pay for her airplane ticket if she wanted to come. I did too. Do you know that? that? That's totally irrelevant. I think the witness opened it up, so. Do you know that I did? I offered to pay too? No, I did not know. So did you weigh in on that, Jenny? I don't think it's good for you to attend the trial? No, not at all. I Again, I honor people's journey, and so that's entirely up to her. Do you lunch yet? Two minutes. Okay, go ahead. Do you believe with this statement, with Jenny, your dad was constantly overstepping her boundaries? No foundation. Overruled. There's a standing objection on standing that. Standing objection. Yes or no? Again, repeat. He was constantly overstepping the boundaries she set. Agree or disagree? Agree. He would be frequently up frustrated if his expectations were not met. Agree. He had a very strong emphasis on discipline. With Jenny? Sure. Agree. He had very high demands and would be very frustrated if his expectations were not met. Disagree. Okay. And we're, to be clear, we're all talking about pre-ski collision, true? Correct. All right. That he was domineering to Jenny and your mother. Disagree. Okay. I'm going to split those because that was a compound question, we call it. So as to Jenny, was he domineering and emotionally and verbally abusive to her prior to the ski collision. Disagree. So she made that up. She's testified under oath. She made that up. It's her experience. So I want you're asking truth. my opinion and I think you have her experience. Is I she lying? I mean, he, are you saying there's only just, there's just, one just truth? Yeah, just a second. On no. certain facts, there counsel uh, have sure. an objection. What's yeah. the what's the objection? Yeah, Your Honor, I don't think he can ask if someone else is lying. He doesn't know that. It's an improper question. This is her sister, Your Honor, Your Honor who's she's very what close. The facts to. He can ask what the facts are. You know, and the jury can make up its own mind, but he shouldn't be concluding for someone that's not here whether she's telling the truth or not. It's improper. I mean, under certain circumstances, a witness, a lay witness can offer an opinion. I don't think I've heard enough foundation for that opinion, so sustained. Thank you. So if Jenny says that your father was domineering, uh, do you agree or disagree prior to the ski accident? Disagree. And uh, if she so testifies, and we're going to read part of her transcript into the record, if she so testifies, uh, that is not true. He was not domineering. Is that what you're saying? 
I'm saying he was not domineering. So if Jenny says he was... That is her testimony. And and you would disbelieve it? My testimony would say he he was not domineering. Would you disbelieve? Her testimony is that he was. Right. So they can both be true? Uh, Objection argumentative. Overruled. So depending on people's mental capabilities and disabilities, sometimes we experience events differently. Is it possible that, uh, for instance, your dad wasn't domineering with you, but he was with Jenny? I think, I think it is possible. I sure. wasn't home. Sure. I was in college uh, for many of those years. Your, your dad was uh, verbally abusive to Jenny before the ski accident. Agree or disagree? Disagree. Your dad was emotionally and verbally abusive to your mother before the ski accident. Agree or disagree? I think he could have done better, but I wouldn't call it uh, domineering and abusive, no. Have you known your dad to go up and, uh, are you aware that he went up and just punched a guy once? I was not aware of that. You've never heard that your dad punched uh, your mother, your mother's, uh, you've never heard that? No, sir. That your dad believed your mother was having an affair and went and punched the guy out? You don't know this? I don't know that. Okay. It's probably a good time to break. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, we'll break now, or we'll recess now for lunch, returning at 1.30. All right, so we're recessed until 1.30. Is there any need for the court to come back sooner? Uh, five minutes sooner. On the, these character type questions, I want to kind of pre- preview some things because rather than get objections every three questions. So uh, I do. Right, let's, let's come 15 minutes early then. So uh, 115. 115. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Council, could you approach just for a second? All right, we can go on now. Okay, let the record reflect that uh, council are present, and I think Mr. Owens wanted to address the topics of uh, the, the cross-examination that needed to be cleared with the court first. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm mindful of the court's order, which I have right in front of me, memorandum decision on motions in limine dated March 8, 2023, specifically pages 3 and 4, about um, probing plaintiff's credibility. To remind us all, it says, on this topic, the court rules that because of the admissibility of character evidence, which may be probative of truthfulness or untruthfulness, can be fraught with evidentiary issues and examination that potentially falls under Rule 608 should first be addressed with and sanctioned by the court outside the presence, secured outside the presence of the jury. Okay, you with me on all that? Yes. I'm sure you are. There was testimony by Dr. Goldstein yesterday that the patient is not destimulating, uh, or there was no destimulation, I think it's spelled maybe D-I-S, meaning the patient is not creating or enhancing symptomology for gain. There was also conversations that Mr. Sanderson had a good relationship with his daughters. There are various facts, some of which were already addressed, and I, I'm trying to avoid repeated bench uh, conferences during the trial, uh, during especially this next witness. <clears throat> and I want to be careful and comply with the court's orders. All right, so there are a hundred facts, Your Honor, that I think go to this issue of whether he is enhancing his symptomology for gain. Plaintiff's daughter, his own daughter, Jenny, says essentially his character is such that he will be dishonest and lie for gain. It's, it's not quite those words, but it's essentially those words that be, to become famous, essentially, he will lie. I'm putting it out there. How does that have to do with the cross-examination that's about to occur? Because I want to ask her if that's a true statement. And, and what, uh, what did she testify to on direct examination that that's in response to? You know, I didn't personally take those depositions. No, what did this yes. witness testify to here in open court that would, that would, I guess, uh, provide the relevance well, to that, to that cross-examination? I've only had five minutes and we haven't hit those questions yet. Well, I, I realize that, but I'm wondering. So what I envision doing is saying, um, is this a true statement? And what? From her like sister? from her sister. And what did she say on direct that, that opened that up, I guess, is what I'm saying? Yes. Like, I'm, for example, I did just, tweet let, my... Let me, explain, let me explain my thinking. So... Thank you. The questions that you've already asked, I mean, she, she, this witness painted a fairly broad picture of her father's um, personality, uh, 
his his issue, you know, his lack of issues or issues both before and after the, the accident. And so I think it's fair game for cross examination to address those topics. So, thank you. Like like you were. I think I better understand your question. So in other words, you you said uh, you said well, isn't it? Or are you aware that your sister? Uh, felt differently yeah. about this issue or that issue and are you aware that your sister felt as though she was treated this way by her father I think those are fair areas of cross-examination for this witness because of the fact that she offered testimony on those topics so I guess so my next question and as long as it doesn't as, as the uh, motion in limine order indicates as long as it doesn't I guess tip the tip the scale on 403 where, where its probative value starts decreasing because you covered the same area over and over again or it's incredibly inflammatory and would be too prejudicial to to read or to ask that question in front of the jury all right so I can I address that this is within the scope of cross-examination yes thank you I think that's sort of what you're asking Great. Um, your honor all day yesterday were these neuroradiologists and neuropsychologists talking about every single aspect of um, Mr. Uh, Sanderson. Um, for instance, well this issue, I mean literally an opinion by Goldstein that he's not faking for gain. All right, so um, I think it would be very unfair to my client to not address that issue with every single witness now that comes up. I mean, it's, it's their plaintiff's position that he is not faking for gain. It's the defendant's position he is faking for gain. So uh, I don't think I should be limited for her to just hit 20 points when I have uh, a $3 million case to defend for my client on every aspect of his brain. Darlene, is that her name? Carlene, thank you, said this accident took the, the joy of life out of him. Goldstein, essentially the testimony is this utterly changed his life. And I think it would be wrong for us, be unfair to my client. And, and just general the system of justice for me to be restricted tightly to uh, okay only <clears throat> I can only ask her <clears throat> about how how he couldn't tie a knot I mean I need to be way broader than that when we're dealing with a, a, a claimed severe permanent brain injury that's taken the joy of his life out okay. thank you I think I understand the argument let me hear from the plaintiff Mr. Sykes, what's your position on this line of questioning as it was just outlined? What do you mean with? <clears throat> My response is that that's why you have the rules of evidence and that's why we had motions in limine to you know, troubleshoot these types of issues and get preliminary rulings uh, or you know, the, uh, I mean, you can't just attack someone's character for the sake of it because your client, his client's worried about the ca how the case is going for him. That doesn't give him a right to attack someone's character based upon someone who's not going to testify, maybe read the deposition, who has incredible mental health problems. And it's just not, it's not right to let him go beyond the scope. He can put his own case on when he wants to, you know. But asking a witness, I mean, uh, she's, I think, 40, Forty-five. Forty-nine. Forty-nine. has been out of the house nearly 30 years, you know. And uh, to try to ask, force her to ask questions about whether or not 
her sister, who hasn't testified as truthful, uh, runs an incredible risk of uh, prejudicing the jury for someone who's not going to testify. And so uh, I think, Your Honor, I'd like to just, you know, when in doubt, go to the rules. And, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, reputation or opinion evidence. A witness's credibility may be attacked or supported by testimony about the witness's reputation for having a character for truthfulness or untruthfulness. That hasn't come in. Uh, and the fact that a daughter that he didn't get along with thinks he might lie isn't reputation evidence. Uh, or by testimony in the form of an opinion about that character. Uh, uh, the evidence of truthful character is admissible only after the witness's character for truthfulness has been attacked. It hasn't been attacked. <coughs> um, B, specific instances of conduct, except for a criminal conviction. Uh, under Rule 609, extrinsic evidence is not admissible to prove instances of a witness's conduct in order to attack or support the witness's character for truthfulness. Okay? Not admissible. Uh, but the court may, on cross-examination, allow them to be inquire, inquired into if they're probative of the character for truthfulness or untruthfulness of the witness or another witness whose character uh, the witness being cross-examined has testified about. Uh, and so... What he's, where he's pegging it? I don't think so. This witness hasn't even testified. We're talking about Terry Sanderson. He hasn't We're testified. talking about Jenny. I know. <coughs> uh, and you know. So the topics of her, the, the, it, I mean, the topics of her direct examination will, will uh, create the mm -hmm. contours of what the cross-examination might be. Except for a criminal conviction under 609, extrinsic evidence is not admissible to prove specific instances of a witness's conduct in order to attack or support the witness's character for truthfulness. Okay? Is, is there period. something, Mr. Bueller, that... Oh, just uh, the witness is Polly. Polly, sorry. Thank you. But, I mean, they're, they're trying to attack Terry with specific instances. Can't be done. And <clears throat> beyond that, Your Honor, I think it's just unfair to choose up time. We're going to be late now in a minute or two. Uh, he can put his case on. If he lays a proper foundation, he can perhaps read Jenny's deposition for what it, for what it takes. You know, they served her with an illegal subpoena in Idaho, and she thought it came from us. Now, I don't know if there was misrepresentation we've or already, We've already addressed this yeah. issue. But I mean, but I mean that's well, you, how... You don't need to rehash it. Okay, all right. But, but I'm just saying that, that uh, she's not going to testify. They have a deposition, and the court rules provide that they can read that under some circumstances. So, uh, you know, let them do that, but why harass this witness trying to get her to indirectly condemn her father by either agreeing or disagreeing with something that she didn't witness? It's just, it just makes no sense. So I urge you to deny his request. Okay, thank, thank you. Now, there's a smarter than I am here, Kristen Van Orman. Good. Well, I think I'm just going to hear from one lawyer on the plaintiff side. Anything else, Mr. One Owens? Final statement. Thanks. You know, um, plaintiffs did ask about personality traits on direct, and, and that his personality has changed. Um, and did, did was there any direct examination about truthfulness, though, and honesty? I don't. Re I don't have notes of that. Okay. So I can see you so get. I can see you questioning along the same lines as of what you just did. I think that's fair. And I did adjust my questioning to the court's concern. But like, but getting involved in, um, you know, an underlying motivation for the for the lawsuit and for pursuing the lawsuit. I didn't hear any direct direct to, examination on that topic. There certainly was yesterday, and I, I realize there was with another witness. 
And you can, you can certainly cross-examine or call those other witnesses and, and address that with them. But with this witness, I think the, the, the cross is limited to the scope, at least in the plaintiff's case. I mean, you can recall her in your case later. And, they, and that may change what you can ask. But at least right now, the plaintiff is entitled to put their case on. So we did have a, an order. One of our orders is subpoena for one is subpoena for all. Right. So, so one of the questions I will ask at the end of this witness's testimony today is, is this, test, is this witness now released? Would she, would she prefer that? Um, frankly, I'm thinking of the witness. I know, but right now the objection is beyond the scope. Okay, so do, does everyone agree that I can re, that this witness will be, made, will be available next week? I don't. Well, she's subpoenaed. I can remind her of that fact that when she finishes her testimony. She's not released. Is she subpoenaed, Mr. Sykes? Uh, we didn't subpoena her. Are we? Uh, Find it right we, here. We emailed uh, the plaintiff's lawyer. Uh, we intend to call the three wit the three daughters. Will you accept service? And I remember the answer being, but I could be corrected. We will accept service for these two daughters and not for this third. Okay. I don't uh, now, I like to see that, Judge. I don't, I mean, there's uh, we do. four of us working on this. I don't have I, a recollection of that. I, I'm not calling my good friend Mr. Owens a liar. No, but because I don't I, remember that. I, show it to me, please. Okay. So, by the way, if you can't tell, I'm not speaking... I didn't expect this issue to arise, so uh, I do recall specifically, and Lawrence was the one who emailed, we are not representing Jenny. Uh, you have to subpoena her directly. And this may take a minute, Your Honor. personality traits. I mean, these broad criticisms by their expert based on the fact witnesses without being able to talk to the fact witnesses about the basis for it. I, I don't know how to do that okay. other than in this manner. Well, all I'm saying is that um, we need to call the jury in. You can, be, you can do your cross-examination, but if they're, uh, as to the objection to limiting it to the scope of the direct, that would be sustained. Okay. And we can, uh, you can call the witness she, later. The witness will agree to appear next week. I don't know if she will, and even if she does, is that is that uh, something that you can rely on? How do we get subpoena for one and subpoena for all? What does that mean? That's the court's order. That to me that it means, means it, it means if if a witness has been subpoenaed, then they remain on that subpoena until the court releases that subpoena. If the witness hasn't been subpoenaed, then they simply haven't been subpoenaed, and I have no control over that. Lawrence, will you agree that you accepted uh, service of the subpoena for these two daughters? No, that's not true. Do you have a copy of the subpoena? Uh, Those, the three daughters are here in Washington State. Oh, okay. Three states. Do you have a copy of the subpoena? Give it to her now. It's pretty simple. Have the plaintiff has the plaintiff subpoenaed Polly? I don't believe so. So I can't rely on a, an email from Bob Sykes saying we are intending to call Polly and Shay. That's our witness list. It's not a subpoena. This is an email, January 24, 2023. And then uh, in response to a question, will you accept service of their subpoenas? I mean. And what's the response? I'm waiting. They've, they've got the email. We are intending to call Polly and Shay. That's it. Okay. So it doesn't sound like the witness is under subpoena. You can certainly ask her if she is. Yeah. If I mean, they say they don't think so. Now, that's not a no. 
That's more technical than I usually get with plaintiff's counsel. I mean, we're calling her, and subpoena one for one is subpoena for all. So are we ready for the jury? Sure. Sure. Ready for the jury? Yes, sir. Okay.
Thank you. Let the record reflect the jury's back in the room and parties and counsel are present. Mr. Owens? I need to apologize. I was being an ass earlier. You, you are, uh, it was wrong for me to triangulate you, your dad, and your sister, and your mom. Um, and I ask for your forgiveness. Uh, you love your dad, fair? True. You love your mom? True. You love your sister, both sisters? Absolutely. Your dad was a texter, is that true? Even pre, pre-injury? Yes. Yeah. And a poster, like Facebook? Yeah, he's always been very tech savvy. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to address uh, Defense Exhibit 111, page two. I think you have your binder. No objection. No objection. Okay. Defense Exhibit 1, what is it? 111, page 2. 111, page 2 is received. And could you, uh, could you bring that up? And Peter, could you know that yeah, we... Yeah, just goes to that page, not the whole exhibit. True. Page 2. Page All right. Oh, we do have a defense binder for the witness. Now, it's not going to be in there unless you countermark it. Do we have the defense bi uh, witness binder? And while we're doing that, could you step down and take a look at this? And James, could you bring this up big? So that we can actually read uh, the bottom of this. Do you recognize this by chance? It looks vaguely familiar. Her smile stands out to me. So do you recall that your dad, after being brought down on the toboggan, t texted out a picture of uh, the toboggan person? Does this ring any bells? Yes? I think, it's, I think it's likely. I think he was grateful for her service. Okay. You nodded yes, but I, yeah. to get it audibly. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to read this. Whitney kept me entertained while probing me with questions to evaluate my senses. A dedicated outdoor person and horse lover from Michigan. She also took me down in the toboggan by herself and won the DV, Deer Valley, I assume, Women's Downhill Race Contest, a sweetheart, exclamation point. Okay, you can you can sit down. That's okay. And can we go back down? <coughs> and I'm just gonna hand you this. May I approach? Yes. If, if you want to read it again, you can. <coughs> okay. So, do you recall uh, seeing this? Like I said, it seems familiar like her her smile stands out as maybe something I've seen before um, and uh, what's included down below sounds like my dad's eternal optimism and positivity yeah. pretty op uh, pretty articulate would you say just uh, within an hour of his accident he's an articulate human and uh, quite praising and the the toboggan person is smiley right true yeah I think he was grateful okay now let's go to uh, defense 102 so in that binder uh, they're individually numbered may I approach you may. I'll help you So you look at these little stickers, and that's how you get the number. All right, and let's do the bottom half if we can. Okay, and it's 
you can look at it there if you wish, or you can look at the one right in front of you. All right, which one are you there, Polly? It looks like P. I won't put this on the record so that, uh, is that your email though? That is my email. All right, and is that your sister's Jenny and Shay's emails? Correct. All right, do you recall getting this email on the evening of the in incident? I do. And uh, it's genuine, it's real, your dad created this? I believe so. And uh, I th think, uh, you help me. Did you get a call from your dad on this day about the incident before this email? If, if the incident was about right before lunch, and this is 8 p.m. on February 26, 2016, remind me, did you get a call before then or was this your first notice? I don't recall precisely. In my memory, I think I received a phone call first and then received an email. From your Oh, yes, you testified, and you weren't sure whether it was uh, from your dad or from... Shay. Okay, Crane. gotcha. All right, so um, your dad said, here's what happened from my friend and eyewitness, and then something's attached. Uh, do you believe you clicked on this? I'm sure I did. Okay, and do you recall what it was? Um, there's been a lot of speculation trying to figure out what that was um, the fact that it's a meetup link it tells me probably something from so the day that he was skiing he had gone with a meetup group let me interrupt because all I'm asking is do you recall what it was if you clicked on this I do not recall precisely okay and he said I think I wasn't able to access information Well, that's a different comment. That's, uh, you, you think you clicked on it and nothing came up? Correct, that's what I think. Did you say that in your deposition anywhere? I don't believe I was. Uh, improper use of a deposition. Uh, Overruled. We asked you about 100 questions about this email. Do you remember? <laughs> I, I've been asked about this email a lot. Right. I, I don't recall what, what it was. It almost felt like, in my memory, potentially a dead end. So listen to my question, though. Yes. We asked you 100 questions about this in your email, in right. your deposition. You were under oath, correct? Yes. You understood that? Yes. And the court reporter was taking down every word? Yes. And then you had an opportunity to review your transcript for accuracy? I wasn't aware that I could, but yes, I did review it. And and did you make a correction? Like, actually, I tried to click on it, and nothing came up. Did you ever do that? It's just a vague recollection. No, I do not believe. Yeah. So, okay, you're, the opportunity to make a correction, uh, if... if what you said in your deposition. The reason is, the reason we take depositions, you understand, is so years later people don't come up with new memories. Do you understand that? Sure. Okay. I and, do not and, recall what this link was. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the top half. Do you recall responding to this link in any way? I don't believe I responded to the email. James, I apologize. I have one more question on the bottom half. Your dad wrote, I'm famous. Uh, do you know why he said that? I think it matches his personality, a little bit of making light of a serious situation. All right. Uh, in his deposition, he said, I thought it was cool that I had had a collision with a celebrity. Uh, do you have any reason to dispute that? I object. There's, this is improper use of deposition again. Over, overruled. Go ahead. I have not read his deposition. I have. Uh, my question was: Do you have any reason to dispute your dad's statement that he thought it was cool that he had had an accident with a celebrity? Your Honor, I, I think if she's going to do this, she should show him the deposition because there's more to it than that. Yeah, it's hard out of context. Yeah, just a so, second. When there's when there's the, an objection, the, I need to. Rule the objection on it. was overruled. This there was a second objection. This um, this was just. Do you, do you have any reason to I, dispute that? I need to rule that? on the second objection, right. which, so, which is overruled. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Sorry. 
All right. Do you have any reason to dispute your dad's statement that he thought it was cool that he'd been in an accident with a celebrity? I do not think it was cool. I cannot dispute whether or not my father thought it was cool. Perfect. Okay. Now, nowhere on this does it say, I'm hurt. True? Correct. And uh, this link is important, would you agree, to know what was going on within hours of the accident? Yes. And we've asked for this link. Do you know where it is? I do not. Or what was posted? Do you, have you ever seen it? I, I can't answer yes or no. I'm sure I, I clicked the link. That would have been the logical thing. And do you remember what it was? No. OK. Now we can go to the top half. Your sister, Shay, has responded. This was her genuine response. Uh, do you see it's about an hour and a half later, 9.32 on the date of the event? Do you see that? Yes. All right. Dad, I, can't be I cannot believe how unlucky and how crazy this all is. I also can't believe this is all on GoPro. What are the chances? I'm so glad you're OK. How are you feeling this evening? All right. Uh, I cannot believe how unlucky and how, un and how crazy this all is. Do you remember receiving Shay's reply? Yes. And actually, as I look at that, that, that was not a tri trick question. But I, I can see you are actually not on this reply. Do you see uh, your, your name isn't copied to all? I, I, maybe I've read that somewhere then because it yeah. looks familiar to me. And I just realized it just now. OK. Um, by the way, your sister just weeks earlier had injured herself skiing. Is that true? Correct. Like three weeks earlier, she blew out her knee. Tore an ACL and an MCL. Those are knee issues, right? Correct. All right. What are the chances? Is that referencing that, like the fact they have both gotten into ski collisions, or do you know? I take it that way. Okay. I think it was like, it's February. We're both hurt. And we're both unlucky? Possibly. OK. I'm so glad you're OK. All right, Shay hasn't testified yet. Uh, but was it your understanding that on the evening of the accident, your dad was OK? I think she meant that, you know, he came out of it. I, I think it's her way of saying. So let me ask you this question, because it's pointed toward you. OK. Was it your understanding the evening of the accident that your dad was OK? Yeah, that not fatal. He, he was going to be mendable. Maybe okay. some rehab. Well, that's a lot to say. Basically, are you OK, Dad? Did you ask him that that day on the phone? I, I'm sure I said, I'm glad you're down from the mountain. I'm glad you're here with us. I'm glad you're OK. You yeah. believe you talked to him, right? I believe I did. Yeah, and isn't That's what it feels like. But And your first question is, are you OK? All right, isn't that? How, how are you doing, right? Yes. If somebody, I think for anyone that had gone through a big accident, it's that checking in with them. And, and uh, fair to say, you don't recall him saying anything other than he, he was OK? I think, as I mentioned, he said, I'm hurting. I have some broken ribs. So you actually do remember the response? But this is my recollection. Maybe it's my sister saying, we think he's OK. He's got some broken ribs. Now, the I'm famous, that that refers to my client, right? He's famous because he collided with a celebrity, right? That's how I take that. So he knew who, who she was by 8 p.m. that night. Kind of looks that way. Yeah. And do you have any idea where this link went, the link of the most important piece of evidence that could be presented in trial today? It looks like it's somewhere out there in the cybersphere. Okay. 
Uh, do you agree that your dad liked to be in the spotlight? I agree. This was pre-collision, right? Yeah, he's big, big energy. Now, I'm thinking back when my mom was 76. Did you notice things, this is pre-collision, so let's just say in the year before that. Mom, Dad's starting to get older. Did you think to yourself about that? I never felt like my dad was getting older or that I had noticed something like that. So when he's 68 years old, never considered like He's starting to get older. I'm by numbers, yes. Um, and I have lots of people in my family that I've watched age. You know, my mother, my grandmother, my father and mother-in-law. I know what that's like, you know, my mom that can't remember the name of that author. Um, so, but when there's a marked change in somebody's cognition, memory and just functioning it's a it's more of a switch type feeling it didn't feel like it didn't feel gradual do you remember the fact that your dad had a stroke contributed first of all did your dad have a stroke before the ski incident i'm not aware of a stroke i know he had an occlusion uh with the lost some visibility in his eye i think it's like a restricted blood vessel. Do you recall in your deposition saying he had a stroke? I think you called it a stroke in the eye, meaning... Did you call it a stroke? If I did, I misspoke and I should have an opportunity to correct that. Well, you did have an opportunity. I was not aware of that. So, I'll, I'll dig it out if we have to. So let's keep going. Your dad uh, had an event where the oxygen in his eye, in his right eye, was uh, essentially turned off, and he lost his right eye. Is that fair? He lost some vision in his right eye, and you know what are the odds for somebody that spent a lifetime committed to right. eye health? Right. There's a reference to he, he's an optometrist, and he's not a medical physician. True. He's an optometric physician, an optometrist. So here's my question. Is he a medical physician, an, an MD? No. No. Okay, so uh, now let's go through. A few statements here. I'll tell you what, I, I think this will be the most efficient way couple weeks before the um, uh, ski collision, your dad went to a doctor, and he said he thinks all of a sudden, he's gotten old all of a sudden. Do you, did he ever express those sentiments to you? No. And it sounds like you never went to the doctor with him. Is that fair? I did take him to appointments. Um, I didn't sit in the room with his primary care provider and himself. Pre-collision? Did you take him to any doctor appointments? Mm, no, not that I can recall. Right. Okay, so, uh, and you said, like, your dad wouldn't have told me that. For instance, of his depression, he wouldn't have told me. And, and is that just a little, like, a sense of pride? I'm not going to share mental health information with my daughter? I think it's, it's more of his role as a parent I've been involved in mental health care, and so we talk openly about mental health challenges. I think he has a little bit of, you know, um, I'm the parent, and I don't want to worry you. I don't want to bother you. So what my question was, uh, was that a, like a sense of pride? I'm not going to share mental health inf my mental health information with my daughter. Do you believe that or not? Mm, Mr. Owens, I don't know that I would choose the word pride. I think I would say he didn't want to burden me as his, as his daughter. All right. So there's possible that he was doing mental health 
th issues on the side without telling you. Fair? I have not reviewed his medical records, so that is fair. So, okay. By the way, how long had you been out of the house in the time of the ski collision? So, like, had you been married? At the ski collision? Yeah, when did you move out of the house? After high school or after? Or yeah, the, so I left in 1992. Okay, and we're in 16. 8 plus 16 is 24. You'd been out of it's the house not. 24 years? That's correct. Okay. And you would see your dad maybe, let's say, in the three months prior to the ski collision. Do you agree you didn't, you didn't call or see your dad once? Um, that was very surprising information to me after your team had pulled the phone records. Is that true? I, I have no reason to believe it's not true. Um, and you would see him, uh, did you see him about the same before the ski collision and after the ski collision, like two to four times a year? Was he it said it's been a little harder, especially with COVID. I don't feel like I've seen him as much. Um, gotcha. And part of it is, you know, I still had kids at home, so um, yeah. it was easier to say, oh, we're going to come through on summer vacation. And um, I'm with you. Yeah. Okay. By the way, COVID was hard. Did your dad get COVID like twice in six months? He did get COVID, I believe, more than once. In like not too far. Not like one month, but like six months or something. Does this sound right? It does sound correct. And that's extremely hard on him, just that. True? COVID was hard on all of us. Yeah. But in terms of some of the feelings of isolation, for instance, um, that that's exacerbated by COVID. Fair? Yeah. All right. In addition to your dad's eye problem on the right, do you agree that he also was severely impaired on the left eye? I would not agree with that. All right. Let me get rid of the word severely. Do you, do you recall him being impaired on the left eye prior to the ski collision? Prior? No, I am not aware of that. Uh, do you recall him ever walking into walls? No. When prior. You, correct. One of your sisters in, uh, mentioned that. Do, do you know anything about that? I have not experienced that, no. That he would ask people standing on the right side of him if they would move so he could see them. Did you observe that ever? Yeah, typically when we're walking, we would, um, yeah. OK. And just to be technical, so yeah doesn't work very yes. well on the record. So there we go, thanks. Sorry. Uh, do you agree one of the reasons he retired was the stroke event that had left him uh, deprived of oxygen in his vision? I do not agree with that. OK. If your dad so testified in his own deposition. Then uh, I would go with my dad's. I have not read his deposition. Thank you. Do you agree that he adjusted his skiing to the right side of the slope because of his, in the, because of his vision issues? I think that was typical. He would, um, yeah. So that's a yes. Yes. And he had to be picky about which days he skied. Like, if uh, if it was a snowy day uh, with limited visibility, he wouldn't go because of his vision. Do you agree or disagree? I don't know that. I think because he was retired, he would choose his ski days based on when it would feel the most, the best day to ski. So I'm just going to tweak my question a little bit. Did you know that he would adjust his skiing days based on visibility for that day? I did not know that. OK. Let's talk about the prostate cancer. Um, uh, do you know the severity? I guess they rate prostate cancers Gleason, six, seven, eight, or nine. Have you heard of this? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think ten. they were monitoring his numbers for a long time. And 10 out of 10 is the worst. Are you familiar with the Gleason scale for prostate cancer? I am not, okay. other than that there is a scale, so. And do you know if your dad was a seven, for instance, not the least, but not the most? 
I do not know. I've not reviewed my dad's medical records. And separate then from the Gleason scale or his records, just did you understand, like, this isn't just the most minimal cancer. It actually had become malignant. I knew they were monitoring his numbers, you know, so, uh, so that makes sense that when they decided to operate, it was because the number had justified that decision. Thank you. And I'm just going to restate my question. Were you aware his cancer had become malignant? Yes. Okay. And uh, do you recall how many years prior to the ski incident that cancer was? I really do not recall. I would say surgery, if I had to guess, 2008. One of the things they cut off was his, his testosterone. Do you mm -hmm. remember that? Yes. And uh, as a result, he became, uh, in the records, uh, he, quite emotional. I, I, do you agree? Objection or relevance. We're dealing with Over, his emotions. Overruled. Thank you. Do you recall him being becoming quite emotional? I did not experience that, more so after the accident. It much more notable. Um, Thanks. Let's stay pre-accident for Pre-accident, I never experienced the increase in emotion. All right. Do you, by the way, after the accident, how long was it until you went and visited your father? That's a great question. I think he was at my place end of May. I would imagine that summer at some point. Okay, so the ski collision was in end of February. Mm -hmm. And so are you saying like three months? He, he was at my house end of May, so I saw him again three months. Okay, that was the first time you saw him after Yeah. Typically, when we would come down, it would be like in July, so we would probably have seen him then. I can't review for certain. Do you recall there being a motion regarding the prostate? So I'm sort of prostate cancer, so I'm separating the testosterone issue. I mean, uh, that's a big deal, isn't it? Your it dad. is a big deal. I think he was scared. I think his um, his father had similar issues, so um, he had kind of re he had lived that experience. So he was concerned about it. How old, by the way, was your your dad's mom and dad when are they both deceased? They are. And at what ages do you know? Um, it's a good question. I think they passed away two thousand two, two thousand four. I would say maybe in their 80s. 70s? Perhaps 70s, yeah. And what did your dad's, your dad's dad pass away from? Was it prostate I think cancer? it was complications with prostate cancer. And your dad's mom, what did he, she pass away from? She had broken a hip and then ended up getting pneumonia. Let's talk about your, your dad's hearing for a minute. So your dad, uh, about how many years ago did he start wearing hearing aids? So my first memory of my dad with hearing aids, my younger sister was kind of an infant. And so, because I remember she would make noises and he kind of like, whoa, that's loud. So I think he... Like five years, 10 years, 20 years. Ago? Yeah. 40, 40 years ago. 40 years ago, he's yeah. been wearing hearing aids. Yeah. And uh, do you agree one side is worse than the other or do you know? I don't know that. I think technology's advanced Hearing aids today are much better than they were 40 years ago. And uh, as far as severity of his hearing loss just prior to the ski incident, um, uh, do you know? Can you quantify that at all? So there are times, say, in the morning when we're brewing coffee and he doesn't have his hearing aids in. Okay. Let's right? talk about when his hearing aids were in prior to the accident. Do you agree he still had some impairment? Minimal, but yes. He had to actually read lips. Do you agree? I think he's a people person, so he really does read lips and read people. So pre-ski incident, even with his hearing aids, he read lips. Do you agree? I, I think he, he does, not because he wasn't hearing, though. Do you agree that part of his hearing impairment, even with hearing aids, was he couldn't hear high voices, higher frequencies, like a woman's voice. Do you know that? 
I don't know that for certain, but I know that hearing loss happens in ranges, so that would make sense. Okay, so we've talked about his eyes, his ears, his cancer. Let's talk about his heart. Do you recall that prior to the ski accident, your dad had a, some heart palpitation issues? I was not aware of that. Okay. Did you see any effects of aging in your dad prior to the ski accident? Any at all? I think his hair was getting a little more gray. Okay. Anything else? Oh, he seemed really pretty on target. So perfect health prior to the ski collision? I wouldn't use the word perfect, but I think for someone who was 69, he, he really worked at being healthy, um, took his supplements, made sure he exercised. He's a swimmer. He just worked hard at it. He still swims, doesn't he? I believe so. He still goes to yoga. He sure tries. He's dedicated to his health. Post-skiing, he went, post-ski collision, he went on like 10 international trips. Does this sound right? I don't know if 10 is the number. He traveled quite a bit. I think he had a, I've retired, I'm supposed to do this kind of thing. And uh, did he ever do like international trial, travel pre-ski incident? Did he do some of those? Yeah. And did he ever go alone? Usually he traveled with a friend. No one goes to Europe alone, do they? I mean, it it's good to have good company. As part of the stroke workup, your dad had a lot of imaging done of his brain. Do you know anything about that? No, I do not. Do you know, for instance, if he was diagnosed with microvascular disease prior to the ski collision? I do not. How about moderate diffuse volume loss atrophy? I do not. All right. Do you know enough to talk about the fact that as we age, our brain's volume decreases? I'm aware of that. Do you recall that he was diagnosed with a plaque problem as a result of the retinal eye occlusion? I did not. Okay. Did you know he was, for instance, prior to the ski collision on an anti-cholesterol, anti-statin, mm -hmm. I should say statin, of some sort of cholesterol plaque reduction medication? I did not know it. Right. Wouldn't surprise me, though. And if he was on like seven to nine medications just prior to the ski incident, I take it you don't know what any of those are. I, I knew he took some medications along with his supplements. Like I said, he he listens to doctor's orders. He would take what was prescribed to him. Let's talk about supplements. Your dad loves supplements. Is that true? I would say, yeah. Like 40 a day, even before the ski collision. I he, don't know the number. Foundation. He, he so testified in his deposition. Uh, but that's, How would she know? I, I think she's about to answer that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just said I do not know the number of supplements he takes. But that... is it like a whole glass full every day? Objection Foundation. If you know. I have not watched my dad take his vitamins. What's your, what's, what do you know? Like how many supplements a day does he take? So we'll talk things. Like we were just talking about vitamin D and, and I had said I know it's better absorbed with vitamin K and he said he did take a vitamin D and I said, oh, you might want to look and see if there's K in it. How about number? I know he I'm takes looking. vitamin D. I don't know his, the number. <laughs> Would it surprise you that he said 40? Objection foundation. Overruled. Go ahead. I, it would surprise me a little bit, yeah. I know he takes supplements. You didn't, uh, how about therapy pre, so mental health therapy mm -hmm. pre-collision? Mm -hmm. uh, were you aware your dad had undergone counseling for anger and other problems? Uh, I was not aware that he saw a counselor for anger issues. I do know that he has seen a counselor for mental health. So pre-collision. He's easy to anger. Do you recall that? VA 1131, 
Defense 113C. He's easy to anger. That's why he's going to see a therapist. Does this ring a bell prior do, to the collision? Do I recall that? I have not read his medical records. Angry, discussing family conflict. Do you recall this? Uh, this was back in 2009. So the collision was 2016, so seven years earlier. Was he going through a divorce right around then, 09? I don't think it was a divorce, but I think, did he split with his girlfriend in 08? Okay. So possibly. Was his girlfriend mm -hmm. issue? The patient desires to feel justified in his anger. Uh, uh, does this ring any bells, 09? I didn't, I, no, I didn't witness anger, no. Or he didn't display it. Maybe he had a self-awareness. What do you know about like his breakup with his girlfriend in 09 in terms of emotions? Because we're talking a lot about our emotions in this trial. Yeah. Well, I know it was after his, his um, cancer treatment. So the year following. So I think he probably needed a lot of support and healing. And um, I don't think he feel, felt like he'd got that from his current partner. OK. So he, he had had an unsuccessful relationship with a woman prior to the ski collision, true? That's true. He was, he was working on that. And he, he went through two divorces, true? That's true, too. Had not remarried, right? To my understanding. And how many years went by between, like, uh, the second marriage came right after the first d divorce, true? That's correct. And then the after, uh, how many years went by after the second divorce and before the ski collision? Let me check my math here. I would say maybe 10 years. All right. So, uh, did he have any uh, like life partners during those 10 years? We're talking about his relationships, for instance, in this trial. He's had a hard time like having long-term relationships mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying, for those 10 years prior, mm -hmm. did he have long-term relationships? Um, by long-term, I can't, I can't think of sustainable. Um, you had mentioned the one that had split in 2009. And I'm not sure how long they were together, maybe two or three years. Uh, by the way, I don't know if we formally admitted D113, but I would like to do so. Any objection? What is it? I don't know what it is yet. Uh, we talked about it yesterday. Peter, do you mind? What do you show, Jody? I don't even show it. No, it's an add-on yesterday. I'll keep going, but... Uh, well, would you prefer I keep going, Judge, or we deal with it right here? It's your choice if you want to get it admitted now, or are you going to use the exhibit with this witness? Uh, I don't know, but I do want it in the record because I'm referring to it. Why don't we wait? We, we can handle it over the break, maybe, Thank unless you. you need this witness or need to ask this witness about it. Um, I guess I will. So. Move for D one thirteen F, which are VA. Or excuse me, D one thirteen, which are VA stipulated VA records. Agreed or disagreed here? We don't have any objection to the VA records. No objection. To the okay, VA defendants one thirteen is received. These records indicate that uh, your your dad had difficulty, the patient mentioned difficulty with the anger management. Uh, did you ever know your dad to have an anger management problem prior to the ski collision? I'm sorry, Your Honor, what page is that? I 113F. What's, what VA page is it? Thank you. 1134, second paragraph. So my question again, did you ever know your dad to have uh, difficulty with anger? No, I'm sorry. Just a second. I'm on 113. I don't see anything here. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you show counsel? I gave them a hard copy, too. Okay. Just, are, are you good to go? 
Mr. Sykes. Uh, where is it? Yeah, where is it on here? Okay, thank you, Judge. Did you, uh, hey, did, did you ever know your dad to have an anger management problem? I never knew my dad to have an anger management problem. Okay. If it's in his medical records prior to the ski collision, I take it you don't dispute that. They're his medical records, yeah. He struggles with self-disclosure that is self-focused rather than other-focused. Did you see that in your dad pre-ski collision? He's so focused on himself rather than others? I think he does have that tendency. Um, or but he did prior to the accident. It's after the accident. It's been magnified for sure. Okay. So the answer is yes. Yes, and more so after the accident. The focus of this session was to help him identify his responses and the associated feelings and communicate those in less blaming ways. Did, did you know him to like blame others frequently pre-ski collision? No. I think it's just great that he was trying to get, get tools, yeah. Well, he's getting tools because he has a problem with uh, communicating with others that doesn't blame them. Did you observe that prior to the ski collision? I don't think any humans are perfect, and he's acknowledging these are things I'm working on. That's how I, I understand that. Okay, so I am trying to phrase these in yes or no, but I'm not going to cut you off. So I'm going to ask it again, though. Prior to the ski collision, did you observe that your dad had problems communicating with others because he would blame them? Yes or no? No, I did not observe him blaming others. Yes. Yeah. I'll, did you I'll go with no. Did you observe uh, in the no, 113H that his interaction style and way of dealing with people often got him in trouble? Pre-accident? Pre-accident. No. And he would like to gain greater insight into his interpersonal difficulties. Did you know, did you, did you observe your dad pre-accident to have some interpersonal difficulties? Yes, I think he something he worked on. But, but most people don't go 13 years without talking to, like, your, your sibling, right? That's, that's more than just, I like, don't most people. I that to be true in my experience. So we're talking... It's true everyone has interpersonal communication difficulties, but not everyone goes to their therapist for it. Do you agree? I agree, but the smart ones do. patient had a number of recent stressors which he appeared to minimize. Okay, did you ever know your dad to minimize uh, other stressors and focus on something sort of obsessively? Not pre-accident, post-accident, yes. Okay, how about that he would uh, hyper-focus on a problem without dealing with broader issues that were affecting that? I would say he does have a tendency to hyperfocus. And that yeah. was pre-collision, right? Yes, way more so after the accident. Did his eyesight problem, hearing problem, heart issues, uh, prostate cancer, did those somewhat narrow his abilities, his activity level. I, I really didn't see that change or modify a lot. I think um, not till after the accident. How about at all? Just like the five years before the, uh, the accident. Any, re any reduction in activities at all? Right. 
I think I would see my dad, you know, make some adjustments. Like he would, he would learn because he's not, he's not reckless. So is that a yes or no? Re reduction in activity level prior to the ski collision. Yes, very, very minimal. And one of the things he told his doctor three weeks before the ski collision was he was not able to do the things he had been able to do. Did you, does that surprise you? Very much so. Okay. You don't dispute the medical record three weeks before the auto, the uh, ski collision, do you? I would have a hard time disputing his, okay. his records. Migraines. Uh, he was, uh, he would have migraines pre uh, ski collision, right? Occasionally. And they were de debilitating when he got, got them, true? Correct. And he would actually have vision problem associated with his migraines. When he had migraines, he had actually had even less vision. Do you agree? I know he would typically look for a, a dark place, you know, to just uh, recover from that. So your answer? I, he was sensitive to light, and that would be visual. OK. Now let's talk about his back and spine problems pre-collision. Uh, he had a foot drop, didn't he? He, he walked differently pre-collision? I, I wasn't aware of a foot drop or a different walk. Do you know what a foot drop is? Vaguely. So you have to more drag one of your feet. Is that fair? OK. I didn't notice that in my dad. You never knew of one? No. OK. How about uh, weakness or pain of uh, loss of sensation? Not aware of that. How about, uh, he did have spine surgery. Do you agree? I think he had, was it a compressed disc or something? Right. That's, that's not small time medicine, right? Spine surgery is a big deal? I would say yes. Knee injury. Oddly, is this true? Before the ski collision, he actually injured his knee skiing. Does this sound familiar? I vaguely remember meniscus, maybe. Skiing? Mm -hmm. Yes? I, there's inherent risks in skiing, knees being one of them. So the answer? Yes. Did that require surgery, do you recall? I don't believe it did. Shoulder problems. Do you recall having pre-ski collision shoulder problems? I think he, he did have a shoulder issue. And what do you recall about it? Not very much. Hamstring injury, a torn hamstring. Do you recall this pre-injury? I do not. Osteoarthritis, are you familiar with that term? Yes, I know what that is. And were you aware your, your father had osteoarthritis prior to the ski nope. injury? Trigger finger, do you know what that is? Yes, I do know that his thumb, he had issues with his thumb. By the way, do you recall one of the reasons he has hearing problems is from shooting a lot of guns without ear protection? In the military. Have you heard this before, or am I the first to tell you? Could have also been concerts, but I do know that he was in the military, so possibly. All right. When he was young, he was a rocker. Is that fair? Um, if rocker, you mean like the Kingston Trio? Yeah, he was uh, a rocker. I think he told me he was a rocker in his youth. Do you know anything about that? Well, you know, he's in college, like in the 68, in 68. So we're talking All right. Peter, Paul, and Mary, Kingston Trio, like still, real rocker. Still good music. Yeah. All right. Insomnia. Did you know him to have sleeping problems pre prior to the ski collision? I, I knew that sleep was kind of a challenge for him. That's something that he shares with my older sister, Shay. Um, and so they would talk about different techniques for getting a good night's sleep. So did he have insomnia issues pre-collision? I don't know if I would call it insomnia. You want to read me a definition for insomnia? Sure. Taking a medication for it. Oh. Did you know that he one of the medications he took, like a lorazepam or uh -huh. Ativan or trazodone, I think he took all three of those at one time. Not at one time. I apologize. Throughout the years before, uh, 
So that's how I would define it, requiring prescription medication. Okay, so I would defer to my dad's medical record. All right, respiratory problems. Were you aware your dad had respiratory problems pre-collision? I, I knew that he kept an inhaler, that he'd had a um, had pneumonia at some point, and so we felt like, um, yeah, I don't ever see him using the inhaler, okay. but I knew he had one. Raj, I object uh, doing this, going through the medical history of a 60-year-old person now for looks like this. It's irrelevant, and, and there has to be some end to this. Okay. okay. We, we only have uh, oh, oh, four oh, more days. Yeah, overruled. All right. Each side's getting half time, so it's not affecting your time, Mr. Sykes. Lower urinary tract issues. Perhaps those are prostate related. Do, do you know of any anything about not that? Of any of those. Kidney problems. Do you recall he had some kidney problems pre-collision? I do not recall that. Like uh, that he had chronic renal insufficiency. Do you, you've never heard that before? No. Cholesterol medication, what'd you tell me? You knew he was on a med for that or you didn't? I not? didn't know he was on a medication okay. for that, but that's pretty common for that age group, right? And restless legs, were you familiar that he had that? That was a condition? I think I, I, think I was aware of that. Did you and your sisters joke that like he's actually thinning the sheets because he kicks a lot? It sounds vaguely familiar. All right. Yes. Now. All right, we'll take a short break. Thank you.
Okay. We're ready. Because if they are, I'm going to spend more time with this witness. No, no, no. We're not planning on it. So. Okay, that will. I'm, I'm going to rely on that and shorten my testimony. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Owens, you may proceed. Thank you. If your dad told the doctor three weeks uh, before the ski collision that he was preoccupied with paperwork and cleaning things out and not doing things he enjoyed doing that he used to do, do you know any? Do you have any insights on that? I do not. Did you personally observe it? I did not. And <clears throat> how long had it been since you saw your dad prior? We said three months after the ski collision, but I'm not sure I asked you. How many months prior had you seen him? I expect that we would have saw him either over the Christmas holiday okay. or perhaps Thanksgiving. We usually did one or the other. All right. So we're, the accident was in May. It would have been... Five or Accident six months. Accident was in February. Oh, you're absolutely right. Sorry. Yeah. Months, so months. I'm thinking it would have been a couple uh, months, two months, three months. Gotcha. Yeah. Was your dad sort of a scary driver uh, be before the ski collision? I think I mentioned he was a multitasker, so he did more things in the car than I wanted my teen drivers to witness. This is the first time I've ever seen this, but not just texting, but he would actually read a book while driving on the interstate freeway. Is that true? I'd heard that rumor, like back when we were children. From your sister? You know, sister? on a straight stretch. I think that was something that... From your sister? Yeah. That's bad judgment, isn't it? To actually read a book? I wouldn't recommend it. There's no foundation for yeah. judgment. She doesn't have any Sustained. Well, do you think that is bad judgment if, if, if your dad was reading a book Driving. He just ruled on this. It's, a, diff it's a different question. Go ahead and move on, counsel. Thanks. 
All right. Your dad, our experts have actually compared brain imaging before the collision and brain imaging after the collision and have made various conclusions. I take it you don't know anything about that. No, no advanced degrees in neuropsychology or... All right. And then your dad really received all of his health care at the VA. Is that accurate? I think his primary care provider, he, he uses the VA. I'm, I'm talking like lots of medical care and lots of specialties. Do, are you aware of that? Like I said, I think he really values his health and has always, you know, had those checkups and would not surprise me. So pre-collision, like a lot of medical records. I it, think there's a continuity there that runs his whole life before accident, after accident. So I'm waiting for a yes on any of these. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and they knew him best. Fair enough, the VA people. Foundation. If you can answer the question. I think it depends on if you have longevity with your primary care provider. And sometimes with the VA, there's a lot of turnaround. They don't always stay a long time. Do you know that he actually did have a long-term relationship with his primary care provider at the VA before this incident? I don't know whether he did or not. Okay. I would be hopeful that Margaret, he did. Margaret Rasmussen, do you know that name? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm misstating it. Never mind, don't worry. Okay, then, so, does this surprise you that your dad would go to the VA people and say, hmm, I want to be checked out. I want my thinking to be checked out. Did you ever hear him do that? that no, that, I did not. Or that he had done that. That's how I should have said it. I, I was not aware. I okay. do know that he had follow-ups and... Healthcare visits, yes. Did he ever tell you that he had had three neuropsych assessments at the VA through his current treating providers? Pre-collision? No. I, I did, did not mean to switch on you. Thank okay. you. That's a good clarification. So, like, one month after, one year after, one and three months after, that kind of thing. I knew that he was having follow-ups because he was really worried about his mental state. So I don't, again, I haven't seen the medical records, but that seems, if that's what his medical record says. And that all, did you ever remember hearing from him or anyone else that they, they were all uh, average to above, above average in like 20 different categories? He did not share the response with me. I know he was doing a lot of work towards it, right? Cognitive work. So you knew he was getting these assessments, but weren't you saying, hey, Dad, what are they saying? Didn't you do that? I don't think I asked for medical you know, information more about how are you doing? Do things feel less foggy for you? Okay. Are you I'm more, more I'm, you're doing it. I'm proud of you. Keep doing the work. Keep following up. Post-collision travel. All right. So he would visit. U.S. states like Washington, Oregon, Montana, Idaho. Do you recall all of those? My sisters live in those states. I do, so yeah, I would say he did travel there. And then, in addition, he went to Peru and walked the Golden Trail. True? I, I can't speak to that. I do know he went to Peru. Okay. Do you remember, like, Machu Picchu? He went and visited Machu Picchu? He did not share that with me. Or I would have done that if I was in Peru. Yes. <laughs> that he floated down the Amazon? Did not. This is early 2017. Mm -hmm. So about one year after the, the collision. Mm -hmm. uh, do you recall how many weeks he was gone in Peru? I think it was a couple of weeks, maybe. Okay. And then Costa Rica, he did a zip line also the year after the accident. Do you recall this? I was not aware he did as a plane, no. How about Europe? Also the year after the accident. Do you recall he went to Europe the year after the accident? So I recall in 2017 he had tickets to go with Robin. Um, then things fell apart with that relationship, and so he went to Europe with my younger sister, Jenny. So the answer is? Yes, I'm aware he went to uh, Europe. He went to the Netherlands and Germany and Switzerland and Italy and France and Belgium. Correct. I believe so. The Netherlands, he went there three different times. Is that true? Sounds correct. And that's the year two and three after the accident. Okay. 
you with me? Like, you have to say, I can't testify. Do you know that? I was not aware he had gone three times. I was aware that he had traveled to the Netherlands. More than once? I, into my recollection, twice. Okay, Morocco. Yes. He twice visited Morocco. That sounds correct. Canary Islands, uh, this is the year after, uh, two years after the accident. That was the same time I went to Morocco. And the Canary Islands, I don't even know where those are. I should know. If they're not on a risk board, I don't know my geography. Do you know where it is? I, I would have to look at a map or an atlas as well. Okay. Thailand. He visited I'm, Thailand three years after the accident. Is yeah, with right? his friend Boyd. And each of these times he'd take pictures and post them with him smiling at all these great tourist spots. Do you agree? As you do. Yes? Yes. Mm-hmm. Big, big smiles in front of a Buddhist temple, for instance, right? Yeah, we don't tend to post pictures of ourselves sad and, and in closets. No, we don't. We the, tend to... The answer is yes? Yes. Like Eiffel Tower, uh, those, Italy, the coast, all have big smiling pictures of Terry, true? I haven't seen a lot of those photos that you're talking about. I think there were quite a bit of photos before the accident, too. I I would want to make sure you could separate pre-accident, post-accident pictures. Right, and you defer to your dad on that, right? If I asked him, like, does this state look right, and he says yes, I mean, he'd be the guy. Yeah, possibly. All right. So is it fair to say his, his travels did not suffer as a result of the ski collision, is lo- yes, you could say his travel companions might have suffered. <laughs> uh, one clarification, Carlene, is that our? That's our girlfriend. Uh, I heard some comment that they were engaged, and then I never heard that from her, her Carlene. To your knowledge, were they engaged? I never heard that word or fiancé used. I think that was their intent and plan. But and then on the prostate cancer, I heard the word cured from plaintiff's counsel, but I actually never heard it from a witness. Do, do you uh, know that, in fact, your dad... Uh, is cured? I cannot answer to that. You've been very kind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Owens. Mr. Sykes? I have one second, Judge. Mr. Owens asked you about um, uh, Sam Goldstein's comment about Terry being obsessed. Uh, Do you know why Terry is obsessed with this case? Mm -hmm. Do you know why? It's the foundation of the I think my dad is very principled and I think not only was he injured but I think this accident really hurt in a way that it was it hurt him in a way that somebody would just not care for him when he was injured I think that his brain injury um, he really does become consumed with things and I think feeling like writing this wrong for him uh, has really kind of consumed him. And he, he wanted to, to make it right. He wanted someone to at least apologize or acknowledge or be held accountable for their decision on that day. Okay. Do you have any experience in mental health? 
And if so, tell the jury what it is. Yeah, so I um, managed a mental health and substance use disorder clinic for several years. Um, in the, in the Coeur d'Alene area? Yeah, yeah, in St. Mary's, actually, uh, for a FQHC there. Um, so worked with people that were struggling uh, mentally or with addiction. I um, ended up leaving just, you know, during the pandemic, it got so that the demand was much greater than we could fill, and it was really a lot of people in crisis a lot of the time. So I thought I was going to just take a break, um, work with kids, get upstream a little bit, and feel like create some buoyancy. And I still might go back to working in the mental health field, but uh, for now, I, I like what I'm doing. Now, um, you and your sister both went to the University of Idaho in Moscow, right? All three of us. All three of us. Uh, and so uh, Shay was a senior, you were a freshman. That's right. We were roommates. She was a, a senior. I was a freshman. That didn't work out so good. She was like, you know, you need to be home by 10. You got homework to do. And I was like, wait, you're not my mom. But we got through it. Yeah. Did, did Jenny ever come visit you over there? Yeah, she did. And we went home every chance we got to. Okay. It was hard. Our parents were going through the divorce. Um, so myself at 18 and Shay at 21, it was really felt like we left our our little one behind. So yeah, we went back every chance we got. You were quite close to her, right? Yes. Uh, tell the jury about uh, Jenny's mental health problems. So um, let me begin by just saying she's one of my favorite people. Um, but yeah, as probably a young adult, uh, she was diagnosed with some um, mental disabilities. She is on disability now. Yeah, objection, just a minute. Just hearsay. Sustained. Well, do you know this for a fact about her, her diagnosis? And how do you know? Um, I, I could, because I'm her sister and we communicate with each other and I know she's on disability now. My objection was sustained, and we're just pretending it wasn't. I'm asking what she said. Objection is sustained. The, the answer is stricken, and the jury should disregard the response. Go ahead, Mr. Sykes. Well, I need to be able to explore this because he did uh, quite a bit. So I'm going to up here for just a minute. Okay, would you um, tell the jury what your experience with mental health is mm -hmm. in the clinic? What, what did you do there yeah. and what did you learn? So we had seven counselors and um, people that came in for, um, it would be outpatient mental health services, anything from 
uh, depression to anxiety to schizophrenia to where whatever they were working on. Expert opinion she is not allowed to give. Will you approach the bench, please? Sustained. Yes. And then I just uh, uh, requested a, an opportunity to put this on the record at some later date. I mean, some later time after the jury's gone. Okay. All right. Uh, tell me the kind of things that no, Jenny. I just want to take the jury's time with the argument. Oh, yeah, we understand that. So yeah. go ahead, Mr. Yeah, Sykes. We don't want to hold them up either. Um, tell me some of the things that you. Uh, discussed with Jenny on the phone and when you had meetings with her what are some of the things you discussed with her are you talking about like to serve our phone calls and yeah. our catch and yeah so uh, particularly with respect to your dad oh yeah for sure mm -hmm. uh, I saw her last month I went over to Missoula for my birthday and we uh, took in a film festival a documentary film festival together so we got to visit a little bit about this upcoming trial. She was nervous. So she, this sounds like hearsay. Sustained as to hearsay? Well, well not what she said, said, but just what, what you observed about her. What I observed, um, I observed that she wasn't in a great mental place mm -hmm. with us. She was strike. I think as a sister. We not as an expert. Yeah, just a second. I, I sure. want to hear the objection. She was not in a good mental state. That's an okay. expert opinion. That's not I expert. think she can offer a lay opinion under, under Rule 701. Thank you, Judge. Go ahead. Offer your lay opinion, please. Yeah, I was, wor I was worried about her. I could tell that she was stressed out. She um, confided in me that her counselor had said I you can't, you can't talk about what she maybe said Oh, OK. To you, All right. But you're certainly able to talk about what you observed. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, her cat Potts wasn't doing really great. She was worried about her cat. Um, she was worried about taking time to get here. And those would be communications. And that's something I can share or no? So it's something I observed. You, you can't relay information that you obtained from her verbally. Okay. You can, what you saw when you were with her, you can right. talk about that. Right. But not what she told you. Okay. I just really enjoyed my time with her, as I always do. Okay. Um, Did she appear to be under a lot of stress? Yeah, she had some, mm -hmm. yeah, heaviness about her. Um, <clears throat> over the years, as you've heard her talk about your dad, okay, have her complaints and observations always been accurate in your opinion? I think 
her mind, she has a, a creative way of seeing things. Um, she was an art major. She's very visual, struggles with verbal communication. I think of everyone in the family, I do best with almost, I don't know if I can call it translating or interpreting and drilling down to um, what she's trying to say. There are times, though, when, and I don't want to speak for my other sister, Shay, but I can speak for myself when I've experienced that her understanding of a situation is very different than mine. To strike that. It's, we're getting it out of a lay perspective. I think that is a, a lay opinion. Of, it's a, it's, I mean, it, you need to lay the foundation based on her perception. Okay. So reason, based on her reasonable perception, then it would qualify as a lay opinion. Yeah. Tell the jury if you watch, me, uh, what you've observed about her perceptions. Lay a foundation for us. Yeah. I mean. Lots of meetings, lots of telephone calls. You've talked about that. Yeah, um, yeah, well, she, we, we uh, FaceTime quite a bit. Um, like I said, she's very visual, one of my favorite people to walk with because she'll say things like, wow, stop, look at that, look at those colors together, you know? Um, she sketches a lot. Um, she has a whole other way of seeing the world that You're sometimes right. is beautiful. That's an expert opinion. So Do we have to keep dealing with this? She's laid a foundation for perception. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, it's really cool when you can expand your way of, of understanding, right? And we're always kind of myopic. Like we see things, I see things how I see things, and you see things how you see things. So what I appreciate about, appreciate about Jenny is that uh, she has another way of seeing things. Um, and sometimes that is really difficult. Sometimes with communication, things get uh, twisted or confused, and there's a lot of clarification that has to happen often. And Can we put on the record she is not here as a mental health expert, and she is not an mental health expert. I think you can bring that out on cross-examination. This, this is a lay opinion of a sister about a sister and nothing more. Go ahead, Mr. I'm Seth. sorry you were interrupted. See if you can finish what your thought was. Yeah, and I don't want anyone to think that I'm an expert on anything. I, what I can speak to is the fact that I have had a relationship with her for 40, 41 years. You know, she's kind of my first baby. She was, I was six when she was born. Um, so I can just speak to that relationship and growing up with her. You, you were saying, that she, I think you said she had another way of perceiving things. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, I think she has a unique way of looking at the world. That's not always true? Your Honor, it's not always easy. Cool. Yeah. Just a minute. She, she can't make a credibility statement about her sister's thoughts. Sustained. Let me and rephrase that. also sustained as to vagueness. OK. When you said another way of, and I, I want to quote you correctly, another way of perceiving or understanding, you said that. I did say that. I now, think, now, what did you mean by that is my question. It kind of comes back to Mr. Owens when I sp spoke with him earlier, and he was saying, so are you telling the truth or is she telling the truth? And I had a hard time answering that because I can speak to my own experience, but I, I am not in her lived experience with her. Um, who she is, and um, I, I have not lived her life and her experience. I know her to be truthful. I've never heard her lie. Um, or, so, it, it, so if she's communicating that to you, that is her understanding of the experience. Yes, right. we have had times though when she has saw something that I have not seen, or I would portray it as differently than her. Based on your knowledge of her in the past few years, okay, and, and your knowledge of her over the years as her sister and one who loves her, are her perceptions always accurate? They're not. Hold on one second, Judge. No further questions, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Owens. I 
understand uh, Jenny to be a perfectly lovely, well-spoken person. Do you? She's lovely. I would not use the words well-spoken. Did you read her 136-page deposition? Am I allowed to? Of course you are. No, I, I have not read her deposition. Well, I don't know if you are, but I didn't give it to you. I'm just wondering. Does it surprise you that question and answering were perfectly eloquent? The whole thing, for, for like hours and hours. I object, Your Honor, there's no, she, she has no foundation to answer that question, and that's just a, a personal opinion. Sustained. Does it surprise you that Jenny could talk eloquently for hours and hours? Same objection. Sustained, it sounds like counsel's testifying. Okay. She has a bachelor's degree, right? Well, it's hard thought, but we got there. Yes. Yeah. Is the answer? Yes, is the answer. She, uh, I mean, it sounds like I'm defending your sister here, and you're not. So let's <laughs> let's kind of talk about it. Okay. No, because I will. Yeah. Overruled. You said Jenny is truthful. Yes? I've never known her to lie. Intentionally lie, no. So, If she says your father violated boundaries she set for years, would you, you wouldn't, you defer to her? Objection, Your Honor. That's beyond the scope, and he's already covered that in this. Overruled? I would say that's something my sister has communicated to me, is that it's something she really practices with my dad, is healthy boundaries. And both the other sisters do too, right? Yeah. Set boundaries, yeah. and sometimes he violates them. I think True. all healthy relationships have to have boundaries. And True. yes, that has been, after the accident, definitely something that I struggle with with my dad. Is she telling the truth when she believes that your dad would exaggerate for money and celebrity. Objection, Your Honor, that's beyond the scope. That's also oh, it's uh, a counsel. Overruled. Um, she would be telling her truth. I am winding up here. she telling the truth when she says he's deceptive? Your Honor, I think that's an improper questioning. I think we covered this before also, didn't we? That's a new word. Uh, okay. Overruled? I would say she's telling her truth. Is she telling her truth when she says, uh, I'm having a problem finding my quote on this. I apologize. Give me one second, please. <clears throat> he will get whatever monetary benefit he can in business, even if it's dishonest. Gone through. That's not a quote, it's but it is a summary. And it's totally irrelevant. It's improper questioning. Overruled. I, I don't know that to be true. Again, this is Jenny's deposition. Is she telling the truth when she describes your dad as anal retentive? 
I'm thinking that that word came up with my older sister, too, because she brought up that word. And I said, I don't even know what anal retentive means. Gen- what does anal retentive mean? So are, if you're talking like type A and order and details, I would say that's true. Okay. So let me make sure we refate, make sure we're on the same page. Okay. Is she telling the truth when she says he has anal retentive? Uh, he's anal retentive. Um, I would not call him anal retentive, no. Okay, but both your sisters did, right? Shay said that too. Do you recall? Shay said that the word anal retentive came up in her deposition, and I said it did not come up in mine. Okay. Yeah. Well, I didn't make it up. Uh, Came from somewhere. Okay, anal retentive has nothing to do with our bottoms. Is that true? Just to make sure we're talking about the same thing. I, yeah. It's got the word anal in it. I know. I don't like saying it. Is that the definition? I, uh, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Let's. Uh, I think it's obsessive, sort of. That's how I understand it. But and it is. She asked me, but I'll be quiet. Yeah. Let's move on. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Mr. Sykes. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. And council, please approach. So we're gonna we're gonna let we're gonna you're you're done with your questioning right now. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not done yet. Oh, I thought you were. No, no. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> you answered some of Mr. Owen's last questions that she's telling her truth. Define that for us, please. What does that mean? I think human beings move through the world and we have our own understanding and experience of things. Um, I think there's a neurodiversity that exists in this world and there are different ways of understanding and experience. Um, Like I said, I don't know Jenny to be untruthful. I think she sees the world in a curious, different way. But that's not your truth. No, it's not my experience. Those are not my experiences. So for the question, would she get it wrong that she didn't talk to her dad for 13 years? I believe that is wrong. Overruled. Over, overruled. Overruled. So you think she can be wrong? Yeah, that sounds wrong to me from my knowledge and understanding. So if you want to clarify, you're saying that after she moved out, she never saw my dad for 13 years? Uh, We'll defer to her testimony, but whatever she said. Okay. Thanks. I forgot to ask you one question. 2017, your dad broke up with... um, Robin. Robin Dale, right? Okay. Yeah, that's beyond the scope here. And she went Overruled. Go ahead and... She went to... to, he, He took Jenny to Europe with him, didn't he? That's correct. Did they have a good time? No, it was miserable. Miserable. I think at some point she sent me footage 
where the bearing had gone out on my dad's wheelie suitcase. And it was just an hour and a half of him, like, spinning the wheel trying to figure it out. And when I said, how are things going? Pretty fixed that post-accident, huh? No. Oh, it's, Your Honor, I'm going to put this on the record because I think I misspoke. Uh, with Jenny, you said that you and your father didn't speak for 13 years after you graduated from high school. We spoke. Your Honor, I, I object to this. I'm correcting my error. Because well, well, I spoke in error. It says we spoke. It was just distant. Right. So I, I misspoke. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So you can step down. Um, you're still under subpoena, and so you need to uh, be available for any further t for testimony, perhaps later in the case. Okay. Thank you. She was subpoenaed only for today. Well, uh, I guess I'm extending it by order right now, then. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. I was just reminded. I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Grisham. Uh, you're still under the witness rule, meaning that you can't watch the proceedings, you can't sit in here, and you can't talk to other witnesses about the case. Thank you. Mr. Sykes? Well, uh, confer with sure. more learned counsel for just a minute. Your Honor, we're going to call Richard Boehm, uh, medical doctor from Florida, okay. by video because he had a wedding and could not come to the, the trial. And so, a few minutes to set that up? No, we're ready to go, but I mean, the jury might want a short break, uh, I think five or seven minutes, something like that, I mean, whatever. I think we're okay if we... It's only been about, it's been less than 30 minutes. Thank you. And counsel, for the record, would you spell that witness's name? And that's a, that's an MD. Biomedical engineer. All right. Thank you. Ross Ann Morgan. We represent Depomax Merritt, located in Salt Lake City, Utah. The time and day indicated on the Zoom feed is 12, 11 um, p.m. Mountain Time, uh, March 13th, 2023. This is the case of Terry Sanderson versus Gwyneth Paltrow, case number 19050048 in the Third Judicial District Court, Summit County, State of Utah. Counsel will now introduce themselves and the court reporter will swear in the witness. Lawrence Bueller for Plaintiff Terry Sanderson. James Egan for Gwyneth Paltrow, the defendant. With me is also Robert Sykes. Uh, I don't know, just myself, if I can ever get this thing turned on. Okay, uh, Robert Sykes, also counsel for the plaintiff. Can you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do, Madam Court Reporter. Thank you. Go ahead, counsel. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bain, could you uh, state your name and spell it for the record, please? Certainly. My name is Richard Bain, and that is spelled B-O-E-H-M-E. Okay. And I'd like to just get some uh, background and educational information. So, uh, where were you born? Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, where did you grow up? Huntsville, Alabama. 
And uh, next, I'd like to hear about your education, starting with high school and then through universities, undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate school. Thank you. I graduated from high school in Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, went into the Navy. I graduated with honors with a Bachelor's of Science in Aerospace Engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy. I did my postgraduate work in nuclear engineering, and I served on board a number of nuclear submarines in the U.S. Navy as a nuclear trained engineering officer. Anyway, we can turn it up, I would love. During the application process in the U.S. Navy as a nuclear trained engineering officer, I resigned my commission to apply and go to medical school. During the application process, I worked as an advanced designed aerospace engineer for the Morton Paykal Corporation on the Star Wars project back in the 1980s. I matriculated into medical school at the University of Alabama School of Medicine in Birmingham. While I was there, I took a leave of absence to complete my PhD in biomedical engineering. And after I was conferred the PhD, I went back and completed the MD. And after I was conferred the MD degree, I went back on active duty in the Navy. And I conducted my internship in general surgery and my residency training in neurology at Bethesda Naval Hospital located outside of Washington, D.C. While I was in the Washington, D.C. area, I worked at the Naval Emergency Research Laboratory. I taught the postdocs until my retirement in 2005. I became board certified in adult neurology and I completed fellowship training in neuroradiology while I was in the Navy. Uh, I currently have a private practice in neurology in Jacksonville Beach, and uh, that's about it, guys. Okay. Can you explain your education more specifically in neurology and biomedical engineering? Uh, sure. Neurology is a subspecialty in medicine where the physician of record deals with patients that have disorders of the central, peripheral, and autonomic nervous systems. A biomedical engineer, well, the biomedical engineering field is a very broad field that uh, brings the disciplines of medicine and engineering together. It ranges from genetic research to um, the design and implementation of artificial limbs and joints, monitoring equipment in the uh, hospital, heart lung machines, uh, materials used for artificial limbs, teeth, these types of things. My particular specialty within the field of biomedical engineering is the study of complex fluid flow and the study of externally applied force application to the human. That was- I'm sorry. I'm sorry, doctor, I just missed that last part. Uh, the, the, the study of externally applied force application to the human. Got it, to the human. Thank you, sorry. You're welcome, sir. Uh, now I'd like to move on to training uh, as a neurologist. Um, how many years have you been practicing as a neurologist and uh, training in neurology? Over 30 years. And what about uh, how many years as a biomedical engineer? I would say about the same period of time. I did that work in the Navy starting on or about 1989. So I guess that would qualify as eight, 30 years. Okay. Uh, can you describe your hospital and clinical work? Uh, sure, I have hospital privileges at the St. Vincent's and Baptist Health Systems here in Jacksonville, Florida, which comprises uh, five different hospitals. And then I have an out, primarily an outpatient clinic in neurology, and I see patients five days a week, Monday through Friday, and uh, neurology patients comprise primarily of headache patients, trauma patients, patients with stroke, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, peripheral neuropathies, these types of things. So 
Um, that's what I deal with on a daily basis. How many times have you testified in court as an expert witness? Uh, a lot, I would say over, well, in the private sector, it's over a hundred times. Uh, when I was in the government, I used to testify on behalf of the government, i.e. the Navy, um, at different uh, tribunals and that type of stuff. And I, I don't know the number of that, probably less than 50. Uh, are you compensated for your time as you prepare for and testify in court? Yes, I am. And what types of cases uh, in the private sector do you testify? Well, I uh, get involved in uh, what we refer to as personal injury cases, i.e. patients that have some type of medical malady as a result of an externally applied force application to some part of their body. I get involved in medical malpractice cases and also in product liability cases. Okay. Uh, does that include uh, head trauma? Uh, yes, it does. And also to be complete every so often now that I'm retired from the Navy, I do get a government page from time to time. I would say maybe once per year. Okay. I'd like to move to your professional specialties and interests. Other than what you've described, are there any other things like patients or uh, brain injuries in general or concussion victims that uh, uh, you have specialties or interests in? Well, I see patients that have uh, close head trauma, that have uh, concussion, concussion symptoms ongoing, if you will. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. And that is uh, how it's done by a neurologist, correct? Well, yes. I mean, some uh, some uh, neurologists uh, uh, elect to specialize their clinic in certain disorders, uh, if you will. But uh, I don't. I'm more of a general neurologist. So in addition to the trauma patients, I see the other patients that I've already described. Okay. Uh, what about your uh, professional specialties in uh, biomedical engineering? Anything else that uh, you can tell us? Well, I did that work in the Navy, and then when I came into the private sector, I got involved in, in the three types of cases. Well, actually, the two, personal injury and product liability. Medical malpractice deals with just neurology, but uh, product liability cases, i.e., if... Uh, if a particular medical device fails for some reason, then I get called in to uh, assess why it did that, if it in fact did do that, if you will. And then of course the personal injury aspect of it, this would be one of those types of cases. Okay, uh, uh, so uh, you mentioned uh, personal injury, that would include closed head brain injury? Yes. and. You know, spinal cord injuries, these types of things. Other, anything that involves the nervous system, and keep in mind that we have nerves that go to all parts of our body. Okay. What is a closed head brain injury? Well, closed head injury just means that the externally applied force to the head did not open up the head, i.e. you don't have an open skull fracture or anything like that. An example of an open head injury would be like a gunshot wound to the head. That would be an example of that. Um, is that the same as a TBI or traumatic brain injury? Well, closed head trauma just describes an externally applied force application to the head. Now, what it does to the brain, if you have any type of dysfunction of brain activity, after the force application, we refer to that as a traumatic brain injury. What is an MTBI? M just means mild, mild traumatic brain injury. And what about post-concussive syndrome? Post-concussion concussion syndrome is just a description of 
a group of symptoms that make up a syndrome. Post-concussion implies that there has been some type of externally applied force application to the head that results in some type of brain dysfunction. And in classic terms, a post-concussion or a concussion is, in fact, a mild traumatic brain injury. However, you need to qualify that whether or not the concussion is permanent or not. Most concussions, most people that have concussive-like symptomatology from a blow to the head, the most common of which is a headache, will resolve quickly over time. And the trauma literature is pretty specific in this description. 95% of people that have a closed head injury that have concussive symptomatology resulting from that will return back to their baseline normal within one year, 95% of the time. So that still leaves 5% of those that don't. So you have to qualify whether or not the concussion or the concussive symptomatology is permanent or not. Okay, regarding the group that does not recover within a year, what are the problems that typically persist? Well, that, keep in mind that your brain is your whole being. So you can have any type of symptom relating to brain function. Keep in mind that the study or the field of neurology was learned stroke by stroke. So to give you some examples, if you lost eyesight as a result of a blow to the head, that would be a brain injury because you lost your eyesight. You can have paralysis, you can have double vision, you can have vertigo or imbalance, you can have hearing loss, you can have disorders of mentation, such as memory loss, intermittent confusion. The most common symptom after a blow to the head would be a headache. So people will describe different types of headache syndromes as a result of blow to the head. Okay. Um, in your career, about how many adults of Terry's age have you treated or evaluated for brain injury? Terry was 69 at the time. Well, I, I don't keep track of that data. It's been uh, quite a few, I would imagine, over, over time. Our neurology group was the group that provided neurological services to our professional football team, the Jacksonville Jaguars, for a couple of years. So in the younger population, we saw it all the time. But in that particular age group, it's going to be less common uh, because the prevalence of closed head injury in, in elderly individuals is less, with the exception of patients that have Parkinson's disease. People with Parkinson's disease lose their ability to uh, control their center of gravity, so they have a tendency to fall. And also, they have a tendency of not being able to protect themselves when they fall, i.e., put their hands in front of their face. So we see a disproportionate amount of patients that have Parkinson's disease that end up falling, striking their head on the ground, and then having uh, any varying degree of brain injury as, a, as it relates to that fall. Uh, we've asked you to review the case of plaintiff Terry Sanderson. Uh, I'd like you to explain uh, what you have reviewed and relied on in this case. Um, for example, uh, did you meet with uh, Mr. Sanderson? Yes, I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Sanderson in my office on April 28, 2021. And what was the primary reason you were asked, or you asked to see Mr. Sanderson? Well, whenever I get involved in these types of matters, I insist on seeing the patient for two reasons to get their Keep in mind that the patient is the repository of all information from which uh, a healthcare provider is going to 
come up with a medical differential diagnosis and ultimately a final diagnosis. So you got the source in front, in front of you, but also I had the medical record. So I was able to corroborate the medical record with Mr. Sanderson and then get his uh, description of the events leading to his condition. And then of course I performed a uh, physical examination on him as well. Okay. Um, what were the medical records, as you recall, that you reviewed in this case? Uh, fortunately, I have them listed here because I don't commit all this to memory. Um, I have the uh, incident report from the actual event, uh, the Park City Instacare, that's like an urgent care facility. I have the uh, VA medical records. I have uh, imaging, you know, x-rays and a CT scan. Then I have Dr. Goldstein's uh, records. I have uh, Dr. Wendell's records, or Dr. Wendell Gibby's records, that is. Uh, Dr. Alana Fong records. And then I have numerous uh, deposition uh, transcripts. And that includes a Mr. Ramon, a Ms. Gratian, uh, Gratian, Sanderson, Arab, Davidson, and Smith. And then I have deposition testimony from uh, Mr. Sanderson, a Ms. Paltrow, and Eric Christensen, Sam Goldstein, and Dr. Palm. And so the, those are the uh, materials that I reviewed. Oh, what do you recall about uh, Miss Carlene Davidson, the uh, former girlfriend of Terry Sanderson? Well, that there was a significant change in Mr. Sanderson as it relates to the incident uh, back in 2016. Uh, some of these depositions or these witnesses, uh, we call them uh, before and after witnesses. Is that, is that your understanding? Yes, it is. Uh, what is the significance to you of the before and after witnesses that are uh, that you reviewed in this case? Well, there is a type of patient that we see commonly in our practice that may not give us a consistent or inconsistent history and may not have insight into their own problems and I'm referring to patients that have like dementia these types of things and so the healthcare provider has to rely upon witness history I from close observers uh, like a family member a spouse a co-worker to get the history this is one of the problems that we have as neurologists, especially with patients that were initially evaluating for Alzheimer's dementia. It is almost universal that it is a loved one or a close associate that brings that patient in for evaluation where the patient has very little insight into the problems that are seen by others. So witnesses can be exceedingly helpful in obtaining historical information on a patient. Uh, does Dr. or does Terry Sanderson have Alzheimer's or dementia in your opinion? No. Uh, what is the importance of uh, uh, the, some of these before and after witnesses whose depositions you, you reviewed uh, to your understanding of the problems well, if you, if you have an, a situation where there is brain dysfunction from a specific event, i.e. there's a stepwise uh, decline in functioning, and it doesn't have to, you know, it's any type of functioning, the, the close observer is going to be in a position to be able to relate the change or the magnitude of the change in the symptoms in the patient at hand, whereas the patient may not be able to 
express those changes to the healthcare provider. So before and after witnesses can be exceedingly helpful in those types of cases. And you understand Terry Sanderson was uh, involved in a ski crash, correct? That's correct. So uh, do you recall reviewing uh, records by and the deposition of uh, Whitney Smith, a ski patroller at Deer Valley? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, we'll get to that later. I'd just like to go through the list of things that you reviewed. Sure. Uh, Finally, uh, uh, next, uh, did you review some of the uh, defense expert reports, the reports that were produced by uh, the defendant, Gwyneth Paltrow? I did see some correspondence relating to those reports, yes, and I reviewed those. Okay. Now I'm going to share my screen and show you the Dear, uh, we're, it's uh, Plaintiff's Trial Exhibit 1. Just give me a second. And this is the uh, Deer Valley Resort Company Incident Report Form. Do you see that at the top? Yes, I do. And it's dated uh, February 26, 2016. You see that too. Yes, I do. You also, do you also see that it indicates uh, the incident or the time was uh, 12 o'clock, I assume noon because... Yes, it's noon. Um, I'm uh, not familiar with night skiing. It, there is night skiing, but not at Deer Valley, I don't believe, and um, not that late. And it involves Terry Sanderson. And um, I'm just going to highlight a few things. Well, it's not letting me highlight. Let's see if I can highlight it here. Oops. There it is. Now it is. Do you see that uh, blue highlight? Yes, I do. Um, it says it's under uh, insured's description of the incident, correct? Yes. What And what does it say? I think it says injured. It was hit from behind. Okay, I'm going to go to page two of exhibit one. And do you see under, uh, next to the question, what did you do? Um, I'm, I'm going to try to highlight it, um, but uh, uh, can you read that for the record, please? Certainly. Um, he was assessed to have a mild disorientation and rib pain on the right side, and then he was transported via toboggan to the, uh, the screening facility, I would imagine. And then on reassessment, he was still disoriented. Okay. I'm just gonna uh, register an objection to the degree that that did not uh, read uh, into the record exactly what is written in that answer. Okay. Um, yeah, as, uh, what is the, uh, why is that, uh, uh, what we just reviewed in this Exhibit 1, uh, why is it important? Um, does it confirm head trauma and broken ribs, do you believe, for example? Well, the clinical description of rib pain certainly is consistent with fractured ribs on the right side, which was later determined. And the disorientation uh, tells me that he did not have a volitional, meaningful interaction with this environment. So there was an element of loss of consciousness involved here. And what is the significance of loss of consciousness? Well, a loss of consciousness is certainly dysfunction of the brain. I mean, obviously people don't, aren't on a ski slope unconscious unless something happens to them. So this is certainly an aberrancy of brain uh, function. 
Okay. Uh, just to go through the exhibits uh, at the beginning instead of later, I'm, I'm going to go through uh, another exhibit. Uh, this will be plaintiff's trial exhibit number four. And uh, do you see this uh, exhibit four? Yes, I do. Okay, uh, if you uh, wouldn't mind uh, looking at that and uh, in particular uh, uh, the report that I just highlighted uh, in blue. States he lost consciousness and ski patrol responded. Okay. Uh, what is the significance of uh, this report which apparently occurred the same day as the uh, ski crash to you. What does this mean in, as an expert? Well, it's just documenting what happened to him. So he had a loss of consciousness. Okay. And like I said, I'm just going through these to uh, make sure you're familiar with them because I'd like to discuss what they mean to your opinions or sure. to to uh, form your opinions. Next I'm going to show you trial exhibit five. Uh, do you see this uh, exhibit? And if you yes, can do, uh, please, uh, please describe it. It's a progress note and uh, from the emergency department. And the visit was February 27th. Um, and then uh, the, his chief complaint was a ski accident yesterday with positive LOC, which means loss of consciousness for approximately five minutes. He states he has a slight headache today and being more irritable. And he is also complaining of right lateral rib pain that is worse with inspiration, i.e. breathing, and he denies any neck pain. Okay, again, uh, why is this record important to your opinions? Well, it's consistent with what happened with them um, yesterday and he still has the right, you know, the, the rib pain. So uh, um, it's just consistent with the history that was previously uh, given. Just going through uh, is there anything about this record that you think is uh, important to discuss about your opinions today oh well, it's just the history judge uh, I think some people may be having trouble seeing that I wondered if we could have permission to have them move up to the front or something so they can see it if they want because it is a little bit small are any members of the jury having a difficult time reading the, the exhibit or any of the exhibits? If you are, please, you know, you can move to these closer chairs or you can certainly walk around front. Feel free to do that. Okay? All right. I mean, it basically had an unremarkable exam. Um, and uh, the history tells the story. And finally, I'm going to show you Exhibit 7, which is the uh, last exhibit we'll show right now. And uh, uh, can you describe this Exhibit 7? 
It's a uh, progress note uh, from uh, February 29, 2016. And uh, where I've highlighted um, um, oh wait, not the uh, that's too much. Well, let's see if I can Okay, uh, the part that's highlighted, uh, what is the significance of that? Once again, it's the histor history. Mr. Sanderson did comment on his injuries sustained on the 26th, where he had loss of consciousness after a skier impact, and he has been experiencing foggy feeling along with mood change. Yeah, I believe this record, well, um, I may have to return to one of the other exhibits. Um, I think it's exhibit five. That's the longer one. And in particular, I'd like you to look at the uh, um, page four of exhibit five. And uh, are you able to see this uh, record? Yes, I am. It's a radiology report. Can you explain the significance of this record? Well, it documents the injury on the right side of his chest responsible for the pain and increased pain when he was breathing. And basically it shows under impression acute fractures of the right fourth through seventh lateral ribs with minimal displacement of the fourth and sixth ribs. So uh, does this mean he broke four ribs in the ski crash? Yes, it does. Be a good place to take a last break. Okay, let's take a short break and then we'll come back for the last session. Objections to rule. There's an, actually, there, there yeah. is another piece to this. Okay. Well, if an objection wasn't made, it's waived, right? It's trial. Right. right. Yeah, I, I, we've what already said we, we've already said we can watch the whole thing.
The jury's on their way. Yes. So the jury's agreed. The jury's agreed to stay late to finish this, according so, to the bailiff. It's the whole thing is about two minutes, two, two hours and nineteen minutes. Yeah, and there, so there is another part to this video. Oh, if they can stay, then. never mind. Then we'll just stop at five. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't mind, but I think they would be a little surprised. Yeah, I, mi I misspoke earlier because I, I was just going off this right, video. I was also. Yeah, yeah. There, I forgot there was a second. They yeah. broke it up when we took a break for the last two or three, four. I mean, we don't have to go without any cross, but <laughs> we think it would be unfair. We wouldn't mind. Yeah. <laughs> Very well. And then I'll want to go over our witness lineup for tomorrow. That's very simple. Go ahead. Uh, Shay. Shay Harris. Mark. Mark. Mark Harris. Yes. Uh, Terry Sanderson. Yes. And Gwyneth Paltrow if there's time. Okay. <coughs> so Terry first before Gwyneth. Yeah. And I want to put you on the witness stand and ask you a few questions about uh, shady trial tactics. Is that okay? Anal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, members of the jury. And, and uh, I know I had uh, the bailiff talk to you about timing, and, and the, the lawyers have informed me that we were all wrong about this, and it's going to take a little longer, so we will break at 5 or a few minutes after 5 today. So thank you. You may proceed, counsel. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go back to that Exhibit 5. Sorry, I... Uh, do you see that? Yes, uh, I do. Another, ex I do. another radiology report. Can you tell us what that means to you? It's a radiology report of the CT scan of the brain without contrast. And uh, uh, what are the findings that you see? Well, the uh, the pertinent findings is that there was a prominent ventricular system enlargement with associated atrophy or shrinkage of the brain, if you will. And uh, there was, more importantly, there was no evidence of a hemorrhage or a brain bleed on the CT scan since he was experiencing symptoms uh, consistent with the concussion. So obviously you want to rule out some type of uh, abnormal finding within the brain. You do that with, in an emergent setting, you do that with a CT scan, which was done here. So um, basically from a traumatic standpoint, there was no abnormal findings, i.e. like a skull fracture or uh, bleeding within the brain. When you say emergent, that means emergency? Yes. I mean, uh, most emergency rooms are equipped with a CT scan for that reason, to look for fracture and hemorrhage. So um, if you really need something more than that, like an MRI of a particular anatomical structure, then usually that's scheduled on an outpatient basis. Uh, down below under impression, number two, it says, uh, I'll let you read it. Um, oops, I'm going to try to highlight this. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, in your own words, can you explain what this means? Well, the prominent ventricular system 
discordant with mild buy-in loss suggests an anatomical finding of NPH, which stands for normal pressure hydrocephalus. And it says in the appropriate clinical setting. So you have to clinically correlate these findings with the patient. Um, does this mean, Doc, uh, was this uh, number two that you just uh, discussed, is that uh, related to the ski crash injury? No. So you had one clinical interview with uh, Terry Sanderson, correct? Yes, I did. And that was in your clinic? Yes, it was. How did you clinically assess Terry's TBI symptoms? Well, he, basically, uh, they are mild, if, you, if that's what you're looking for, but his Basically, he has an ongoing, from his history, he has an ongoing post-concussive symptoms. Uh, does mild mean that it's insignificant? No, not necessarily. It depends on the symptoms. Uh, like I said, your brain is your entire being, so uh, someone can lose... Uh, uh, for example, eyesight in one eye, but if you're a surgeon, uh, then you're done, if you know what I mean. But if you uh, engage in other activities, you could probably continue on with just monocular vision. But uh, for a surgeon, uh, you really need uh, both eyes to perform surgeries. And that would be an example. So how did you corroborate that Terry Sanderson had a TBI or traumatic brain injury? All well, from his concussion. A concussion defines a uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury. So uh, it's like I said before, the issue becomes whether or not the symptoms are permanent or not. And that's where his medical records, i.e. ongoing medical care by his treating physicians and the so-called before and after witnesses come in play to corroborate uh, the time course of those symptoms. Okay, next I'd like to uh, ask you about your opinions in this case, uh, especially those involving the uh, injuries he suffered and what they mean uh, from the ski crash of February 26, 2016. So first, I'd like to address the uh, concussion. Uh, what are your opinions regarding the concussion? Well, that he sustained a concussion, and that came from the closed head trauma from the ski accident. Uh, what are your opinions as to the uh, uh, cause of the TBI? Uh, well. Basically, his, his head struck the ground, and that would be the uh, the, app, the force application that would uh, result in the closed head injury, resulting in the TBI. Um, your, uh, what are your conclusions or opinions regarding the rib fractures? Well, that once again, that came from his contact with the ground. From the ski accident, that is. Okay. Well, based upon your biomedical engineering and the physics, tell us what this can indicate regarding the cause of his uh, fall to the ground. Well, the falling to the ground resulted from his center of gravity being shifted outside of his torso. So he had the, it, it drew him to the ground. And so 
his question becomes what caused that shift in his center of gravity causing him to fall to the ground and that was since he fell to the right side that was an impact from or an externally applied force application from his left side and that's what caused it okay uh Now, does this indicate that uh, Terry Sanderson was hit from behind? Well, yes, it does. I mean, if, um, I mean, you got a witness uh, saying that he was struck from behind, but uh, suffice it to say, the force application came from behind and from the left side, causing him to go over onto his right side. And that's where that impact did not result that first impact did not result in the rib fractures or the concussion. It was his contact with the ground that resulted in the injuries that we see in the medical records. Okay. Um, can you explain how uh, your understanding of force application show this? Well, the biggest thing is, is that when you fall to the ground um, and you have evidence of rib fractures on the lateral side of your um, torso, then obviously there is a force application directly to the ribs in that location. And so when you fall to your right side, uh, your elbow or your arm uh, gets in the way between your chest wall and the ground. And so the hard object would be your, you, i.e. your arm and elbow, making contact with the ribs resulting in the rib fracture. And then very, very shortly after that, then you strike your head uh, against the ground as well. Does this uh, explain or uh, show that uh, Terry Sanderson was uh, hit from behind by uh, Gwyneth Paltrow? Well, I don't know who, I, I guess it was her that struck him, but yes, it does show that he was struck from behind and went forward to the right, you know, causing those injuries upon impact to the ground. Well, uh, can you walk us through the uh, engineering and physics, unless you've already explained it? Well, so the well, you can put numerical values on this because uh, we are subjected. Everyone on this planet is, is subjected to the Earth's gravitational pull. We refer to that as gravity, and that is one g, so it attracts us to the Earth. So we as humans, we maintain primarily an erect posture. And so if you shift your center of gravity where that uh, outside of your torso, you have a tendency to fall unless you're holding on to something. So you will fall to the ground, okay? And, and so you can calculate the time it takes to fall to the ground for different body parts that you know, depending on his height. And so you can appreciate that when you fall like this, your your ribs are located around here, your head's up here. So actually your ribs are gonna hit first and followed by your head. But it takes a certain amount of time to do that. And that's, you know, falling basically like a free fall, if you will. So it takes less than a half a second for that to occur. And you can, there's uh, a term we like to use in physics called kinetic energy. And when you calculate the kinetic energy over a distance, we refer to that as work done. And so you can calculate the kinetic energy that's imparted upon different body parts, knowing where those body parts are and how they struck the ground. 
And so in Mr. Sanderson's case, the, the history from witnesses or a witness was that there was a person on top of him that fell to the ground uh, along with him. That would impact the force application to his ribs, but not to his head. Okay, because the person wasn't sitting on his head as he fell to the ground. So when you do the calculation, it turns out to be about 4,000 newtons of impact force to the ribs, which is enough to cause a rib fracture. And that's consistent. Now with the head, that's a different calculation uh, as well for obvious reasons because the mass of the head is much different than the mass of Mr. Sanderson with Ms. Paltrow on him as he's falling to the ground. So when you do those calculations, and keep it in mind, he was also wearing a helmet. And so that helmet serves to absorb some of the energy transferred to the brain. So when you strike the ground, you have a kinetic energy calculation as well. And so you determine the velocity, you know the mass of the head, and you know the distance between the brain and the outer scalp, and the distance of the helmet is about two inches. So that all comes into play. Now keep in mind, if he wasn't wearing a helmet, uh, the force application to his head would be much higher. In fact, about three times higher. So the helmet, did serve its purpose of absorbing some of the blow, if you will, in layman's terms. But that calculation turned out to be about 240 newtons of impact force. And that is assuming that he fell on level ground. Now, I understand that ski slopes have some type of incline. I don't know what that is in this particular case. Any incline would make the calculation more severe because he would have fallen further. And so the distance travel on a fall increases the velocity, which is proportional to the square of the velocity. The kinetic energy is proportional to the square of the velocity in these types of calculations. For all intents and purposes, fall to level ground with 240 newtons of impact force to the brain. So uh, the Newtons are the the force that was applied, a physics term, correct? <laughs> yes, it is a physics term, and it is the force application uh, to the brain. So the force that was uh, applied, let's uh, start with the uh, ribs first. Uh, and on the right side, indicate that Mr. Sanderson was hit from behind or the side, and... Uh, <laughs> with Ms. Paltrow landing on top of him, that shows that uh, it's much more likely than not that he was hit by Ms. Paltrow? Well, he was hit by someone from the side and from behind. Keep in mind that that person also landed on him. But usually people that just fall, fall to the ground, do not suffer rib fractures. And, and the reason being is that there's not enough energy being transferred to the rib it takes something else, and the something else would be someone falling with them on top of them, and that would certainly be enough to do it, yeah, at least in this case, assuming that the person weighed around 130 pounds. That would certainly be enough force to do that. So the, uh, the rib injuries, uh, would you use the analogy that uh, they're kind of like uh, looking at a, the bumper of a car that was involved in a rear-ended collision where uh, another car rear-ended the car and they, they, they help show what the injury might be and what, how it was caused? Well, the rear injury really depicts how the injury occurred, what happened, not the head trauma. The head trauma was just a, a result of the fall. 
uh, okay, I mean, that's independent of anyone being on top of him, you know, falling to the ground. The fact that he fell to the ground and struck his head is responsible uh, for the, the head trauma. The ribs tell us how it happened because there's only w really one way in this particular scenario that there could have been enough force application to fracture those ribs. Now, if there were no rib fractures, you wouldn't be able to say how this fall occurred. Uh, so does this indicate who hit whom? Well, yes, if you had a choice between Mr. Sanderson hitting Ms. Paltrow or Ms. Paltrow hitting Mr. Sanderson, you would have to pick Ms. Paltrow hitting Mr. Sanderson from behind and falling on top of them to account for the rib fractures. I'm sorry, say that again? If you were to compare two scenarios, Mr. Sanderson striking Ms. Paltrow or Ms. Paltrow striking Mr. Sanderson and falling to the ground, there's only one scenario that would account for enough force application to fracture those ribs, and that would be Ms. Paltrow striking Mr. Sanderson from behind and then falling on top of him down towards the right side onto the right side of his torso. So you did consider the possibility that, that uh, Terry could have hit Ms. Paltrow? Well, yes, I considered uh, a number of different scenarios not only that, but uh, the possibility of a rotational effect uh, both ways. Uh, Terry Sanderson striking Miss Paltrow from behind and then rotating in such a way uh, to the ground. Uh, could that uh, account for the, uh, the rib injuries and vice versa? Miss Paltrow striking Mr. Sanderson from behind and rotating, you know, in such a way. I took those into consideration, and those were eliminated uh, for a number of reasons. But the biggest one is it takes a half a second to fall to the ground. And to rotate in such a way that you strike your ribs onto the ground over your elbow would indicate that, let's say that Mr. Sanderson struck Ms. Paltrow from behind and rotated and she fell on top of him as a result of the rotational effect. Mr. Sanderson would have had to generate the initial rotational force to cause that rotation in order for him to land beneath Ms. Paltrow. Okay, and then in so doing, he would have landed on his back. Now, keep in mind that if you're going to rotate 180 degrees in less than half a second, that's basically a rotational rate of between 360 and 400 degrees per second. Now, having dealt with athletes all my life, I've dealt with swimmers or divers. Divers have a difficult time even generating that type of rotational rate when they do their complex dives. So Mr. Sanderson uh, certainly would not be able to generate that rotational component and land underneath Ms. Paltrow. Then vice versa, if Ms. Paltrow struck Mr. Sanderson from behind and rotated around then that would have been at an even more increased rotational rate for Mr. Sanderson to be underneath Ms. Paltrow for those ribs to fracture. And then again, more likely than not, he would have landed on his back and not his side. And then the last consideration is they both had their skis on. To be able to do that type of rotation, you would expect skis to come off, and they didn't. So. That was kind of the analysis I did with regards to rotational effects. Keep in mind that it's a very, very short period of time between contact and striking the ground.
So you're saying it, it's nearly impossible that Terry Sanderson hit Miss Paltrow to cause this ski crash? Well, yes. I mean, I, get, I went through all of those scenarios. Unless there is some other descriptor that I am not aware of and did not take into consideration, the only possible way would have been Miss Paltrow striking Mr. Sanderson from behind. So you're saying um, this hit from behind is about the only way his ribs could have broken the way they did? Yes. So you're saying from a physics standpoint, Terry's injuries uh, uh, would not have occurred if he had hit Miss Paltrow and uh, skied between her skis, for example. Just the mere fact of him just striking her, there, that's not enough in, uh, energy being transferred to the ribs to result in the rib fracture. And neither is Ms. Paltrow striking Terry from behind. That contact in of itself is not going to result in rib fracture. It's the actual landing on the ground that resulted in the rib fracture. So uh, the ribs and the way they were fractured are a clear sign that Terry Sanderson was hit from behind. Yes, uh, I mean, that's what my analysis points to. And uh, like I said before, I analyzed different scenarios and took that into consideration as well. Including the theory of the rotation? Uh, yes, I did that as well. And uh, there is just no way it could have happened in any other uh, scenario, if you will, other than being struck from behind on the left side, driving your center of gravity to the right, resulting in the fall to the ground to the right side. Okay. Okay. Um, we've been going almost an hour um, or about an hour. Why don't we take a short break and... Uh, we continue and continue after the break. Thank you. Okay, Thank go you. Back record. The time is 1.10. Okay, back on record. The time is 1.28. Dr. Baim, uh, uh, why don't you tell the jury about uh, the concussion that Terry suffered in this uh, ski crash? Um, uh, as a practicing neurologist, uh, what are the typical symptoms of a concussion? Well, the most common one is headache. And then you can have any number of uh, other symptoms to include uh, disorientation, confusion, um, not interacting correctly, some irritation, uh, that kind of stuff. And now, obviously, if you have more severe uh, injuries, you can actually have like paralysis, loss of vision, these types of things. But uh, suffice it to say, the most common is a headache and followed by a number of other things that may or may not accompany uh, the headache. Yeah, uh, based on what you've read and what you've seen in your exam, did Terry have some of these symptoms? Yes, he did. And, and he reported those to me, which were consistent with the medical records, and so I had no reason to uh, refute that. But I would certainly uh, defer all those findings to his treaters. Um, could you tell the jury, do you think uh, Terry was uh, uh, malingering, magnifying, or faking any of his symptoms? Uh, I did, he didn't appear that way to me, no. Okay, uh, returning to the concussion, um, you know, I've got a model here. Oh, the 
brain, and you can see that. Uh, can you tell the jury uh, how a concussion occurs, such as the one Terry suffered in this crash? Well, a concussion results from the application or a blow to the head in layman's terms, basically an externally applied force application that gives transfer to the brain. You can appreciate that, uh, excuse me for just one second. I have one of these too. Okay. You can appreciate that the brain lies within the skull table. This is the skull. And that's the hardest bone that we have. But the brain is not hard like bone. It's like a gelatinous, if you were able to ever to hold one, it's like a jello with stuff, you know, carrot sticks or whatever in there. You know, it's it's a unique consistency, if you will. And so, and I'm talking about a live brain because as part of my residency, we did do brain surgery. So the brain is very, what we call friable, soft. And so it moves, okay, it's a fluid. And so if your head moves or your skull moves, the brain will move into the opposite direction and then have a tendency to rebound back to the other side. And that's based on Newton's first and third law as well. The first law being an object will remain at rest or in constant motion unless acted upon by an external applied force. And then the third law is for every force application, there's an equal and opposite force application. And so the brain is going to move in opposite direction of the skull. So it's going to make contact with that, with the bony table within the skull. So it's going to compress and expand and then compress again. So the French refer to that as a coup contra coup type of situation. So you can actually get injury from that. And so if you fall face forward down, the brain is going to compress downwards and then rebound backwards. So you can see that the, the front part of the brain, and you can appreciate that underneath here, you got all these complex bony structures. So the bottom part of the brain is going to be exposed to that, that sudden change in direction as well. So you can have symptoms, any number of symptoms from that. So if you have frontal lobe uh, issues, you can have executive dysfunctioning, motivational issues, you can have behavioral issues, and then the subcortical or the underneath side of the brain, you can have memory issues, that kind of stuff. So, and then you can appreciate that all parts of the brain are kind of interconnected, okay? So you can have issues from those interconnecting fibers being uh, affected as well. So that's what the externally applied force application does to the skull that is transferred to the brain. Okay. Uh, so this, uh, these forces that uh, the brain is coup contra coup or sloshing around in the skull, that's my term. Did something like that happen to Terry? Well, yes. I mean, whenever you have a force application, uh, the possibility, certainly you have the coup, which is the direct hit, and then you can have rebounding as well. Uh, and you don't know uh, whether you get uh, injury from one or the other. It's generally thought that the contra coup injury tends to be more severe in most individuals, but that's not always the case. But Suffice to say, if you have 240 newtons of impact force to the brain, that's certainly enough to cause some dysfunction of the brain. Now, does it guarantee dysfunction? No, no. You can't, and what I'm saying here is, 
just because you're exposed to an externally applied force to the head of 240 newtons doesn't guarantee brain injury. You have to clinically correlate that with the patient's medical records and the patient himself. So that has to be done first before you go back and do the calculation to see if the force application was proper in both direction and magnitude to result in those injuries. So uh, when you say clinically uh, correlated, does that, uh, how does that affect your opinions? You, uh, you well, you, <laughs> I will tell you this, you don't have any opinions if you don't have clinical correlation. You see what I'm saying? Without the medical aspect of this, you don't know. If someone came up to me and said, well, this person was exposed to 240 newtons of impact force against his head, what's his diagnosis? Well, I couldn't tell you. Not without knowing what the symptoms are, and in the case if the, that patient has medical records, then you want to peruse the medical records to see how his symptoms uh, progressed over time and how they or they did not respond to different treatment paradigms that were offered to the patient. So clinical correlation is absolutely critical in assessing these types of situations. And uh, there was clinical correlation that you observed or saw or determined yourself? Well, yes, I looked at the medical records and upon questioning Mr. Sanderson in my office on April 28, 2021, he corroborated the medical records. So he was consistent with the medical records. So I had no reason to dispute either him or the medical records. Would you say his uh, uh, head injury or concussive injury is as permanent at this point? Well, that, that has always been the issue here, you know, whether or not the concussion is permanent or temporary. The fact that his symptoms have lasted from a neurological sense greater than 18 months, we regard that as being permanent. And you can see that as of six years after the event when I saw him, he still had these symptoms. So his symptoms uh, have been indicative of a permanent condition. A permanent brain injury? Uh, yes. I mean, he has a mild TBI or a permanent concussive disorder. Okay. You mentioned... Uh some things involved with executive function and other things, and he's exhibited all of those problems too. Yeah, I mean, he, he does. Now, to what extent, I can't tell you. I wasn't going to uh, provide any opinions with regards to his level of functioning as it relates to this mild uh, TBI, but he does have the mild TBI, but uh, the extent to which I'm not going to comment on because I'm not one of his treating physicians, nor am I one of his before and after witnesses. In this collision, uh, how, how would you explain that uh, Ms. Paltrow has uh, fewer symptoms of problems, if at all, from this uh, ski crash? Well, first of all, I haven't reviewed any medical records for Ms. Paltrow, so I do not uh, I cannot opine on that other than by falling on top of him, he, he provides a cushioning effect against her in the ground. So from a force application, an externally applied force application standpoint, less force was applied to her than to him. So is another way of saying uh, she provide or Terry Sanderson provided a cushion? Uh, he took the force for her fall? Yeah, it, it, in essence, I mean, basically, he was like a cushion, if you will. And uh, earlier, we discussed before and after witnesses being clinically important for a diagnosis of concussion and TBI that's lasted longer than 18 months. Uh, uh, how would you uh, describe these before and after witnesses, such as his daughters or his girlfriend or ex-girlfriend? Well, they certainly describe a change 
in his overall makeup uh, from before and after this event. Now, how it affects him directly, uh, once again, I'm going to defer to others for that, but certainly there is uh, before and after witness testimony reflecting that. And those before and after witnesses are important to determine the uh, nature and extent of his injuries? In the yes. I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, you're the... Uh, like I said before, whenever you have this type of situation or this type of patient that presents to you, often it is the witness account that is important. Let's talk about Terry's pre-existing uh, medical condition. Uh, uh, it's been brought up uh, in that uh, one exhibit uh, with the x-rays or radiology uh, that was reported shortly after the crash within a few days that he had uh, NPA and enlarged ventricles. Uh, you, you recall that, correct? Yes, NPH. Or, sorry, NPH. I wrote it wrong. I, my spelling was incorrect. NPH. Um, uh, what is the, the significance of uh, NPH uh, uh, being a condition he had prior to the crash and uh, how it affects your opinions today? If you could explain that to the jury. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is a condition that is manifested clinically by a triad. Dementia, ataxia, which means loss of balance, and incontinence. And it, it develops slowly over time. And we see this uh, from a radiological standpoint as enlarged ventricles on either the CT scan, but more appropriately, the MRI. And so when you see this, in that clinical setting, then you want to do one of two things, or preferably both. You do a spinal tap to see if you have increased intracranial pressure on the spinal tap, and we have manometers that we attach to the needle going into the uh, into the back to measure that pressure in millimeters of water. And if it is elevated i.e. greater than 200 millimeters of water, then the treatment of choice is to actually do a burr hole in the head and stick a catheter into the lateral ventricle, ventricle and then trace a drain all the way down through the neck into his stomach, if you will, abdomen, to drain off excess spinal fluid, i.e. reducing the pressure. And we call that an interventricular shunt placement, which I have done a number of times in the past. And so that is the treatment for it. But you don't want to do that unless you have, you don't do it based on just the radiological findings. You want to have the clinical. Any intracranial image has to be clinically correlated to the patient. So if you don't have those symptoms, then you, you don't want to be putting holes people's heads without having symptoms. So in this particular case, he did not have the diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus before this fall, even though he had a suggestion of that in the differential from a radiological standpoint. So that's where the clinical correlation comes into play. So he did not have the three clinical symptoms of NPH, is that correct? That's correct. I mean, these are, I mean, dementia, ataxia, and incontinence are pretty noteworthy symptoms to have, and these people tend to present as they're being, as they develop over time, uh, they tend to present to medical attention rather quickly, if you know what I mean. Okay. So the um, ski crash 
injuries he suffered, uh, 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 they're not attributable to his uh, findings uh, radiologically of NPH. Is that correct? That's correct. No, they're not. Now, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, turn you to the defense experts. Uh, you've read uh, some or all of uh, I think most of the reports of the defense experts, uh, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, some of them were quite brief, isn't that correct? Well, yes. I, I, in fact, I do like brevity, but uh, they got to the point. Okay. Um, and uh, you've reviewed the... Uh, sorry, Lawrence. It, sorry, Lawrence. I, I don't mean to interrupt. I'm trying to figure out a, a good time to, to interrupt here. but. Uh, I, I just want to register an objection uh, to any uh, opinions that Dr. Bain could have provided in his deposition and did not, um, and you can proceed. Okay. Well, uh, uh, since uh, your deposition, you've reviewed the uh, defendant's disclosure of Irving Scher. Is that correct? Well, yeah, just the, the disclosure. I haven't reviewed any report or anything from him. Okay. Um, it's our understanding that he's a uh, biomechanical expert. Is that your understanding? Well, that's what's been told to me. Sounds like we're getting into a new area. That would be a good time to take a recess until tomorrow at 9 a.m. So thank you. Remember uh, to please keep the court's admonition not to do any of your own research, not to discuss the case with anyone. Avoid uh, seeing, reading, or listening to any news reports about the case. Have a nice evening. I wanted to ask uh, Polly Gresham questions about her sister, Jenny Sanderson. <coughs> and what I would have elicited had I been allowed is that Jenny has a schizophrenic, uh, uh, I think it's called typal, T-Y-P-A-L diagnosis, and has a lot of psychological problems from that. Now, uh, I'm not posing her as an expert, but as a uh, 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 a layperson who knows her very well and knows the kind of problems that she has. I have a concern with this being nationally publicized uh, without the permission of this patient with a pretty explosive statement that I've never seen one iota of evidence. I don't think, and, and specifically Mr. Sykes does not represent Jenny and unless he has written permission to make these disclosures to a, an even international audience, I, I'm pretty troubled by it. I, so, I see, think it's a big violation of this woman's privacy. I, I agree. If we're going to make a statement, I mean, if you want to make a record, I think we should make a record, but we should do it in camera. Well, okay. Let's do that. All right. Uh, so if we, could, if we could please go ahead and clear the courtroom. We'll take five minutes so that... The press gets turned off. We clear the courtroom, and then you can make your offer of proof. Yeah, and and uh, secondly, I can make this publicly. Uh, we never subpoenaed uh, Polly Gresham officially. We gave her a subpoena so she could show it to her employer if she needed to. Uh, but we expected that she would come. If she didn't come, we were without. You know, uh, we had a deposition. And so uh, her, she was to appear today, <coughs> excuse me, and um, uh, when she finished, you ordered her to come back next week. Now, I think that's improper. She has a lot of other things going on in her life, uh, her job, et cetera, and I don't think she should have to stay around. Now, if you disagree and you have the black robe, and I do not, okay, 
uh, then uh, we ought to have an agreement that she can appear via Zoom. But I don't think she has an obligation under the facts I've given you to uh, uh, be forced to return here next week. And as I indicated earlier, I mean, I asked her if she would have any problem remaining under the subpoena, and she didn't voice that at that time. I realized I put her on the spot. And, and it, so if she, and you're not representing her. She voiced it to me. And you're not representing her. No. And so if she, if she would like to be released from the subpoena or have its terms changed in some way, she can certainly request that. Well, no. uh, to all sides and make a decision. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Let's have her come in. And then I guess if there's anything else we should do during before we close the hearing. Well, uh, just uh, do do we have a piece of paper that has says what uh, Mr. Says is true about uh, this woman's health. I guess we'll have, let's cover that in the in camera part just, of the hearing. I think, I think the, no. the audience ought to know, in, like, uh, it may not be true. In uh, Terry Sanderson's deposition, he indicated so, as such. That so there is an iota. There is an iota. Never I think, yeah, there is an iota of indication of this in Terry Sanderson's deposition about his daughter. I read it two, two well, days that, ago. It does not say that word. Well, e anywhere. even if it even if it did, that too would be improper to introduce into this proceeding in the public way. Right. What I'm saying is that the statement of counsel that there's not an iota of this. There is not. Then, in the motion for a protective order, there was also additional information that points in there. So it's more than an iota. Okay. So, Polly, why don't you come on up and take the stand? We're just trying to straighten out. Uh, I understand that you may have some commitments where you'd like to be able to leave town. Why don't you explain that to us? Yeah, so I said I, I work with 4-H, and so one of the things I'm committed to is uh, having programming when kids are out of school, because typically that's a time when they get in trouble. So um, that being said, in our community, it's spring break. And so I have a science camp all next week, and it's our first time in our new youth center. So it's kind of, I mean, it's a small town, but a big deal for me. So I, I understand that you need more information. I, I don't know if remote is a possibility. Um, there could be kids in the background. <laughs> no, I could probably have staff cover me if that was something that would work. I. Um, your Honor, we'll, we'll release her from the subpoena. Okay. Entirely? Entirely. Okay. So you're, you're and the plaintiffs do as well? Yes. Okay. So you're released from the subpoena. You have no legal obligation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your service here. So she can come, she's going to leave tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon or evening, but she can come into court tomorrow and watch, right? She, yeah. My home. flight's in the morning, so. All right. All right. So I'm not agreeing to release her for a hardship. Have her sit in the courtroom, then I wouldn't release her for hardship. She just said she's leaving. <laughs> if, if, she's re if you're released from your subpoena, that means a couple of things. That means, first of all, uh, according to the decorum order that the court has issued, the press might want to ask you some questions. And you can talk to them or you can decide not to talk to them. That's your choice. And, and the bailiffs are here to help make sure that they respect that, okay. your choice. Would you prefer that you not talk? Can well, we get, I, I guess I sort of assumed that she wouldn't be talking to the press or I wouldn't, again, I'm, I'm, I think we're doing a kind gesture to release her from the subpoena, but I don't want it to come back and slap me. So uh, can we agree that she's not going to talk to the press until after the trial? And is, I mean, is there a chance you may want to call her by Zoom? No, I'm agreeing to do that. I just don't want to be punished for d having doing a kind And why act. would that be a punishment? That she goes and talks to the press yeah. negatively about my client? I mean, I'm just saying, why would that be a negative? The order's out there. You're aware of its terms. And she's now being released. Therefore, she's released from that. The press is released. I, don't, I want to be fair to the press as well. 
They're Can we ask the been, witness whether she intends to talk to the press right now? I think you could probably do that um, after we uh, quit here today. So, and let me, I was, I was just interrupted. She's this, shaking her head no, Your Honor, but we'll, go ahead, I apologize. Just to let you know that both sides have agreed not to talk to the press until after the case is over. Okay. I, I have a private enough person involved vulnerable enough that this is on video. So, I so the, press, the press is all listening now. She's expressing her interest not to be interviewed. So I expect them to respect that. Sure. And then the second, uh, I guess the second consequence of you being released from your subpoena is that you're welcome to sit in on any of the proceeding from here on out. So. I don't anticipate that. I've okay. got and things to do. You can watch it if it's being broadcast in your area. Okay. Thank Judge, you. I'd like for the state for a minute so we can proffer her testimony, if that's okay. And, sure. And, and uh, in camera. Sure. Um, so uh, if you could just wait a few more minutes. Do you have a minute to take the stand? Yeah. Okay. So is there anything else public that we need to do today? So we can't change the deal. I mean, you release, I release, and suddenly she's giving more testimony. So by giving more testimony, I may not release. Understood. So let, let's not whack me with my kindness here. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Is there anything other than this subject that we can address while the, the proceeding is public that we need to address? No. Well, just uh, that, that your, your, your honor said if the diagnosis comes out at trial, it could be a mistrial. I just wanted to put that on the record. Okay. I did say I did say something along those lines, and it's not going to be put out in front of the jury. So we'll move we'll move forward from there. So we'll take a five minute recess while the courtroom gets cleared and then we'll continue with the offer of proof. Thank you. <laughs>